Well, good morning, everyone. It is fantastic to see so many of you joining us uh, today. Really excited uh, to have this long awaited gathering in honor of Professor Richard Betts. Dick, I hope you will love this discussion today. So I'm uh, Merit Jano, Dean of the School of International and Public Affairs, and it really is a tremendous pleasure uh, to welcome you uh, to this very special conference uh, in honor of Professor Richard Betts and his many contributions uh, to Columbia University and to the field of international security studies. Just looking at this incredible agenda, we find uh, truly a remarkable gathering of current and former colleagues uh, from Dick's life and career, which spans so many areas of importance and embodies the extensive range of uh, areas that he is known for. It's a fantastic uh, framing of today, a scholar in full. Uh, and I think what we are recognizing today is his retirement as director of the Saltzman Institute um, and happily continuing to teach at Columbia University. Um, but it's a moment to recognize not only his achievements and his impact uh, on all of us and on the field. I will just briefly survey a few elements of that remarkable career as we will hear from specialists all day long. I think of Dick as one of the very few scholars of international security that has spanned public policy appointments, such as serving early in his career on the famous Church Commission, to undertaking applied policy research and engagement at the Brookings Institution, with ongoing engagement uh, and involvement with the policy community, whether it's through congressional testimony or working with government agencies or at the Council on Foreign Relations. And of course, his intellectual leadership <clears throat> in the academy at Columbia University, teaching at SEPA and in political science, running SEPA's largest security uh, concentration, which uh, literally has sent thousands of, of graduate students and alumni into um, uh, security agencies around the world, foreign policy, think tanks, etc. And of course, his leadership of the Saltzman Institute. He is an academic leader that has helped build a field, indeed, create the next generation, not only through his direct PhDs, but by creating the summer workshop uh, on the analysis of military operations, always referred to as SWAMOS, which is an intensive and much sought after program uh, for young scholars seeking to learn more about the complexities of military policy and join a network of uh, academics in the field. I think of it as a go-to, you must have gone to SWAMOS if you are in uh, this uh, field. Now, as a scholar, Dick has helped define the field of international relations as the Leo A. Schifrin Professor of War and Peace Studies. He's written foundational books, articles, influential research, which continues, uh, by the way, to this day. As one recent example, I was very uh, grateful to read his essay in Foreign Affairs with <laughs> Matt Waxman in 2018 on the president and the bomb. This, uh, of course, is hearkening back to some of his earlier research, but it was raising crucial issues of control over nuclear weapons at uh, a moment when we had a, say, undisciplined president uh, in charge. Uh, and of course, uh, he's been a transformational leader of the Saltzman Institute of War and Peace Studies, serving as director for nearly 25 years. You know, Saltzman Institute was founded in 1951 by Dwight Eisenhower when he was president of Columbia University. And I was re remembering what the mission of the Institute was, which is to study and understand, quote, the disastrous consequences of war upon man's spiritual, intellectual, and material progress. Well, uh, I, I agree with those who say it's really hard to overstate the contributions that SEPA and in particular the Institute faculty have had on the field. Over the course of today, we will hear about 
about Professor Betts's influence and ideas from those who can speak to it with more expertise than I. But I think of him as a scholar whose research is focused on an extraordinary range of security topics, military strategy, intelligence, conventional forces, nuclear weapons, strategic issues in Asia and Europe, terrorism, deterrence theory, and arms control. And as a director of the Saltzman Institute, he's played a really a pivotal role in creating a community uh, at Columbia uh, and beyond. And as an educator, his dedication to his students has inspired generations to pursue careers uh, in international security, in government, in the military, in think tanks, and to earn PhDs. And I can't tell you how many times I have run into an alumni in policy positions and elsewhere who spoke to me about the importance of his instruction in their intellectual lives years later, and also about his high expectations in the classroom that made them never go into class unprepared or be terrified if they did. So bravo, Dick, on both <laughs> fronts. <laughs> um, so look, Dick, you're an uh, inspiration to all of us. We really look forward to talking about the areas you've engaged, your own contributions, and all those you have influenced over the course of today. It's my great pleasure now to turn uh, this introduction over to Karen Yarhimilo, who came in as our new director of the Saltzman Institute. Karen joined us uh, 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 about a year ago from Princeton herself, I think of as a Columbia product in, in, in important part, greatly influenced by scholars at Columbia University. And so I just think a marvelous homecoming, uh, if you will, uh, to have her lead the Institute forward. But I also want to acknowledge today the tremendous collaboration and efforts of multiple people that have brought today uh, to come to pass in particular acknowledging uh, Ingrid Gersman, who has been an anchor force at the Saltzman Institute, who's done a fabulous job bringing so much together always at the uh, Saltzman uh, Institute, and also to thank Stephen Biddle, uh, who joined us also about a year ago, and we're so uh, really delighted um, to have uh, Professor Biddle uh, on our faculty, leading our concentration uh, and our security studies forward. So without further delay, um, let me hand this over to uh, Professor Karen Yarhimilo. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dean Jano. <clears throat> and today is a special day. Filling this virtual hall are the family, friends, esteemed colleagues and students of Professor Betts. Um, longtime director of the Arnold Saltzman Institute of War and Peace Studies. We've come together to commemorate the recent retirement of Dick as director of the Saltzman Institute and to celebrate his remarkable scholarly contributions, mentorship, and leadership in our field. Dick has inspired generations of students, practitioners, and scholars with his clarity of thinking even when writing about complex issues, a deep and rare sense of candor and integrity, and a direct um, communication style that we've all come to appreciate. Indeed, Dick's assessment and feedback is reliably sincere and balanced. It is straight to the point and no BS. In speaking of his own work and in his own writing, he is remarkably humble when describing the novelty and significance of his contribution. And it is immensely inspiring and incredibly refreshing. And some of you may know this, but I first met Dick as an intimidated undergraduate student, uh, sheepishly seeking advice about uh, graduate schools and career in academia. Uh, depending on how much wine I'll be sipping over, uh, over lunch, I'll decide whether to share with you just how many times I signed up and then canceled my office hours meetings with Dick. Uh, but finally, when I gathered the courage to come and see him 
as you can imagine, um, his advice was brutally honest. Uh, and you can all imagine what he said. Uh, and his advice was also immensely helpful in preparing me what was I was about to experience as a graduate student in political science. Later in my career, Dick supported me um, as a junior faculty member at Princeton when I was fretting about tenure. And he has consistently been there for me, generously helping behind the scenes since I assumed the role of director last summer. The transition could not have been more peaceful or smoother, and it's mainly thanks to Dick's um, help. Throughout the evolving relationship, I've, I've been the beneficiary of Dick's kindness, wisdom, and advice. Um, Dick influenced not only my desire to become an academic, but the kind of work I wanted to do with the focus on topics that engage with significant and policy relevant questions. His famous class, War, Peace and Strategy, has been the foundational course for generations of students fortunate enough to have taken it. I was one of these fortunate students who sat in the front row admiring not just his encyclopedic knowledge of history, but his ability to succinctly and deftly analyze and criticize the giants of international security. I still have my notes and I still use them, but don't tell my students. I later took uh, Dick's graduate level class on US foreign policy, and I was in awe by how he was able to play the devil's advocate so convincingly, no matter what the topic was. It left us all wondering at the end what side he was really on because he had such great poker face. Taking that class, I still vividly recall the rhetorical questions he posed to us as those remained with me. I remember repeatedly asking myself as a student, what answer is he looking for? Only to, to later realize that he was not interested in the right answer as often as there wasn't really one, but he really hoped we would wrestle, struggle and balance the different arguments, perspectives and evidence those early skills he helped cultivate of curiosity about how to dissect complex and complicated questions in world affairs, combined with a healthy sense of skepticism about this exercise, have proved tremendously helpful as I grew as a scholar. Dick leads by example. Saltzman's success and recognition as one of the most vibrant institutes of security studies in the United States, if not in the world, is largely thanks to Dick's unwavering dedication to his ability to cultivate a sense among his colleagues that each of us and as a collective have an obligation to our students, to the policy community, to our field, to produce high quality policy relevant work. Perhaps one of the Institute's most recognizable achievement has been the SWAMOS program, which Dick founded and I attended as a graduate student myself. And to this day, I can tell you that this was one of the most valuable experiences I've had as a graduate student. SWAMOS was born out of the recognition of an important gap in our graduate curriculum, critical to the foundational knowledge for students of international security. The Saltzman Institute under Dick's leadership has been a home to hundreds of students and scholars, to veterans and practitioners. He shaped Saltzman to embody what any top research institute in our field aspires to be, a community of scholars who discuss freely, passionately, and critically Anything from US foreign policy, defense and intelligence analysis, military and strategy, political violence, violence, geopolitics, and the list goes on and on. The panels which immediately follow will give us an opportunity to further highlight and celebrate Dick's remarkable scholarship in several selected areas, including pathologies and politics of intelligence, civil military relations, military force in US foreign policy. Dick's work on intelligence has had an enormous effect on my own scholarship and research. And I know many of you sitting here today have a similar story to share. Indeed, the last panel 
uh, of today will serve as an opportunity for Dick's former students and friends to do just that, to share their stories. And I look forward to it. So to close my remarks, let me just turn to Dick for a second. Dick, I stand here humbled in your presence and honored to assume your role and indeed big shoes as director of the Saltzman Institute, which is your enduring legacy. I promise I will work tirelessly to build on your excellent foundation, the excellent foundation you've laid, and I hope I will make you proud. I think I speak for all in attendance when I express our great appreciation for your impact on our individual careers, on SIPA and the political science department here at Columbia and on the field as a whole. Let the celebration begin. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone. And it's good to see you all. If you have, if you wanna put your camera on, if you can do this, it will be great for Dick to see everyone who's in attendance. Um, I just wanna, before we let you go, I wanna have, before our next panel, I should say, I have a few things I would like to say in terms of logistics. Um, first and foremost, as, as Dean Jano said, I wanna thank, I want to thank Ingrid and members of the Institute for making this happen, uh, for all your hard work. I, you know, this, this could not have happened without you. Uh, so thank you. And um, I want to make sure you all know that there is a Zoom link that will work throughout the day and you should all have it. It's the same Zoom link. So you can leave and come back as needed. Um, this is a conference format. It's not a webinar. So if your camera is on, we can see you. Uh, so just make sure um, uh, uh, to pay attention. And uh, I would just ask everyone to make sure to be muted um, when you're not speaking. Uh, and otherwise, if you can, it will be great if we can see your face. Um, Another thing we should note, um, there is a link to the agenda and bios that will post or are already posted on the chat. Um, so the introductions throughout this event will be brief. Um, the event will be recorded and a video will be posted. We will send you an email with the video when it's ready. Uh, during the Q&As, uh, please use the hand raise feature and we will call on you. And during the tributes panel, which is the last panel of today, which starts at 4 p.m., there will be an opportunity for friends and colleagues to speak briefly as time permits. So think about a story, an anecdote you might want to share, and, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, be happy to include you. Um, all right, Ingrid, um, back to you. What yes, is happening gonna, next? <laughs> we're going to take a tiny break of two minutes and uh, and then we'll begin the panel, panel one. All right, so grab a cup of coffee, um, water, whatever everyone needs, bathroom break, and we'll see you in just a few minutes. All right, so um, let's... Um, let, let's start with our first panel, statesmen and soldiers. Um, and I will... Um, hand it off to our moderator, uh, Professor Stephen Biddle, the Professor of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. Um, he's the co-director of the International Security Program uh, here at SIPA and an adjunct senior fellow for defense policy in the Council of Foreign Relations. Um, I will not summarize, I cannot summarize uh, uh, Professor Biddle's uh, contribution and scholarly work. I will just say, I will just note that he's, uh, he has a forthcoming book or oh, it's actually out. Maybe now, by now it's already out. Oh, April 6th, I see, okay. Uh, Non-state warfare, the military methods of guerrillas, warlords, and militias. It will be released by Princeton University Press. And uh, Steve, um, I'm handing it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Karen, for that kind introduction. I'd like to join Dean Janow and Professor Yuri Milo in congratulating Dick on his long and remarkably fruitful leadership of the Saltzman Institute and for single-handedly making the international security policy concentration what it is today. And, you know, on a more personal note for being a crucial mentor, colleague, and model for me 
as for many of us in my own scholarly career, I even copied his hairstyle. Uh, like many of us, I suspect I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for Dick. So thank you, Dick. Uh, there will be time for a more sustained thanks to Dick later in the day. For now, what I want to do is introduce the first of our three substantive panels, this one on civil military relations. Ever since the publication of Dick's landmark Soldier, Statesman, and Cold War Crises in 1977, Dick has been a profound and influential voice in American civil military relations. And we have with us this morning a terrific panel to offer reflections on, reactions to, and extensions of Dick's critical work in this area. So uh, Peter Fever is a professor of political science and public policy at Duke. He's director of the Duke program in American, Civil, uh, American Grand Strategy and the author of Armed Servants, Agency Oversight and Civil Military Relations, Harvard University Press 2003, and of Guarding the Guardians, uh, civilian Control of Nuclear Weapons in the United States, uh, and is co-author with Chris Jelpe of Choosing Your Battles, American Civil Military Relations and the Use of Force, and co-editor with Dick Cohn of, civil, of Soldiers and Civilians, The Civil Military Gap in American National Security. He's one of, with Dick, the more authoritative voices in American academia on civil military relations. Um, Peter has also had important government service from June 2005 to July 2007, he served as Special Advisor for Strategic Planning and Institutional Reform on the National Security Council staff in 1993 to 94. He served another tour on the NSC. He's an emeritus member of the Aspen Strategy Group. He blogs at foreignpolicy.com, and he's a contributing editor of Foreign Policy Magazine, and he holds a PhD from Harvard University. Uh, Suzanne Nielsen. Uh, as a colonel in the US Army and a professor of political science and head of the Department of Social Sciences at West Point, where she teaches courses in international relations and national security. She's an intelligence officer by trade. Uh, she served in the US, Germany, the Balkans, Korea, and Iraq. From February to July 2008, she was the deputy director of the Multinational Forces Iraq Commanders Initiatives Group in Baghdad. Her research interests include change in military organizations, civil military relations, of course, and cyber policy and strategy. Her books include American National Security, which she co-authored, and American Civil Military Relations, The Soldier in the State in a New Era, which she co-edited. Um, her dissertation, Preparing for War, the Dynamics of Peacetime Military Reform, won the American Political Science Association's Laswell Award for Best Dissertation in the Field of Public Policy in 2002 and 2003. Uh, she holds an MA and PhD in political science from Harvard University. And last but certainly not least, Cynthia Roberts is professor of political science at Hunter College City University of New York. She's also a senior research scholar here at the Saltzman Institute of War and Peace Studies and adjunct professor of international and public affairs here at Columbia. In 2019, uh, she served as policy advisor on the joint staff in the Department of Defense and the J5 Strategy Plans and Policy Shop. Previously, she was director of the Russian Area Studies Graduate Program at Hunter College and served as a member of the Executive Committee on Science, Arms Control, and National Security, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Uh, she holds an MA, MPhil, and PhD from, of all places, Columbia University. And with that, uh, let me hand the floor over to Peter Fever. Peter, take it away. Well, thank you. Uh, it's a great privilege uh, to be on this panel honoring uh, one of the pillars of the security studies field. And uh, Dick, I want you to know today is my last day as a visiting fellow here at All Souls uh, College. I'm on sabbatical in Oxford. And instead of trying to ransack the wine cellar, I said, by golly, I have to be here at this panel honoring you. Uh, this this has this privilege has really special personal meaning for me because Dick gave me my first academic teaching gig when he asked me to serve as his TA for a course he was teaching back in the fall of 1985, I believe it was. And I, th I think the course was American Defense Policy or, or some such, uh, but it was a great gift of mercy uh, to me since I had so thoroughly botched my prelim exam with Sam Huntington on that very topic that I was supposedly TAing for uh, Dick just a few months earlier. So I'm not gonna ask you, Dick, whether you regret giving me a second lease on academic life. I, I don't wanna hear your answer, uh, but I have never regretted every chance I've had to work with you. 
And my remarks today are just a tiny down payment of the large debt I still owe you uh, for your mentorship and your friendship over the years. Uh, I do regret my dismal prelim exam, however, and that's a story for another day. Uh, it does, however, frame the main point that I want to make today, which is uh, that, Dick, you are rightly heralded as one of the great scholars of American civil military relations. But in my opinion, you deserve even more credit and more praise uh, than you get. And I'm going to make the case for this by comparing you to Sam Huntington. Uh, so I'm going to be comparing Sam and Dick, two of my earliest and most formative tutors in the mysteries of American civil military relations. So it's, it's not possible to hype Sam's contributions beyond what the field has already done. Um, his classic soldier in the state is still in print after 65 years. It's mind boggling. And when last I checked, that one book has over 5,500 citations on Google Scholar alone. And that's more for one book than most of us of mill scholars enjoy for our entire corpus over our entire life. So it's also, of course, fair to point out that a great deal of those citations are made in the context of critiquing Huntington's work. Um, and But that book, like all of Sam's work, still pays and repays reading and rereading. So it's not my purpose here to elevate Dick by tearing down Sam, but I do think it's profitable to compare the similarities and contrasts across these two great scholars. And, and so here are just three similarities that I see. Uh, first, as already been mentioned by several of the opening uh, speakers is how prolific both uh, Dick Betts has been and Sam Huntington has been over myriad areas. I, I think Sam wrote over a wider range of political science uh, than Dick has, but within the security field, uh, their span has been comparably astonishing, impressive. You're gonna hear some of Dick's span in the next uh, several panels, but it's worth emphasizing here. Let, let's say you decided that you were gonna have a conference on the state of the security studies field, and you were gonna invite experts to fill out the following six panels, a nice rich two-day conference that would have a panel on CivMil, a panel on intelligence studies, a panel on nuclear weapons and strategy, a panel on contemporary challenges in American foreign policy, and a panel on an omnibus panel on strategy, and maybe finally a panel on bridging the academic policy gap. Uh, you could save a lot of money by just inviting Dick Betts, who could cover all six of those panels just from his own work. I remember reading, meeting Dick uh, when he was at Brookings and hearing him lament about the publishing burdens that he felt being in a think tank and how he couldn't wait to get to the academy where the pressure to publish was less. And I remember thinking this is ironic and somewhat countercultural to say the least, until I talked to one of uh, Dick's colleagues who mentioned that Dick may be one of the only think tankers of his day who took the rule of thumb expectation handed down from the senior leadership at Brookings on what they wanted the scholars to do. And everyone else at Brookings just did what they wanted and Dick actually did doggedly followed the expectations and nearly drove himself crazy doing so. But in the process uh, produced uh, a formidable array of um, landmark scholarship across all of these areas that I've mentioned. So both Sam and Dick prolific and wide ranging. Secondly, both have been insightful in ways that stand the test of time. Uh, for my part, I mostly engage Sam's work from the 1950s and 60s, early 60s. Though, of course, he kept making important you know, field de debate defining contributions at, until the end of his year, uh, his life, I should say. But similarly, I find some of Dick's early works, even works from 50 years ago, almost, to be as instructive and stimulative of research questions 
as anything I read by more contemporary scholars today. So ask yourself, those of you who are scholars, ask yourself whether your earliest work remains as instructive and useful for those seeking to understand our world today as Dick Betts's early work has, or as Sam Huntington's early work. Or ask yourself if the flavor of the month in security studies today will be as rewarding to read in a couple months time, let alone a couple decades time. So both Dick and Sam stand the test of time. The third thing they have in common is that they both uh, have cultivated the persona of a lovable curmudgeon. Uh, and I suspect both would be very happy to have the curmudgeon label and might chafe a bit at the lovable part of that label. Uh, but the truth is that even though Sam and Dick both shared kind of a bare knuckle approach to intellectual debate and a toughness in their policy and in their scholarship that might have scared folks who were not in their inner circle, if you had the moxie to get past that, you would discover that both shared an admirable generosity of spirit, especially to younger scholars. And I suspect we're gonna hear that theme repeatedly throughout the day. Dick in particular can be great fun as a raconteur, perhaps sipping a wee dram at the end of a long conference day. And I know from personal experience that he can tell a wickedly funny story that appropriately puts a young whippersnapper in his proper place and serves the larger public good by reminding everyone that the field is bigger and more important than the collection of egos that comprise so much of its parts. So those are three things that Dick and Sam have in common and that would be enough to praise right there. But I think what elevates Dick to greatness is as much what distinguishes him from Huntington. That is his, not his similarities, but his differences. And I'm, I'm going to list just three. First, Sam was shaped by the shock of a superpower rivalry, whereas Dick, I would argue, was shaped by the shock of a Vietnam debacle. To be sure, both Sam and Dick share a healthy skepticism about American power. A significant portion of Sam's writings could be summarized under the heading, uh-oh, America is just about to blow it unless it wakes up fast. But in Dick, I see the skepticism running a little deeper and bordering on profound irony, to borrow the title of one of his earliest works. Sam seems to be trying to tap into an aspect of American greatness that will enable the United States to supersede or at least finesse the dilemmas and challenges he warns about. Whereas Dick seems to be saying that when we have fully tapped into those great reservoirs of strength, it still may not be enough because the best we can do is to muddle through. So Sam could write an article with the title, Why International Primacy Matters a title and an argument that would be as provocative for the conference attendees here today as when he wrote it nearly 30 years ago. And let's just leave for the pub quiz later tonight, the trivia question, who was the other state Sam was urging the United States to exert primacy over? That'll be for you uh, experts in the field to try to remember. But in contrast, look at the title that Dick would write, a title such as, is strategy and an illusion, a deeply more skeptical and ultimately ironic line of analysis than Sam's on primacy. Even if he ends up with what for Dick is a, a somewhat optimistic conclusion at the end of that article. So there are differences between being shaped by the early Cold War versus being shaped by Vietnam. And I see that in Dick's scholarship. Secondly, Huntington is deductive and Dick is inductive. So Sam identified Weberian ideal types and theorized from them to conclusions and only then used his theory as a lens through which to narrate American history. By contrast, Dick begins with a careful history, 
albeit one guided by questions informed by theory, and then lets the chips fall where they may. And this is most obviously seen in Soldiers, Statesmen, and Cold War Crises, the book that inspired one of my books and quite a few recent and forthcoming dissertations. It's, I've been on two or three panels recently commenting on new scholarship that takes as their springboard uh, Dick's book, Soldier, Statesman, and Cold War Crises. Dick identified patterns, but it was scrupulous about identifying exceptions to those patterns. And Dick's approach, I think, served him very well indeed. In my judgment, soldier, statesman, Cold War crisis is better history than most of the civil military relations theory books out there, and better theory than most of the civil military relations history books out there. It's in that sweet spot of being the best of both sides. As a consequence, and this is my third big contrast, Huntington tends to annoy his readers and provoke them to prove him wrong. Whereas Dick has a very different effect. He may still annoy his readers, but it is often because he persuades them that he just might be right about this. If you were a student coming to me and said you wanted to do a dissertation on American civil military relations, I'd tell you, you have to read Sam Huntington because he will make some bold statements and you can probably show that they don't really match the empirical record. But then I would tell you, you also must read Dick Betts because he will identify some patterns that will trigger in your mind research questions that might lead you to some of the claims you will actually end up defending as true. So where does that leave us? Well, it should leave you where it leaves me grateful that we have had both of these giants in the field. And in, to a certain extent, we are all students of both Sam Huntington and Dick Betts to some degree. But it makes me especially grateful today for Dick Betts because at his best, he is very, very good. And one of his hallmarks is a dogged thesis, antithesis, synthesis approach that sees the wisdom of sharply defined positions but then also sees their limits and eventually is content to settle for the muddy middle ground. That description fits both Dick's scholarship and also I would argue a significant portion of American foreign policy practice. And so it makes Dick a quintessentially American scholar. And in my vernacular at least, that is intended to be very high praise. And with that, I thank you, Dick. Thanks for that, Peter. With that, let me turn the floor over to our second speaker, Suzanne Nielsen. Suzanne. Thank you so much, uh, Steve. Uh, and to everyone here, it's truly a pleasure to be with you today. And it's an honor to have an opportunity to say a few words about Professor Dick Betts and his many significant contributions as an educator, mentor, and a scholar. I was especially glad to be asked to be on the panel called Soldiers and Statesmen, as I'd like to spend the bulk of my uh, comments this morning talking about Professor Betts's impact on soldiers, with a special focus on the officers who have had the opportunity to attend Columbia as part of their future responsibilities teaching political science in the Department of Social Sciences at West Point, which I currently head. In our community, we take special pride in our rotating military faculty. Once we select these successful army captains, they attend civilian graduate school programs en route to their teaching assignments at West Point. We then hope and expect that these officers will employ what they have gained through these experiences of studying at some of the country's best programs, as well as teaching, to enhance the contributions that they'll make throughout their future military service. As I hope you'll see in my remarks, Dick Betts's contributions to this community have been immense. After I share these reflections, I'd also like to just say a few words about Dick Betts as a scholar and a colleague from the perspective of someone who had the opportunity to collaborate with him in the context of that edited volume project that was previously mentioned. So first, let me start out by just saying a few words about Dick Betts's impact on the Army. And again, using as my primary, but not only lens, the community of which I am a part, which is the Department of Social Sciences at West Point. 
In preparing these remarks, I reached out to current and former faculty of my department who had the opportunity to attend Columbia University and to study with Dick Betts. Perhaps the first thing to note is that everyone I asked to provide input took time to respond, including Lieutenant General Ricky Waddell, who at the time of our exchange last week was in Asia with the current Secretaries of State and Defense. The first group of officers that Dick Betts influenced are those for whom he served as PhD advisor. Just some of the names here include Jay Parker, Ricky Waddell, Charlie Miller, Robert Chamberlain, Sean Lonergren, and Andy Gallo. And perhaps a place to start here is Jay Parker, who was completing his dissertation on policymaking in Vietnam with Professor Bob Jervis, just as Dick Betts was moving from Harvard to Columbia. As Jay recounts, just days before his defense, Bob Jervis told him, good news, Dick Betts has agreed to be an outside reader on your defense. Of course, to Jay, this was a mixed blessing, as hours before his defense, he learned that the co-author of the preeminent work on policymaking in Vietnam was gonna be grilling him on his work. As only Jay could say it, this was as if the advisor of his dissertation on quantum theory had said, good news, Niels Bohr has agreed to be an outside reader on your defense. Happily, uh, Dick was a great mentor uh, and great member of the committee uh, who suggested improvements actually included a correction to a footnote to a dissertation written by num another member of the social sciences community, uh, David Petraeus, who had completed his PhD at Princeton a few years previously. The completion of this dissertation was followed shortly thereafter by Dick Betts's service as an advisor on another uh, dissertation, uh, that by Ricky Waddell. And this story really prompts me to thank uh, Dick Betts, I think, for a general attribute uh, in, your, in your mentorship of military officers. Uh, which is I know many on this call realize that the military officers going through PhD programs are often on very tight timelines and they're often navigating uh, multiple competing ob obligations as they seek to do the work. In the case of, of General Waddell, and this was of course the pre-internet era, much of the mentoring through dissertation completion had to be done by phone and by email as then Major Waddell served a busy faculty tour at West Point uh, he particularly remembers a tight period in the summer of 1993, where he made the commitment that he would get a chapter a week uh, to Dick Betts, and uh, uh, which, uh, of course, to all of us sounds a little crazy. Uh, legitimately skeptical, Dick Betts said that if he received the chapters each week, he would have the detailed critique uh, back the following week. And of course, he was as good as his word, uh, and he earned the enduring gratitude of Rick Waddell, who passes on his best regards. Dick Betts' tremendous impact on his PhD advisees has continued uh, through to our more recent alums. My contemporary, Major General Charlie Miller, contributed the following. Dick Betts and Robert Jervis were my two principal dissertation advisors and had to suffer through my analysis of US Army doctrine across the 20th century. He did not pull any punches, describing one of my early chapters as boilerplate, and skillfully directing me toward the primary sources I should consult so that my work met expected academic standards. In retrospect, it seems rare to encounter that level of brutal honesty, but that's what the situation called for and I'm grateful for his mentoring. General Miller continues, toward the end of my dissertation in late 2001, early 2002, I wrote an emotional comment in my concluding chapter about the cowards who carried out 9-11. Professor Betts rightly chided me once again with a comment, you can call them many things, but they were not cowards, which is in fact true and helped shape my understanding of violent extremism, which I carried into three subsequent tours in Iraq, uh, the last one in two, two thousand, uh, 2017, uh, also including time in Syria. In all, General Miller concludes, Dick Brett Betts brought gravitas to the classroom, matched with good humor, all underpinned by a lifetime of study and practice. I could not have asked for a better professor. From then Captain Robert Chamberlain, from the very beginning, Dick Betts helped me navigate the bureaucracy and get my application to the PhD program considered. I then took his foreign policy seminar, one of the most enjoyable courses I took at Columbia. He was a great sounding board, counselor and role model in the department. I think the world of him. From then Captain Sean Lonergren, Dick Betts was an incredible mentor to me while at Columbia. He was my dissertation advisor and I took his war, peace and strategy class. 
He was always incredibly supportive of the military officers in the program. As far as memorable moments, I remember the time I tried growing a beard and he came over and told me all the military grow beards here, but none of them know that they need to trim it. So the next thing Sean knew, uh, he had Dick Betts and Bob Jervis trying to explain to him uh, how to trim a beard. Sean continues, perhaps most importantly, I don't think I would have been able to complete my PhD if it wasn't for Dick Betts. I had an immensely hard time getting people back in 2014 when I was putting my proposal together to see the value in studying cyber. And he helped fight a lot of the opposition and properly situate my research in a nascent field that did not allow for traditional research methods. I came very close to thinking I needed to walk away from cyber and do something more mainstream which not only would have been a significant disappointment, but it also would have been a significant missed opportunity. Of course, beyond his many PhD advisees, Dick Betts taught and mentored numerous other defense professionals pursuing master's degrees. Major General Charlie Miller probably said it best. In his words, Dick Betts shaped multiple generations of military officers and senior defense uh, officials who passed through Columbia. He did so largely through uh, the course we've already heard about this morning, the legendary War, Peace and Strategy course, a notoriously difficult course uh, with a grueling exam. It reflected the seriousness and professional standards he brought to bear on those charged with plotting and executing our nation's defense policy. One of our currently serving faculty, Major Dexter Dugan, had this to say about the course. A full-on survey of everything IR, the total readings in the course amounted to 2,578 pages, and the grade was based only on the midterm and final exams. I did note the exact uh, page count was, was impressive. I had the primary reader uh, for his class in hand when I was on the subway, whenever I was able to sit down for lunch, and every night at home. One day I was walking in midtown Manhattan between trains, and a businessman caught up to me in the crosswalk. Seeing the conflict in, after the Cold War reader in my hand, he said that everything out of his own SEPA experience, out of everything in his own SEPA experience, he'll never forget the war, peace, and strategy class. I think most or all students coming out of SEPA feel the same way. As I enjoyed reading the reflections of our various uh, members of our faculty community over time, uh, in addition to the, to the opportunity for intellectual growth uh, that Dick Betts provided, Another element of the experience that seems to stand out, and it's also already been mentioned this morning, uh, in the minds of those who studied under, under Dick Betts, uh, was his use of candor. Uh, perhaps I'll just give one more example here. And this is from uh, Adam Robitaille, who is another currently serving member of my department. Uh, and he shared the following. Dr. Betts made frequent use of the chalkboard in the large auditorium, and I'd get to class early to get a head start on sketching the board into my notebook. One day I arrived in class and feverishly sketched the latest chalkboard. It was an XY plot. The Y axis was labeled with an I and the X axis was labeled uh, with an E. Within the plot in the top left uh, corner, there was a semicircle and it had a cluster of A's and some B's. And in the bottom sort of right, it had another cluster, lots of C's and a single D. Dr. Betts also had a straight line between the two semi-circles uh, on the graph. Unsure of how this would apply to the lecture, uh, uh, and this is Adam's words, I looked at the sketch in my notebook. When all the students were seated, uh, Dick Betts returned to the board. On the y-axis, he completed the word intelligence. On the x-axis, he completed the word effort. He then labeled everything right of the bisecting line admissions errors and handed back the midterm exams. What I gained uh, from our brief interactions, so first of all, Adams, let me just say, uh, he, uh, he gleefully recounts to me that he was not an admissions error, uh, perhaps making us feel better of, about our selection of Adam to come teach. Um, but what he goes on to say is, what I gained uh, from, our, from his interactions with Dick Betts was that he cared deeply about the field, about the program, and about his students. And uh, his dominant reaction is, it was certainly a privilege to study at, at SEPA while he was at the helm of my program. So I share the story in part uh, because it's fun, uh, but also because it gets at a challenge that all of us who are educators face, which is the role of candor in our teaching, advising, and mentoring. 
And I would say that based on the dominant uh, through lines in these memories, uh, which are deep gratitude and deep respect, I would say that Dick Batts got this right. In addition to his impact on countless officers who were his students, I would just like to note uh, briefly the myriad other valuable bridges built by Dick Betts between academia and the military, uh, just some of which include the following. Uh, and for this, I'm, I'm personally grateful. He added intellectual weight to numerous uh, West Point outreach conferences through his participation over the years, to include our student-focused student conference in the United States Affairs and our policy-focused senior conferences. He served as the boss to at least four of our faculty who taught the course on limited war and low intensity uh, conflict at CIPA, including Joe Collins, Jay Parker, Joe Felter, and Ike Wilson. Through his generous uh, leadership of SWAMOS over the years, he enabled numerous officers to not just benefit from the content of the workshop, but probably at least as importantly or more so, the opportunity to interact in such an immersive way with their talented civilian peers. He has advised uh, numerous uh, senior civilian uh, defense officials. And I would note, I also had the privilege of uh, a front row seat while he did this at a Korean army conference in the Republic of Korea. And last but not least, his presence was noted uh, by various members of our faculty community over the years uh, at uh, Columbia's debates on ROTC, where he was known for making a strong case in favor of the return of ROTC to campus. Jay Parker may have put it best uh, in trying to summarize this section uh, it, with these words. And he said, in a military so frequently criticized for being anti-intellectual, no one has more effectively and continuously contributed to the intellectual enhancement of the American military than Richard Betts. Before I close, I do wanna just say a few words as well from the perspective of somebody who had the opportunity to work with Dick Betts in the context of an edited volume project. Of course, it goes without saying that, that my co-editor Don Snyder and I sought a chapter from Dick Betts for our edited volume, American Civil Military Relations, due, the, due to the importance of his uh, already existing contributions to the field. And of course, once we had his commitment to write, we were especially delighted uh, as we knew that despite the extent of his writing, publishing, and other commitments, uh, once Dick Betts said he was going to do something, he would follow through. Perhaps I'll just make two comments here about the substance of that chapter, uh, which in my view are largely reflected of the larger uh, body of his work. First, and I, I think this really uh, dovetails with some things that Peter Fever already said, uh, Dick Betts's analysis is always embedded in a rich, deep knowledge of the subject matter. In this case, his discussion of whether or not we should think of American civil military relations as being characterized by crisis was embedded and drew on rich histories across multiple subfields, including American politics, international relations, economics, public policy, and even psychology. Second, what seemed most important as Dick Betts drew his well-researched and carefully thought out conclusions was that they were sound, not that they were sens sensational or intention grabbing. I reread the chapter yesterday and I especially uh, remembered uh, enjoying this, this aspect of his uh, scholarship. Perhaps I'll share just one example uh, from the section that explains, um, the section of that chapter, which explains why it's too simple to judge American civil military relations by whether or not the president achieves the president's uh, preferred policy outcomes. Of course, part of the problem with this approach is that it ignores the ever-present challenge of the fact that Congress is also a significant role in American civil military relations, and it has its own uh, prerogatives and preferences in shaping outcomes. Uh, what Dick Betts reminds us in the chapter is just good old checks and balances. He then goes on to, to say, and this is a sentence among many uh, that made me smile, to observers who are horrified to find that presidents and civilian managers in the Pentagon sometimes bend to bureaucratic resistance or compromise with competing preferences of other constituencies, one can only say, welcome to the US government. There are many examples uh, of similar points in that sing single chapter. Uh, overall, I, when I think of Dick Betts's work in the field of American civil military relations, uh, which I find to be uh, so admirable, uh, the works that come to my mind are balanced, insightful, non-alarmist, and right. 
with that, let me just say thank you again for the opportunity to be on this panel today. It's, it's really a privilege to contribute these remarks of gratitude on behalf of the community, again, which I'm a part, which is the Department of Social Sciences at West Point, uh, but more broadly uh, for his uh, incredible contributions to uh, heightening uh, the intellectual level uh, of the military through the many military officers he has taught and influenced over the years. And then finally, uh, just one more uh, voice uh, offering thank you for, the, for his brilliant scholarly contributions to our understanding of so many uh, critical uh, questions that relate to the fields of civil military relations or security studies. And with that, let me, let me leave it there. Thank you. Thanks for that, Suzanne. Uh, with that, let me turn the floor over to Cynthia Roberts. Cynthia? Thanks, Steve. Uh, you can hear me all right, I assume. Uh, it's an honor to be part of this group of distinguished scholars, of course, celebrating the contributions of Dick Betts. And um, my remarks today aim to show how Dick's scholarship has inspired insights and research relating to a subset of the panel's uh, broader topic moving from soldiers and statesmen to soldiers and autocrats. But before I do that, let me take a minute for myself also to express gratitude to Dick Betts, who's been an informal mentor to me. I was never his student, uh, a supportive colleague, a brilliant scholar who's had a huge impact on how I think about security problems and not just about the importance of strategy, nuclear deterrence, nuclear blackmail, surprise attack, for someone who's worked heavily on 1941, military readiness, and of course the subject of this panel, soldiers and statesmen. Uh, let me just mention briefly two um, uh, points to that regard. I think my first introduction, I was uh, trying to remember, to Betz's work was actually not one of the great books I, uh, on the subjects I just mentioned, but an international security article where he showed how to operationalize and distinguish between offensive and defensive forces so as to signal a non-offensive defense. And, and Betts wrote, the most effective capability for defense that posed the least capability for attack would be in effect heavily armed infantry lined up shoulder to shoulder all along the border with their legs cut off. I was amazed that international security published that but then uh, I think Dick Betts straightened out my understanding on another important topic, um, uh, not only about service rivalries, but also how to win intra-service battles. This, of course, from his classic soldier statesman in Cold War Crises, where he was evoking images of B-52s and Curtis LeMay, so the reader could understand, as he wrote, that the SAC elite attained leadership by flying heavy bombers not by reading Clausewitz. Um, this from someone I think who has uh, a very dog-eared copy of the Howard Parrott translation of On War, because I think in all of his studies, uh, he finds the perfect um, uh, quotations uh, from that classic, uh, making me think somehow I missed all of them. Anyway, the, uh, the quotation about uh, targets of bombers is a good opportunity to pivot to what I'd like to talk about today in a more substantive con context uh, as a tribute to Dick. Um, his work on civil military relations, uh, I think has inspired uh, other works um, in a non-democratic setting where professional militaries are subordinate to authoritarian political controls. And in discussing this literature, I'd like to start with two important in, insights uh, that develop um, themes that Betts addresses. Uh, the first is that there are, of course, different types of authoritarian regimes, and they have different propensities for war. So, for example, Jessica Weeks has shown that two factors, personalism and militarism, underpin autocratic foreign policy and that personalist autocratic regimes the type led by strong men, uh, using uh, Dan Slater's app labels for these ideal types, are more war prone than other types, such as uh, machine um, regimes, non personalist, non militist, or juntas, non personalist, and militarists, or bosses. And this is mainly because personalist dictators cannot be punished for their bad performance by other elites, as is the case in, say, machine type regimes. 
Um, Weeks also suggests the assumption that militaries are more militaristic is problematic. Uh, This is something that there's a need for further research because of other statistical analysis that actually support a link between military regimes and and conflict propensity. But um, relatedly, uh, and I think of importance to this topic, uh, Milan Svolnik has shown how personalist leaders become object, unchecked dictators. And, in, and of course, it's by succeeding in several power grabs without being stopped. And so they accumulate enough power that their former allies are no longer able uh, to stage a rebellion that could topple the leader. This is how Stalin, we know, managed to turn the Politburo, originally an institution of collective leadership, into an instrument of his personal rule. And the lost opportunity comes on this trajectory when the first among equals goes from sharing the spoils of joint rule to becoming the absolute dictator because uh, there wasn't an effective deterrent based on a credible threat of a coup by the leader's inner circle to remove him. Uh, We know after Stalin's death, uh, Khrushchev was able to maneuver successfully against his opponents, notably Malenkov, and they later on Khrushchev's opponents successfully maneuvered against him uh, and collective leadership was restored. In that, it's interesting to note that the military was dragged in but didn't instigate the the coup um, and the collective leadership was restored until the end of the Soviet Union, the collapse where the military Uh, was uh, unable to actually execute the coup to rescue the demise of the Soviet Union. Um, And Putin then returned uh, eventually Russia to personalist dictatorship. Uh, That evolution that we see under Putin uh, has a similar dynamic appearing to have happened in China where many experts of course now characterize Xi Jinping as a personalist autocrat who's consolidated uh, his power and turned collective leadership in China into an instrument of his personal rule as president for life. So this doesn't bode well, this trajectory for future US relations with China and Russia. The second body of literature uh, that I wanna mention connects personalist regimes to compromise combat effectiveness. And this is of course a topic that panelists on uh, here uh, have written about um, and that Betts uh, has supported this work um, uh, to a large extent looking at, for example, Caitlin Talmadge's compelling book on the dictator's army. The logic here is that these personalist dictatorships uh, don't uh, support patterns of civil military relations that promote combat effectiveness in conventional war, the kind that require merit-based promotion, rigorous realistic training, decentralized unified command, information sharing, and so on. Just the opposite, because autocratic regimes fear coups and other domestic threats, they're incentivized to select uh, commanders who are loyal, to restrict information sharing, to hobble the military with counterintelligence, to put checks on their command, and a whole host of mechanisms we all know that degrade tactical proficiency and competence in complex combined arms operations the kind that Steve Biddle has explained so masterfully for us. So this literature contends that leaders must accept the risks of either military defeat or loss of office from coup conspiracies. Um, And when autocrats uh, do begin to experience serious losses uh, during wars or other combat actions, uh, it's suggested they sometimes, or they often abandon coup prevention tactics and adopt Uh, organizational forms that are more conducive to military success. So put together, these two sets of insights suggest bad news for dictators in international conflicts. Personalist dictators are more prone to conflicts on the one hand, but because they engage in coup proofing, uh, they're less likely to do well on the battlefield. Um, uh, Personally, I think more empirical tests are needed on this and I have some problems with their Soviet cases, Um, but drawing on Dick's work, I wanna suggest three factors uh, that deserve more attention given the relevance of these challenges uh, posed by personalist dictatorships to the cases of China and Russia, which are um, clearly of importance to the United States today. First, 
I would suggest we shouldn't understate the potential for dictators with professional militaries to manage the trade-offs between coup proofing and combat effectiveness. In fact, a number of scholars like Dan Ryder and others have suggested um, that autocrats have a wider range of choices beyond blunt coup proofing techniques uh, like Stalin's brutal purges, and they tend not to face binary trade-offs between external and internal threats. Uh, moreover, dictators can adopt coup proofing and military performance enhancing measures simultaneously. Obviously, some are better at this than others, but it's hardly impossible. And I would also add uh, Betz's important insight that efficiency and effectiveness are not the same thing. Um, and uh, to quote from uh, one of his uh, papers on this question, uh, he said, the handy thing about having surplus power is that you can be careless and still get to where you want to go, um, reflecting this notion that quantity has a quality all of its own. And it helps, of course, in the Soviet case to be blessed by vast strategic depth, uh, which helped save the Soviet Union from its uh, the German invasion of 1941 and shows the potential for learning while losing uh, and becoming effective enough to prevail um, in despite the staggering cost. And the cost was, of course, staggering in the first six months of combat um, through January 1st of 1942. The bulk of the pre-war Red Army was basically lost as four and a half million men were killed, wounded, or captured. Uh, but what's amazing is these men were replaced and shocked uh, the Wehrmacht with hundreds of new divisions constantly formed to cover the more staggering losses uh, that followed the Red Army until they finally defeated the Third Reich at a cost of some 27 million Soviet lives. But what if uh, a second uh, uh, point that's worth underscoring is what if autocrats come to power without any personal experience with military uh, matters like Putin and Xi have, and we can expect uh, more so perhaps in the future um, and Beth suggests that um, if political control of the military seems a big problem, it's because obviously of the consequences of military policy, how much they matter. And here, uh, I think um, echoing um, the point uh, that Fever made about Huntington as importance, uh, Sam Huntington obviously asserted that respect for the military's autonomy is necessary for military effectiveness. Um, because military and civilian leaders have different expertise and duties, and maybe autocrats to some extent come to recognize this despite their um, keen stake in controlling the military even more uh, thoroughly than is the case in a civilian uh, democracy. Um, you know, the point I would make here again, going back and looking at the Soviets uh, case, in 1941, this terrible disaster uh, can be traced not only to Stalin's poor leadership and meddling in the, the brutal purges uh, that ensured successive uh, battlefield failures um, and an unready uh, military largely unprepared, um, but it's also the case that um, um, uh, political leaders have to do justice to a view of strategy that demands integration. Uh, and that's not something that we saw as thoroughly as I think uh, some of the literature suggests. Because in 1941, it wasn't just Stalin who failed, failed in um, uh, not alerting the troops, failed in believing that war could be avoided, uh, failed in uh, a host of respects on specific aspects of military policy. But it was also the case that the Red Army uh, itself failed and the generals failed by principally being responsible, uh, we now know, thanks to uh, more available archives, for the recklessly offensive war plans that called for the forward deployment of about 70% of Soviet divisions, armor and aviation in the Western military district. And obviously German gem generals welcomed this mistake uh, because it would ease the encirclement and destruction of Soviet forces. The, the Red Army um, did so because they expected uh, to be able to go on the offensive 
easily uh, containing any attack at some later time, not necessarily then, uh, or um, to try and preempt a German attack. Um, and there's um, good circumstantial evidence that this was the aim. And so um, Stalin, who may or may not have been extensively briefed on this beforehand, I think he probably was, uh, but expected that still war at this stage could be delayed months or maybe a year. Um, Stalin got blindsided. In a sense, he failed to audit his military doctrine, failed to understand what were the implications uh, of the Ren Army's attachment uh, to offense and uh, severe neglect, even discrediting of defense. So um, Soviet citizens paid a huge price for this, uh, but ultimately they prevailed. What about if we um, um, teleport this argument into the nuclear age and the profound implications this can have uh, for, for us? Um, Post-war generals and the top military leadership uh, in the Soviet case, um, in reflecting the lessons from 1941, have tended to emphasize the biggest problem in recalling how the danger of war was not correctly assessed. Um, and uh, that Stalin, that most of the mistake was on Stalin's side uh, and much less so if any on their side, although uh, there are some uh, who, uh, who remark and reflect on uh, the neglect of strategic defense uh, and the inability to mount uh, a mobile defense uh, and instead, as the army was forced into disorganized re retreat and resurrecting the scorched earth policies, uh, reminiscent of Kutuzov and Alexander uh, dealing with the French invasion. Uh, but in the nuclear age, uh, post-war generals evoked 1941 to ominously recall uh, this danger of war and how the Soviet Union should never again suffer a knockout blow and the way to avert that was to revert to preemption or a kind of launch on warning strategy. More than once, Soviet officials, including the chief of the general staff, Marshal Nikolai Argarkov, and others, indeed, uh, even uh, a defense minister, have called for increasing military readiness and greater authority to launch nuclear forces on warning. Now, Here's the core of the civil military um, dimension, the problem that I want to conclude with, that the Soviet system of centralized control, indeed, um, one would imagine all authoritarian uh, civil military systems of nuclear weapon states like Russia and China, required, in the Soviet case, it required a lot of time to reach a collective decision whether to authorize a launch. And this was in fact, one of the reasons, in addition to the a series of technical problems that the Soviet command faced, that the generals pressed for a launch on warning or what eventually emerged into a launch under attack. Um, that's uh, the term we would use for their strategy, um, not for the kind of um, um, certainty uh, in um, a full uh, waiting for um, all of the missiles to land in a retaliatory blow. Um, and so, uh, and this has been a recurring problem that comes back. Even today, we see um, uh, Russian um, military arguing their concerns in the continuing threat um, to bring back some sort of idea or to continue and persist with an idea of launch on warning or launch under attack, which is a variant of uh, the current strategy um, in the face of new technological threats and military threats um, from the United States. So, you know, one question that that's worth thinking about going forward: uh, that um, if Russia fears threats to its nuclear deterrent become severe, as it did in the past, and even more severe. Um, would it be easier to go to a launch on warning or even a preemption option under a personalist dictator like Putin um, than the collective leadership under the Soviet Union, which was very reticent to go that route? 
Um, and it's also worth thinking about what happens if China one day uh, fears that its retaliatory capabilities are vulnerable to US attack and uh, generals there decide to press for a launch on warning uh, option. Um, um, that's not current Chinese policy as we know, uh, but we can't rule out the impact and the implications of the civil military dimension um, uh, that Betts uh, stressed and that we see in uh, the, the nature of the personalist um, regimes. Um, so I'll, 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 I think I'll stop there, but uh, one hopes that we, we can do more than reread Betts' terrific book on surprise attack and instead find ways to think uh, through these problems of uh, personalist regimes in the civil military context and uh, the nuclear age and the threats we face. Thanks. Well, thanks for that, Cynthia. Uh, fascinating ideas. And uh, as with a lot of Dick's work, more dissertations to be written, right? I, yes. There's a few great dissertations in there, I know. Uh, and that's, of course, one of the great virtues of, of Dick's era is its ability to inspire additional work and further thought. Um, the panel has displayed the influence of Dick Betts in many ways, one of which being their self-discipline. <laughs> and actually sticking to the time limits, which enables us to have a good uh, period of time for questions and answers from the group. As the audience is formulating their thoughts, I'm gonna take the chair's prerogative and just offer one more insight of my own. I'll, I'll have some other Dick stories for, uh, for later in the day, as I'm sure we all do, but, but since I have the opportunity, I'm gonna start with one while the, the blue hands start coming up for Q&A. Which is me when I was getting into this business in the 1980s, right? The the debate was over in in academia and think tanks was over, overwhelmingly nuclear. If you wanted to be a grad student and do security studies, you were mostly doing nuclear work. Now, of course, that meant coming to grips with Dick's work on nuclear weapons. More on that later in the day. But I was particularly interested in conventional forces. And at that time, the number of serious scholarly academic voices on conventional warfare was unbelievably tiny. And the towering figure in the field was Dick. And in particular, at you know, that moment in the history of the American defense debate, the early 1980s, the, the big issue that everybody was talking about was what was called the military reform debate. This, this critique of the then current US military practices overly bureaucratized and unimaginative. Uh, and, and much of that work tended to punditry. Uh, but in this kind of land of punditry, in walked Dick, right? Where relative to this kind of you know, often you know, breezy pie in the sky quality kind of debate, Dick was bringing his trademark rigor, clarity, insight, originality, but, but also his sometimes less remarked upon skills as a prose stylist. And in particular, there was one sentence from his essay, Dubious Reforms, Strategism versus Managerialism in the Defense Reform Debate, edited by Asa Clark et al., 1984. I commend it to all's attention. And I'm, I'm just going to take the, the uh, opportunity to read this one sentence because I love it so much. Dick wrote, it is hard to escape the feeling that romanticism intrudes here too, that the solution envisioned by defense reform advocates is some exhilarating combination of brilliant, confident, adventurous commanders, jut-jawed, scarves flowing in the wind, backed by organically bonded troops singing the Panzer lead, elbowing aside wimpy military bureaucrats. Right? I've, the, I've spent the rest of my career hoping that I could someday write a sentence like that and get it published, right? <laughs> even more challenging. Uh, Dick managed to do both. And I found it inspiring. You know, it, it, it's the, the stuff of future careers trying to match. You know, style is, you know, styling's uh, quite that thoughtful and perceptive. Um, so with, with that, again, I'm gonna open the floor to, to Q&A, whether from participants or whether from panelists, I'll give the, the room a couple of seconds and then I'll jump in with a few of my own, if no one else does, which uh, if you need uh, motivation, 
to ask questions, no better motive than uh, the fear of listening to mine if, okay, so I'm, I'm going to start. And what, what I'm gonna do with, with mine anyway, uh, is I'm gonna throw open some questions about general American civil military relations as they exist today, given that we have the tremendous privilege of three brilliant panelists and one of the world's foremost scholars on American civil military relations on the call at the moment. So I'm, I would like to take the opportunity to just explore this, the current contemporary substance of this uh, using the insight and perspective of those we have on the call. So let me, let me start with uh, one. Um, in many ways, you know, this is an unusual moment, right, in the history of American civil military relations. I mean, we had, you know, General Milley's decisions at Lafayette Square, you know, last June that were widely panned, including by General Milley himself. Uh, the military response to defending the Capitol on January 6 has been widely criticized. And at least in some polls, U.S. public confidence in the military seems to be eroding. Uh, so I'm just curious what you know, a thoughtful group like this thinks about where this is all going. Is the military, the US military now looking at a future of life as a domestic political football? Can they actually stay out of American politics in an era in which just about every other facet of American life is being politicized? Should they observe traditional norms uh, of their relationship to American political life and the lack thereof in an era of unusual ferment of the kind we observe today. Um, so let me, let me pose that to the panel at large and to Dick. And I'm just curious what you folks think. Should we let Dick go first? If, if he wants. Okay, okay. Um, I think it's an important question. And uh, I think it's uh, especially important because of the unique circumstances uh, historically and politically. Uh, I think a, a lot of the problem you've identified is associated with the polarization of the political system in general. Uh, that combined with historically the natural and understandable uh, sort of disproportionate identification of uh, professional military officers with conservative uh, political views, which is normally not a problem because of the norms of civilian control and uh, nonpartisanship in professional behavior, uh, but which uh, became harder to implement in practice in the last administration because of the uh, uh, uniquely problematic behavior of the president himself. So that in order to honor, <clears throat> excuse me, to honor the norms of civilian control means it's uh, difficult for the military to resist uh, the president uh, without appearing insubordinate, while to honor the constitutional and political norms of nonpartisanship uh, it's hard to do anything else. And I don't know that the solution to that uh, is obvious other than uh, what we got, which was the solution of getting rid of that particular president. But that doesn't get rid of the problem of polarization, uh, which leaves the uh, military vulnerable like other groups uh, to uh, that, that sort of uh, a whipsaw between uh, between the extremes, uh, with this with the political center uh, as weakened as it has been, uh, a lot of the natural support for nonpartisanship, which is implicitly rooted in the tradition of compromise and moderation, a lot of that support is gone. Uh, so uh, while Trump is gone, uh, I don't think the uh, uh, raw material for the when we're rising again is gone. Other members of the panel like to weigh in? So I, I would add that you, you do see a slight dip uh, year over year with uh, public confidence in the military. One of the things in your opening stem, uh, I do not, I wouldn't overstate that. The military remains 
uh, one of the few institutions that has high confidence. And it's got to remain there long enough for me to finish the book that I'm writing with Jim Golby was premised on why has it stayed so high? So it's got to stay high enough for us to finish the book. Uh, then it can drop uh, afterwards. Um, but one of the reasons that it has uh, is under assault is is the point that Dick made that because that high number, high confidence expressed in the aggregate, which is how it's usually reported in newspapers, masks quite a substantial partisan gap underneath it with the uh, the Democrats respondents having high confidence in the military, but the Republicans having super high confidence in the military. And, and it's so it's on average that produces very high confidence in the American public as a whole, but with a very strong partisan uh, tilt. And when you manipulate or play with that by with survey experiments designed to see how public would respond to the military taking on one identity or the other, what you learn uh, is that the, the public like would like to see the military align with their party. So the, the public is not as wedded to uh, the norm of a political uh, military as scholars like Dick, myself, and others in the room would, would wish. Public is willing to tolerate a lot of uh, uh, taboo behavior by the military. What they don't like is the possibility that the military would align with the opposite party. Uh, and that's where, uh, that, that's what drives down public confidence. Um, when you, you fight, so to, drives down confidence among Democrats when you tell them that they're aligned with the Republicans or um, among Republicans if you tell them they're aligned with, with Democrats. Two other points playing off of what Dick said, which is, I think one of the things we've learned in the last four years is, uh, was implicitly understood, but now we appreciate it how much of our system relies on norms and is policed by, uh, by political actors not getting chalk on their cleats by getting really close to the lines of what they can do, but staying fairly far away. And when we have a political leader who's stock and trade, who, who, who uh, is, he busts the taboo. If you tell him you can't touch that, that's the thing he's gonna touch uh, because uh, you know that he's sort of owning folks who who are being politically correct in this way. He violated a lot of the taboos on which American civil mill best practice has counted uh, or depended, I should say. And uh, I think that has that has created us a, a system that is uh, exhausted. You when you talk to senior military leaders, uh, you know, particularly in the early January time frame, there was just a you know palpable sense of boy we got to get to regular order we got to get back to regular order if we can um, because the just holding it together when so many of the taboos were busted um, or were being violated uh, was a challenge and I'll I'll stop there. I think just one thing I might add is that the you know one of the things that's been on my mind uh, during this time frame has just been. Uh, whether or not there is a need to uh, for the military to be more attentive to some presumptions that we might have made about socialization and about norm reinforcement mechanisms within the service, and thinking about uh, thinking about you know really fundamental issues like the distinction between um, being political and being partisan. You know there is you know no more political. I mean. The military is as political as any political institution in the sense that it exists for political purposes, for foreign policy purposes, and it has a political weight domestically, uh, whether it, it seeks it or not. Uh, and so helping to foster some more nuanced thinking about, about the recognition of that intrinsically and inevitably political dimension of the military, uh, and yet the, the, um, the absolute uh, essential corresponding emphasis on trying to uh, avoid uh, partisanship and navigating that, I think is actually quite a, a nuanced and sophisticated uh, endeavor that I don't think we do a lot of explicit preparation of our senior military leaders in order to be able to do. And that may, you know, and, it, and again, talking about senior military leaders is perhaps not right anymore because uh, we have such a potential to have a, a social impact 
at all ranks now with social media and other things. I think the the question so the questions really are in my mind is what how do we how, how what what does norm reinforcement uh, need to look like within the military? What kind of socialization does that look like? I might just give one specific example. You know, I think when I was I I uh, had fewer years of service. Uh, I think that I would have naturally expected any officer to say uh, when they saw a form of political behavior that they did not like. Uh, for example, let's just take the polemic flag flag burning. You know that that upset them and that they felt that it was a grievously wrong thing to do. Uh, but on the other hand, they felt that it was absolutely uh, the right, it was for the people's First Amendment rights to, to do such acts, even those that, with which they vigorously disagreed, that they agreed to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. So that understanding of supporting the framework that makes our political system possible uh, and the fact that that leaves open a whole variety of behaviors, those types of norms, I don't know that we get those as firmly inculcated with, without deliberate effort. And so, and so that's sort of the thinking uh, that where my mind has been in terms of how do ought we be thinking about this within the military and what, what may, maybe ought we to be doing uh, in order to make sure that we don't just take for granted that the things that we understand about uh, nonpartisan behavior, about uh, a military that's forced to defend the Constitution, what that really means, and are we prepared to, do we have officers uh, equipped to lead the institutions to do it? Can I, can I just add one more point, Cindy? I hope I'm not uh, stepping in, because something Suzanne said just triggered an idea that's directly related to Dick Betts's retirement, so it ties the, the our purpose here today. Uh, in the U.S., uh, the military spends a fair bit of time thinking about civil military relations. They, I think they need to spend more. I think it needs to be a, a key part of the instructional blocks at every level of PME, but they do spend some time and they spend a lot more time than the average civilian in the civil military relationship at the policymaking level have spent thinking seriously about it, except for those civilians who had the good fortune of taking a course with Dick Betts. So while we pray, while Suzanne praised Dick for the impact he had on military officers, which is profound, I suspect that his bigger impact on American civ mill may have been through sensitizing at least those students who took Dick's course and then went on to senior positions in the national security arena to the civil military questions. But Dick is an unusual figure in terms of focusing on civ mill. And there's not enough courses uh, across the board and not enough time that spent by civilians who are going to be in the civil military equation. And so for those of us who will still be uh, working the, in plowing the fields after Dick is sitting on the veranda looking at us, we've got to be plowing the civilian field as heavily as we plow the military field because I think that there's going to be some uh, that, that's where the gap is uh, in terms of thinking carefully. And if you want, if you doubt me, read Ron Krebs's recent uh, article, Krebs et al. talks about how little uh, of the norms of civil mill have any resonance with the American um, public. Uh, they just don't buy into it. Uh, and why should they? Where have they ever been taught it? It's just not part of uh, the civics education that they do get. Uh, so we're losing a valuable uh, asset when Dick retires uh, in this effort. And so the rest of us have to pick up the slack. You're here. Well, in that case, let me go to uh, let the- Let me just oh, jump Dick? in and remind people that I'm not retiring except <laughs> for directing me institute. Uh, I will uh, remain otherwise still engaged. So Peter, you're going to have to wait to visit me on the veranda. Okay. I I had you already on the beach uh, with your toes in the water. Okay, that, that I feel a little bit better. The nation can sleep well tonight for a little bit longer. Oh, oh contraire. I mean, as as you know, you know co-director still with Dick of the International Security Policy Concentration, I am personally overseeing his exercise program you know, to keep Dick in the saddle as long as possible. Uh, it it it'll be a loss. Uh, to the nation, but also to Columbia when he finally makes that decision, which 
thank heavens he is not yet. He's stepping down from the Institute, but not as a scholar. Uh, and I'm, I'm deeply grateful for that. Uh, so let, let's at this point, uh, Cynthia, I did want to make sure if you, if you wanted to weigh in, you had the chance. Okay. Uh, no, take, take questions from others. I think that'd be useful. Uh, you know, an act of, of remarkable intellectual generosity. Let, let's, uh, let's go to the queue. And I, the first name I see is our colleague, Robert Jervis. Oh, thank you. Really good panel. My question, some similarity to Steve's about changes in U.S. civil military relations. But I want to focus on the war on terror and more the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. They were both arguably failures. And how that's affected on both sides. I mean, we know that Obama and I assume Biden felt that at least in the early, in the first year of the reviews, the military mousetrapped the civilians, was not honest uh, with them, and then went public in a way to uh, really foreclose the options that certainly Biden wanted relevant now and that perhaps Obama at least wanted to consider. Uh, and, you know, the military has done some things extraordinarily skillfully, but a lot of other things, not so much. And on the military side, I assume there is some questioning of the judgment of civilians getting them first our Bush into Iraq neglecting and then being inconsistent in Afghanistan, then in signing a, a peace agreement with obvious problems. So uh, has some of the civilian military trust and confidence been eroded by uh, the sense for each group, not that it's united, that the competence of the other is um, less than what might be uh, expected. Fire, fire away in whichever order you like. Dick, do you want to go first as a, just as a courtesy? Uh, you'll need to unmute though, Dick. Uh, I'll wait and say something a little later. Okay. Uh, th this is uh, one of the things that, we, Bob, that we are looking at uh, in the research that I'm doing with Jim Goldie. And one of the things that we find is that the looking at the, how the public assesses it, uh, the public largely um, views, uh, it, sorry, largely insulates the military from blame. Uh, and this is one of the, the benefits that the military gleans from its high level of confidence. It buys a certain amount of insulation. And so when you, you give the public or when you press the public to say, well, you know, who do you blame uh, for the outcomes in Iraq or Afghanistan? Uh, what you find is that they tend to blame the civilian leaders of the opposite party. So Republicans would blame Democratic political leaders for the outcomes and the, and the Democrats blame the Republican political leaders for the outcome. Uh, they tend to give their own political civilian leaders uh, the benefit of the doubt. And then they tend to treat the military more or less like their own civilian uh, party leaders, uh, giving them uh, the benefit of the doubt for, for outcomes that are that they otherwise view as mixed. Uh, this has, I think, protected uh, the military from another kind of uh, dynamic that people worried about, um, particularly in Iraq. They worried about that the, that, that, that the Iraq would lead to a stab in the back kind of narrative taking hold amongst the military and in a way that you, we saw a little bit after Vietnam, but of course saw most um, dramatically in, in Germany after World War I. That, that hasn't happened in part because uh, the, 
we could argue that the, the costs of the war have been uh, less perhaps, but also in part because uh, the blame has followed uh, rather nicely from the point of view of avoiding this problem on the politicians from the other side. And that's where the focus of civilians place it on. And so that doesn't turn into a blame the military dynamic, which would then have the military turn around and blame uh, the civilians. So that that uh, that that's at the level of public opinion. At the level of uh, um, actors, at the senior level, strategy actors. What you, Bob, your summary is exactly right in describing how they felt about it. It may not be an accurate description of what actually went down, but it is certainly an accurate description of how either side would would describe their frustration, say with the Afghan strategy review uh, or with Rumsfeld's um, you know, uh, decision-making in 2002, 2003. Uh, and so uh, there is, has been a lot of uh, friction and distrust that both wars have generated uh, and has, uh, and particularly with a, a leader like President Obama who came in with very little uh, experience in this area and then had a annual yearly tutorial on Iraq, I mean, on Afghanistan strategy. And by the end, you see um, uh, a, you know, a very strong level of distrust uh, of, the, of the kind of counsel that he was getting from combatant commanders. He had high level of trust uh, in, in Chairman Dempsey, but, but much uh, less levels of trust in his uh, regional commanders. I think, uh, you know, if I, you know, as I think about that question, um, you know, I, I would just take take it, take the premise is, is correct, which is we're not talking about two brilliant strategic successes for the United States when we talk about the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. I think what I would be concerned about is that um, one of the, the many causes for concern is that in any large scale endeavor like that, that does not uh, result in strategic success there are just so many layers and levels of, of, the, of, the, of the contributing factors to that. And one of the challenges is if the, United, if the military isn't taking any of the blame, does it let the military off the hook? Uh, one might think that there is an opportunity for introspection associated with aspects of the, of the lack of success in terms of achieving the, the national political outcomes of the United States at, at costs that we would say uh, were commensurate with the value of what was being sought. So, you know, one part of it from my perspective is uh, that a lack of accountability does not incentivize introspection in a way that might cause the military to be prepared to be more successful in the future. Um, so, you know, I, I think that, and then the second factor is that with the transition now to the focus on great power competition, there's a second reason why it's okay to walk away from Iraq and Afghanistan, because just as the refocus in Europe, you know, I shouldn't say just as, because nothing is just as uh, in security studies, but in a way that's similar to the refocusing on, on the Soviet problem and uh, the balance in Europe after the Vietnam War enabled the military institutions to not focus on what happened in Vietnam and tried to learn from it in an enduring way. I think now the, the, the rush to uh, refocus on great power competition, regardless of how justified it might be strategically, is one more enabling factor to prevent us from perhaps learning the aspects of the, aspects of, uh, the lack of strategic success that uh, the military's institutions contributed to, to what they did and what they, what they failed to do. So I think, um, I think there's a civil military dynamic to it, but I think there's a couple of reasons why we might not get the military learning that we might think would be beneficial to our, our country out of these out of these very costly endeavors. And Steve, I would just make a brief comment thinking about the international dimension of this, right? Our our opponents aren't focused on uh, military failures so much as or even um, tactical lessons in this case, unlike say the first Gulf War, uh, they're focused on more how the United States continues to intervene around the world, whether it wins or loses or uh, is left with stalemate, 
uh, it still presents instability, uh, uh, destabilizing consequences for them. And for you know, places like China or Russia, there's uh, the further fear of not just uh, instability in Russia's case in their um, soft underbelly, thanks to uh, proximity to Afghanistan, but the, the fear of um, the US not learning its lesson um, and now another American president who wants to uh, promote values and may be at risk uh, in the future of continuing this exercise. And they see um, the promotion of um, using force to, to spread democracy as a direct threat uh, to their regime in pursuit of regime change. So the, the perspective from outside is really quite different um, and um, not focused on the civil military perspective as we see it. Dick, did you want to weigh in or should we move back? Oh, to the why don't we take the rest of the questions? If there's time left at 11.45, I'll uh, say a word on something related. Well, I, th there's about 20 minutes left, but I think I'm going to take Chair's prerogative to collect the questions. So I'm going to, the, the next one in the queue was through the chat from Arturo Sotomayor. I'll read that. And then I'll go through the, the questioners who are now in the queue. They should all ask their question and then I'll let the panel cherry pick what they would like to respond to. Uh, so Arturo Sotomayor asks, I wonder if the panelists could reflect on how bets also shaped our understanding about civil military relations in the developing world. I know his empirical and theoretical insights influenced many scholars of the so-called third world, including Alfred Stepan, uh, Pai in Berlin and others. Um, uh, thank you for organizing this panel. So let me uh, then go to uh, James Paisley, uh, after which I'll go to Theo Philonopoulos, Peter Clement, uh, Jack Snyder, uh, and then we'll, we'll open to the panel for responses. Thank you, Professor Biddle. I had a question regarding uh, the the generational shift as a driver in change towards civil relations. Um, I'm one of the more recent people to take uh, WPS. I took it in the fall of 2019, uh, right before the pandemic hit. Um, and I remember growing up in the shadow of 9-11 and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, that hero worship of the military was the name of the game and you do not question or blame the military. And maybe this was just my experience coming from a military family. Um, but as we've gotten older, one of the things I've noticed is that the, the questions about, well, we need to question the role that happened here. And I was wondering if uh, the panelists could comment on, on just how generational shift as a driver towards the future of civil relations, particularly as policymakers shift out and new ones come in. Um, I'm thinking in, in my mind, uh, Congresswoman Alyssa Slotkin, for example. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, Theo. Hi there. Uh, I'm a PhD student uh, at Columbia of uh, uh, Professor Betts. Um, I, the finding from soldiers and statesmen in Cold War crises has remained remarkably uh, solid uh, throughout even the decades after that it was first written. Um, that is the claim that that military advisors will be, are no more eager, in fact, much more reluctant to initiate interventions, but will uh, be far more likely to uh, advocate for escalation in ongoing conflicts. Um, I'm curious about um, two interrelated issues. One is um, this question about growing opposition for escalation among lower ranked officers in wars that are currently ongoing in Afghanistan and Iraq, how that affects the finding and whether or not we expect to see those individuals as they move up the ranks um, uh, to start shifting that dynamic. And uh, how much of this has been scrambled by the appointments of recently retired military officers into roles that are either traditionally or legally civilian ones, you know, Secretary of Defense with uh, uh, James Mattis and Lloyd Austin, uh, uh, the National Security Advisor in the case of H.R. Uh, McMaster, et cetera. Uh, Peter Clement. Thanks, uh, Steve. Uh, I wanted to pick up actually on a point that you made, Steve, in terms of examining the events of January 6th. So my question is this, do you believe it would be helpful for there to be a commission 
on the model of the 9-11 commission to actually research, interview everybody and come out with the facts as it were about what exactly transpired and specifically the roles that were played uh, at Department of Defense, the National Guard, the local police, and I would argue the Attorney General. And whether you think whatever those findings are, is that going to help our situation in America or is it going to make it worse? Jack Snyder? I have a question about the soldier and the authoritarian state, which arose uh, last week when one of my undergraduates wanted to write a paper using Jessica Week's scheme about the difference between single party machine regimes and personalistic dictatorships as applied to Mao and Xi Jinping. And I said, uh, the point of view was that they are now personalistic dictatorships. And I said, wait a second, let's check with Jessica and see what she says about Xi Jinping. And her response uh, was, well, you could make the case for personalistic, but he's also presiding over a bureaucratized, rationalized machine that has career patterns and networks that are machine-like. So uh, she said, you should write your paper twice once assuming it's personalist and once assuming it's uh, the, the machine politics and then talk about what difference it makes. But it occurs to me that there's another way to think about this that uh, you know, one of the big questions um, for both kinds of authoritarian regime is the succession crisis which the, the perfect machine politics situation has a built-in way to solve this, whereas personalism doesn't. Uh, so if Xi Jinping is a personalist leader, but he's presiding over a machine politics system, does the succession crisis look different for him than it does say for a, a Mobutu? And uh, what about also the Soviet Union, where the military stayed out of the succession crises and behaved like machine politics. So that's what I'm thinking about. Okay, and last but not least, Jonathan Panter. Good morning, I'm uh, one of Professor Betz's advisees. <clears throat> the panelists have spoken quite eloquently about what we might call politicization of the military from above, um, that being the, the party in power, um, you know, in, in our case, Republican or Democrat, and to the extent to which they um, uh, capture senior officers uh, for their agenda and what the American public feels about this. I was wondering if they might as well comment on politicization from below, uh, that is to say recent trends of uh, greater atomization and fractionalization of the American polity of the American public, those who serve in the military, bring their ideas with them as they enter. Uh, in my circles, one of the recent concerns to this effect has been uh, the Chief of Naval Operations recently released uh, reading list, which includes a number of titles that have to do with uh, racial and gender politics. Um, and one of the, the principles uh, that has thus far undermined the military and perhaps kept it a little isolated or a little um, less politicized than the American polity is the notion of uniformity. Um, but as a greater part of uh, the uh, American, uh, you know, uh, rhetoric in American politics has to deal with ever greater uh, encouraging people to mobilize and identify on smaller and smaller identities rather than seeing themselves as part of a uniform polity. Uh, whether that might uh, create some challenges for the military going forward, both either in its operations or in its, its relationship with the greater American public. Thank you. Okay, so the panel has uh, 13 minutes collectively to respond to those questions. I would encourage you to uh, choose the ones you find most congenial uh, and give us the benefit of your thoughts. So. Uh, privilege of first response, of course, we'll, we'll go to Dick and then to our colleagues. Uh, 
Arturo Sotomayor was uh, uh, the question of the relevance of my work to uh, non-American, especially what we used to call third world uh, societies and militaries. And uh, this relates to uh, the actual content of my first book, Soldier Statesman in Cold War Crises, and what we've been talking about today. Uh, and that is the difference between uh, the issues of civil military relations in domestic politics and in strategic and operational effectiveness in war. Uh, <clears throat> when I first wrote uh, the book in the mid-1970s, there was no hero worship of the military and civilian society uh, comparable to what uh, James Paisley suggested was uh, the norm in recent times. Uh, and I was in a way pushing back against the stereotypes common among intellectuals and in the circles we travel in. Uh, and the, the main argument of the book about uh, military, especially uh, the army and ground forces being uh, less enthusiastic about the use of force before it's undertaken than uh, uh, popular images uh, assumed. Uh, within a few years, actually, that was no longer a surprising conclusion because the Reagan administration uh, brought out the difference between uh, military advice and the uh, pro-intervention views of uh, uh, certain civilian politicians. Uh, but uh, this relates to, uh, as, as I said, the, the difference between issues of civil military relations and domestic politics and in strategic effectiveness. In recent years, uh, a lot of the literature on civil military relations has focused on the latter and uh, especially critiques of Samuel Huntington uh, and much less attention to the questions of domestic politics and the traditional fears of politicization of military within domestic politics. But that's coming back now as is clear from all of the discussion this morning, which has been uh, mostly about uh, the domestic political dimension um, so, uh, I think, uh, the, the issues are complicated and, uh, the reason I, I started, uh, responding to Arturo was that I don't think there's a very clear transferability of the sorts of conclusions I came to in, in that first book to, uh, other societies, especially poor countries. Uh, in large part because of the difference in domestic political institutions. Uh, but uh, the, the difference between norms of civil military relations that might be most arguable for improving strategic and operational effectiveness uh, may be different from those uh, most uh, oriented towards uh, avoiding domestic politicization in the military. And for those interested in a lot of the recent debates, uh, you know, I could offline uh, get into uh, why I think uh, that lies behind some of the dissatisfaction with Huntington's arguments in the original 1957 book. Okay, with that, I'll, I'll go to our panel in reverse order for brief commentary so that we conclude by 11.45. Uh, so, Cynthia. Thanks. Um, so, in the interest of time, I'll focus on Jack's question uh, and um, with the caveat that he re-asked it uh, of Tom Christensen later this afternoon, uh, our true China specialist. But I have thought about it in exactly those terms. And so I think it's a great question. And um, basically, I would just offer two thoughts uh, to be continued sometime when we can actually have lunch together. Uh, one is that we, I, I think, and I think this was part of uh, the effort of my remarks, that we should try and separate more uh, the problem of succession crises from the kinds of uh, issues that I was focusing on about um, military doctrine and military operations. When we look at civil military relations 
in these personalist dictatorships like uh, Russia and China, uh, and also in their historical past. Because when we look at the succession crisis, what's actually interesting, uh, taking the Soviet case, as I mentioned, and as you know well, uh, the, the military was not the key problem. Uh, and what's so striking was not only was it sort of brought in by Soviet leaders uh, like Khrushchev, uh, didn't instigate coups, but at the end of the collapse of the Soviet Union, the military was utterly un incapable and unwilling to go through with the coup to rescue the regime, which is, you know, must have had a huge shock uh, on China. And we know they did several studies of, uh, of you know, what not to do wrong, uh, learning from the Soviet mistakes. But I mean, that is an extraordinary development. And I think it, it goes to some of my concerns about this trade-offs in um, um, political leaders uh, paying attention so heavily to um, coup proofing as opposed to combat effectiveness. And I think we need to uh, introduce more nuances there. On the doctrine and operations side, conversely, I, th I think we don't spend enough attention looking at how uh, military organizations are comparable in their interests, in their, as you know, Jack, better than many people, their focus on uh, offensive solutions, uh, and how little political leaders understand this, and how many mistakes they can get themselves into, notably on the nuclear front. So I would suggest that your student write two different papers, one on political succession and one on military doctrine and operations and listen carefully to what our um, uh, very smart colleagues will say, hopefully about these things in the afternoon session. Thanks. Yes, most students in my experience prefer writing two papers to one. Um, Suzanne. Yeah, thank you. I, I'll just say, uh, I know we're really tight on time. I just wanna say a, a word about Jonathan Painter's question because I think it's, um, it really brings out what I think is a really critical dilemma, dilemma for the military right now this idea that uh, there's an increasing increasing dynamics that suggest the identification with smaller and smaller groups. And of course, it's a, it's a value to the military uh, to have a climate that's completely characterized by trust uh, in which uh, there is um, an emphasis on diversity and inclusion such that uh, every member of the military feels that they're a valued member of the team. To me, what the interesting challenge that we're that we face right now in terms of the military's institution uh, efforts to do this is that can the military foster uh, the kinds of training, the kinds of culture, the kinds of policies that it perceives will advance diversity and inclusion without being seen to be acting in accordance with the preferences of one party over the other. Uh, there was an executive order in the latter stages of the Trump administration that shaped what federal uh, departments and agencies could do in terms of their training on these questions. And uh, that, that was really very highly problematic. Uh, it's rescinded now, um, but so that, that would be where I would leave it. I would say that the military for its functional reasons absolutely needs to foster uh, diversity and respect, uh, diversity and inclusion and environment where everybody's treated with dignity and respect. Can the military's efforts to advance this within its own organizations occur without being pointed to by some partisan political actors as being representative of partisan behavior. Thank you. Peter, you get the last word. Right, and I'll, I'll focus then on the other three questions, except I will say, Jack, I loved Jessica's suggestion. I can't wait for the next student to come up and ask me a tough question. I'll say, that's a great question, write two papers uh, to answer it. Uh, I really hope I get a chance to do that soon. But Theo, in answer to your, your question, um, I'd remind you that Dick's uh, finding was on average a pattern and that Dick was scrupulous about all the exceptions. Uh, and you know, it was later slop, sloppier scholars like me who turned it into broader patterns that you could extrapolate over uh, you know, in numerical fashion that lost all of the nuance of Dick's original argument. Um, so I think Dick would not be surprised by the exceptions and would not have trouble with any of the exceptions that you flagged. Um, I think the one that is, uh, is easier to dismiss, of course, would be the, the one-offs of a Mattis or an H.R. McMaster. Those are, the, those are exceptions that fit the rule 
uh, is my guess is how Dick would answer it. For the other one, what you'd have to distinguish, the lower ranking ones, you'd have to distinguish between early, mid and late in the escalation and your own work, you know, is looking at, at crisis points uh, in that process. But a reluctance to escalate in Afghanistan late, 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 late in the conflict is a very different dynamic than what Dick was looking at in his book, which is going in, what is the kind of way we want to deal with this? So, you know, at, at year 20, I think folks can be allowed to have a slightly different perspective and the, and the pattern might be different. Um, but then your dissertation uh, will resolve these matters for us. Uh, Peter, your suggestion, of course, uh, we need, uh, we would benefit from a careful look at all of this. Uh, I actually called for a commission before January 6th that said, let's just park the issue of where there are electoral ir irregularities, park that one in a blue ribbon commission as well and give Republicans an exit ramp out of the, you know, the limb on which they had climbed. Uh, but now after the, the horrible events of January 6th, we need that. I think though the civil mill dimension will, will not reveal a lot of scandal and it will reveal some of the stuff that Dick Betts's own work on surprise attack would tell us, which is that the military were overcorrecting and over postured to correct for a different problem that they had been primed to expect, primed by people like me, but then primed by more senior people like all the sect Fs, retired sect Fs who wrote a paper two day, or an op-ed two days before January 6th saying, whatever you do, don't be leaning forward in the saddle uh, to deploy troops. So <laughs> they were not leaning forward in the saddle. and. But a, a good commission would un, un, reveal all of this, and uh, I do think it would be in our nation's interest. Cl finishing up with Jonathan, um, politicization from below. Absolutely, uh, this is part of part of the story. The, you, the American military. This is where we need more Stanowitz uh, to fill out our understanding, because the military can never be completely isolated from the cultural currents. Over time, it reflects the culture of. Uh, of American society over time. Uh, and so what, uh, th this is why you need excellent leaders like Suzanne and, and the folks she's training to be able to forge militarily effective uh, units out of very different raw material that's coming over time. Uh, and so I, I do think that that's gonna be a, a challenge. I don't think it's an insurmountable challenge, however, it does make me uh, reconsider though another aspect of Huntington, which I spent most of my career criticizing, which is uh, his notion of subjective control. And Dick mentioned that uh, briefly in his remarks too. And I'm wondering if uh, there might be more to that, to Sam's insight than I was gave him credit for in my earlier work. Uh, as, uh, as we reflect with a much more faction-based American population, and the, the negative impact that might have on the military. That's a warning, that, that, that's something that Sam worried about a lot. And so to be able to talk about that, uh, I, alas, we can't talk about it with Sam, but to be able to bounce these ideas off of, with Dick Betts, uh, that would be a tremendous fun for me, it would take me back to graduate school. And so Dick, I look forward to a chance to do that again with you sometime face to face and not socially distanced. And with that, I'll close. Well, characteristic of a good panel and reflective of Dick's scholarship is more ideas and more interest than we have time. Uh, please join me in thanking our panel and thanking Dick and in thanking our excellent questioners for stimulating ideas and a uh, perceptive conversation. I hope uh, we'll take a break now. I hope you'll all come back and join us at 12 noon for our next panel on intelligence and decision makers. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you. Thank you for a great panel. We'll see you in 15 minutes. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank okay, you. Bye-bye. I will begin. So welcome back, everyone. Uh, this is the second panel of the day on intelligence and decision makers, um, celebrating the scholarly contribution to the field of intelligence. Um, and with us, it's a stellar uh, panel. Um, we have um, our own uh, professor, um, Robert Jervis, who I always say, I mean, requires no introduction uh, to uh, audience in international relations, especially this audience. 
Uh, but I will just mention, mention briefly, he's the Adlai Stevenson Professor of International Politics at Columbia University. Um, he's many, many books, um, uh, again, <laughs> requiring our introduction, that The Logic of Images, Perception and Misperception, um, Why Intelligence Fails, and his most recent book uh, is uh, Chaos in the Liberal Order with Frank uh, Gavin, Joshua Rovner, and Diane, uh, Diane LaBrosse from Columbia University Press 2018. And it's a real honor and privilege to have Jervis with us uh, to discuss uh, Dick's work and contribution in this, especially in this, uh, uh, in this field of study of intelligence. We also have with us um, uh, Dr. Paul Pilar. Uh, he's a non-resident senior fellow at the Center for Security Studies uh, in the Edmund Walsh School of Foreign Service and Georgetown University, and a fellow of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. He retired in 2005 from a 28-year 20, uh, career in the US intelligence community, uh, in which he, his last position was National, National Intelligence Officer for the Near East and South Asia. Uh, Dr. Pilar wrote um, uh, several books that are relevant to today's discussion. Among them are uh, Terrorism and U.S. Foreign Policy and Intelligence and U.S. Uh, pol foreign Policy, Iraq 9-11 and Misguided Reform. Uh, we're also fortunate to have with us uh, James uh, Wirtz, uh, who joined the Naval Postgraduate School in 1990 as a professor for the Department of National S uh, Security Affairs. He served as a chair of the National Security Affairs Department from January 2000 to 2005, and is the Dean of the School of International Graduate Studies uh, from 2008 to 2020. Um, he also is uh, um, uh, a scholar of intelligence with many, uh, uh, many interesting and, um, I mean, um, um, significant publication in this, in this, um, in this field of study, is the author of many things, of many uh, books and articles of understanding intelligence failure, warning, response, and deterrence uh, from 2007, and the Tet Offensive, intelligence failures and war uh, uh, that first came out in 1991. Um, last but definitely not least, we have our own uh, uh, Peter Clement, um, who is a dear colleague of us at SIPA. He's a senior research fellow and an adjunct professor at Columbia University. Um, and in 2018, he retired from the CIA where he held several senior analytical and management positions, most recently as deputy assistant director of CIA for Europe and Eurasia. And prior position included eight years as deputy director for intelligence for analytical programs and director of the office of Russian Eurasian analysis. Um, um, and I will just add that um, this is a uh, especially important panel for me, not just because I myself am a scholar of intelligence, and as I said at the beginning, um, uh, drew a lot of inspiration from, uh, from uh, uh, Dick Betts' uh, publication, analysis, research, and mentorship, and I am very excited to have, um, uh, to have all these terrific guests with us today and to have Dick with us today um, to come in and ask him some questions as well. Uh, and without further ado, I will turn it over to, uh, to Bob Jervis uh, to say a few words in this special occasion, also about the scholarship, obviously, and intelligence, but even an invitation to go uh, and, and just um, whatever you feel like uh, talking about, Bob, you've earned it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Karen. I really enjoyed the morning session and hope we can keep up the good work. Um, especially appropriate a panel, considering that my knowledge of intelligence hardly grows out of <clears throat> Dick's, but Dick and um, Jim Wirtz and I, along with Mel Leffler from University of Virginia's history department um, did the postmortem for CIA on the Iraq 
WMD intelligence failure. And in that, I worked uh, with Peter, who at that point was in CIA in the uh, seventh floor in the Directorate of Intelligence, working on what lessons could be extracted. And Paul, of course, was uh, our experimental subject. <laughs> No, as one of the, not the lead NIO on the NIE, but as one of them and one of the people um, Dick and Jim and I spent a long time with trying to unravel what had happened and his assistance, both his analysis and his, without any defensiveness, discussion was really invaluable. So I'm really glad to be with the group. I want to just talk about uh, three of Dick's contributions to the study of intelligence that I think are still extremely important. And the third one of which I think partly guided uh, our report or was uh, vindicated by it. The first is a continuing problem. It's, it can never be solved, I think, uh, because it's an impossible trade-off that Dick has discussed very well in how close to policymakers intelligence should get. And one of the chapters of his book on enemies of intelligence deals with this as the uh, Kentian versus Gatesian approach. Kent for uh, Sherman Kent, the I think legitimately considered father of American estimate of intelligence, set up a lot of the CIA intelligence uh, estimate of apparatus, headed the board of estimates that wrote the NIEs for a number of years. And he was adamant that intelligence had to be divorced from policy. Um, a little bit like um, former Vice President Pence not ever having a, being out in the same room with a, a woman who wasn't his wife, unless there were multiple chaperones, because the temptation could be too great. That is the temptation to meddle in policy uh, or to skew your analysis toward what the policymakers wanted to hear. Um, Gates, I mean, to me, I think we agree. Well, I would say, and I think Dick agrees, that Kent is right that the intelligence has to be willing to bring bad news. And analyze the adversaries in the world as they think the evidence and relevant theories lead them, even if that's something that um, makes the decision maker's life uh, more difficult. But uh, it also uh, runs the danger of irrelevance. If you're totally in the government equivalent of the ivory tower, and it is a makes, I think, and I wonder if Paul agrees, I think it makes an enormous difference that the CIA and ODNI are, what is it, 10 miles from the seat of power, that is downtown. They're not in Washington, and the people who work there rarely live in Washington, that is in the district. Uh, and the problem is that if you're totally divorced from how, what the decision maker is thinking about, what she's concerned with, what she thinks the relevant options are, your papers may be brilliant, but they're not apt to respond to what the decision maker needs. And so Bob Gates 
as when he became deputy director and director, <coughs> said, we have to get close to the decision maker because to serve them, we, get, we have to know their concerns. What are they thinking about? How are they thinking? Now, how is this fitting in? And we have rotations downtown, often to the NFC, but to other um, um, agencies as well, because of course the IC, although the president is the first customer, there are lots and lots of other customers. And that that knowledge can make intelligence more relevant and more helpful and better without sacrificing its integrity. Well, that's very hard. And I don't think, and I don't think that maybe you, uh, Ms. Redham thinks there is a, an answer that neither pure model works and somewhat we may move back and forth like a pendulum, but being aware of the dilemma is central. And I think thanks to Dick's work, we understand that, you know, it's not gonna be an either or. The second, which is somewhat related and also relevant on expertise in general and domestic as well as foreign policy is that um, the experts in these areas are, are, are often going to be wrong. And that's one of the main lessons of the surprise attack. <laughs> yes, we can locate a number of problems and we think we can make things better. And the, you know, Dick and his work has done that and the panel I was on made strenuous efforts not only to say what was wrong, but to be constructive. And I'll just digress for a minute. Um, I think, and I don't be, I think we did a good job, um, better than some, maybe not all of CIA's internal analysis, but anyway. But did it do much good? I'm not as sure of that because we were commissioned by John McLaughlin and George Tennant, who I'd known through my work on the declassification uh, review committee. And I think, you know, they were very open to learning and very dedicated to improving analysis. Well, unfortunately, you know, one of the lessons of intelligence is a paper that's 10 minutes late uh, is no good at all. Well, we were pretty quick for a postmortem. It was a couple of months, but you know, we did have to read quite a bit and interview and write. By the time we turned in our product, uh, Porter Goss was director and Dusty Fogo uh, was the deputy director. Dusty was distinguished by being the highest ranking member of CIA to go to jail, um, but just on embezzlement, wasn't even on anything interesting. Anyway, um, when I debriefed uh, Dusty at a lunch he'd set up in the small, small director's dining room, there were about six of us and I knew things were going to be, yeah, we went around the table and he introduced, and then he introduced somebody, I think it was the director of administration, who was a, a very able woman, and he said, uh, well, and she's here because we needed another woman. And whoops. Then we talked about the problem of, uh, admit, uh, of analysts not knowing enough about sources, which was a big problem in the Iraq NIE in which the agency had taken measures to improve and which the later modernization that George Tennant did, uh, Peter was a major part of and so it worked of bringing analysts and 
uh, operators in the same office uh, was a big step forward. Anyway, so uh, I mentioned this a problem. Dusty said, yes, it was a problem. We've solved it. I said, <clears throat> well, I've just spent two hours with the analysts talking about what they thought of our report, what reforms have been made, and they say they don't know enough about the sources. And Dusty say, say we've solved it. I, friend, at that point, I felt I should just enjoy the food because we were not going to have a very productive conversation. Anyway, okay. That the problem, I think Dick's absolutely right. Even with all the improvements, and I think CIA and the IC has improved, we can talk about what's wrong, but things are left. I've sent my memo to the uh, director of the national intelligence and the deputy CIA director 10 days ago. There are improvements to be made, but there are made improvements. But no matter how good you are, you're often going to be wrong. And the problem that sets up is on the one hand, good decision makers have to understand the uncertainties. Um, on a plane, on a, a former head of the NIC, uh, come anyway, the, NIC, the China guy who's now at Stanford, uh, had a, a book on intelligence called Redu Reducing Uncertainty. No, that isn't the job of the intelligence. It's to you know, accurately portray the uncertainty they feel around their estimates. Yes, at the best, they can reduce it. But sometimes I have to say, hey, let me tell you, boss, two months ago, we were certain of X. Now we tell you, no, no, no. There are two other possibilities you have to consider. Your boss is, or the consumer is not likely to be happy. But that is one of the major jobs, saying where the uncertainties are, what the consumer has to think about. Um, the problem is, of course, if the, uh, if the agencies stress too much uncertainty, the obvious reply is, go away. <laughs> I don't need you. You know, I can know it's an uncertain world. Uh, you're not helping me. So how we manage that, I think, is the second one, the second major uh, contributions you get. The third, uh, in a way, applies, and that one, by the way, I think applies completely to expertise on COVID. How much should Fauci have said at the beginning? You know, we don't understand this disease. Uh, masks, common sense says masks help. So please wear them. Can I prove it to you? No, but just do it. I mean, do that would have been the more intellectually honest thing. Would it have been helped to say that? I'm not at all sure that uh, sometimes Trump is right that what he called honest hyperbole doesn't really apply to what he did, but is better. So you have those, uh, that set of problems. See, it applies domestically. Today in the morning in the Times, there's a small squib about uh, in Biden's press conference, what he said that was wrong. One thing he, he said that 80% or 83% of the benefit of the um, Trump tax cuts went to the top 1%. I thought that was correct. I thought Times, I assume, right, said no, that was the estimate. Later analyses says, that it's about 25% went to the top 1%. That's an enormous error. Uh, now, I assume when they gave the estimate, they didn't put error bars or you know uncertainties uh, 
uh, on that. And should they have? Well, probably so. Anyway, you know, we have, so this problem extends to domestic. The third contribution, something that extends to social science, it deals with the interaction of social science and intelligence. And that is uh, twofold. That, this, that intelligence analysts, although by inclination and training, uh, are very much uh, oriented to looking to reports from the field, if you will, the facts, SIGINT intercepts, human intelligence, somewhat open sources, and to be, if you will, more inductive than deductive to go back to um, Peter Fever's excellent discussion this morning. That really, like most of us, that's not entirely what they're doing. They are very much influenced by the expectations about what's normal and what's likely to happen in this case. So our panel said, and, and the problem is those, you know, those are generalizations that often backed by social science. They're often correct generalizations and a whole lot of the time, but when they don't hold in a particular instance, intelligence is very likely to be surprised. And uh, I think that's, you know, the root, not the only the root cause of the Iraq WMD failure. That it uh, was w totally plausible that Saddam had active WMD program. Why else would he be uh, throwing out the inspectors not cooperating, suffering enormous economic pain, and running the risk that his high risk, his country would be invaded, and he would be severely punished. Um, so it was obvious he had WMD. And I think that mindset was very strong and very not unreasonable. That's the generalization. It's going to be right most of the time wasn't right here. And by the way, you know, we have some arguments on what Saddam was thinking. And many of you, some of you, Claudia knows that, uh, the, you know, the Delphi report, the work that Woods and his colleagues did from the documents gives one explanation, but there's even revisionism on that. Uh, it's very interesting and that will be, it's coming out. So I just say we, do, even today, we don't understand, we don't have a consensus on what Saddam was thinking. So I just want to wrap up and say that Dick's point that the, uh, then is that many people think intelligence sort of ignores social science. No, they're very aware of the generalizations. That, you know, we see in the world and when those turn out to be wrong, it isn't the, uh, the intelligence necessarily bad social scientists, but that uh, things that break with strong generalizations and expectations are very hard to cope with. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. All right, uh, next we have uh, uh, Paul Pilar. Thanks, Karen. Uh, it's a real pleasure to, uh, to join this event. Uh, Dick Betts has certainly contributed at least as much as anyone else who has spent a career in academia in explaining realistically the limits of what is possible in intelligence. And among his uh, many services in that regard, I would single out above all uh, his analysis of why intelligence failures, or I might add what are perceived as failures, are inevitable. You know, any adequate explanation for such failures can never be simple. There is no single key to either understanding a single failure 
or what can be done to prevent recurrences. But Dick uh, helped all of us to organize our thoughts about this with his concept of enemies of intelligence as he laid it out in his book uh, with the same title. And as you may recall, if you've seen the book, uh, this includes, first of all, outside enemies, which are the uh, you know, foreign adversaries, states and groups. And I think you know, most people have no trouble realizing that that is an enemy uh, of intelligence who is trying to uh, foil our successes. But I don't think it gets fully appreciated by most what the implications are for success and failure. When you have each side, ours and the adversary, each trying to keep its own secrets from being revealed to the other while each trying to uncover the other secrets, there's no particular reason to assume that our side is always going to win that contest, uh, especially when we play it against countries that have more closed societies than our own. Then the second category of enemies is the one that includes all what has become so familiar in all the ex post facto recriminations after failures, things like uh, incompetent officials and stodgy bureaucracies that are resistant to change and the Washington perennial favorite, you know, failure of different parts of the government to communicate with each other. These can indeed be problems, but as Dick pointed out in the book, uh, despite all this attention, this is actually usually less of a factor than the third set of enemies, which he called inherent enemies. And as he put it, and I quote, you know, those include uh, a collection of mental limitations, dilemmas, contradictory imperatives, paradoxical interactions and trade-offs in the intelligence process itself that often block proper assessments and judgment and make it difficult to fix one source of failure without creating another, unquote. And I might just give an example of the kind of trade-off involved from my own experience. This goes back to when I was uh, heading uh, analysis in the counter terror center at CIA. And this was one real failure that didn't get outside attention, but boy, it was a failure. I'm thinking of the Om Shinrikyo attack in Japan in 1995, the sarin gas attack against uh, the subway. This was a phenomenon that we in the counter terrorist community missed. I mean, we really missed it. And, and the consequences for the United States, you know, could have been much larger given what Om Shinrikyo was all about and what their ideology involved. Um, but it, you know, there were other parts of the intelligence community, such as the, um, uh, the offices in CIA that followed political and social events in Japan that were very familiar with Aum Shinrikyo. It was a big organization. And where we should have and could have done better is to have more of a dialogue with those regional analysts uh, to give the people in the counter-terrorist community more of a sense of you know, what, this, what this group was, was up to. Well, fast forward a few years uh, to after 9-11, and then the 9-11 Commission came up with its plan for a national counter-terrorism center, which was in fact established by Congress. And the main rationale of that was to you know, reduce the bureaucratic and physical distance between people like CIA analysts and FBI officers so that you have more of that interagency uh, communication that supposedly was deficient before 9-11. But here's the trade-off. Uh, by you know, reducing the, the distance in NCTC between some of these uh, people from CIA, FBI, and other agencies, you've increased the physical and bureaucratic distance between those people working on counterterrorism and those like the analysts following you know, country-specific social phenomena like Aum Shinrikyo in places like CIA or the FBI field offices. Uh, that's the kind of trade-off that, that there's, there's no perfect way to cut the pie that uh, eliminates either kind of uh, potential uh, shortfall in communication. The awful truth Dick has written is that the best of intelligence systems will have big failures, but there's still a very strong resistance out in the public and among our political sphere to accept that truth. Ask an American politician or those who consider themselves part of an informed public as to why we in the United States seem to have had this unending string of intelligence failures, sometimes big ones that cause an uproar. And after the uproar, a stated determination to fix the problem so it doesn't happen again, but then 
years go by and we have another such problem. Why is this? Well, I think most of the answers you get would take at least one of three forms. One is the idea that the US government simply has not found the right formula for change. That's of course a favorite of anyone who is touting his or her own uh, proposed uh, reform. Yet the many volumes already devoted to this subject of intelligence failure and reform make it unlikely that any bright new ideas or I might add even dim ideas will emerge. A second popular explanation is that well, reformers have had good ideas in the past, but the political stars have had to be aligned just right in order for things to be uh, implemented. Th this this uh, explanation also is often coupled with the idea of stodgy bureaucracies that are resistant to change. After all, it took uh, a combination of the trauma of 9-11 and an especially aggressive commission that skillfully exploited a sense of public insecurity to bring about legislation establishing a director of national intelligence and, as I just mentioned, the National Counterterrorism Center back in 2004, even though the DNI idea had been floating around for, for decades. But this explanation overlooks the strong bias toward change and reform among managers inside the intelligence community. Uh, ambitious managers there, just like in any other business, uh, make their careers and make their mark, not just by sitting on the status quo, but by championing what they can describe as new initiatives or strategic redirections. And in fact, the dominant pattern inside US intelligence agencies has been one not of stasis, but of almost constant revision, even to the point of disruption. And you can just look at the history of say, wiring diagrams and agencies like DIA or CIA to see what I'm talking about. A third common claim is that the challenges faced by the intelligence agencies have changed so dramatically that solutions that were forged back during the Cold War are simply obsolete. But the intelligence agencies were addressing the so-called new issues of terrorism and unconventional weapons proliferation while the Cold War was still raging. It's certainly true that threats like terrorism have evolved, but they haven't change nearly as much as the public believes. The shock of the 9-11 attacks in particular was so profound that many Americans mistakenly assume that they must have come from a new danger that no one, including their own government, had recognized or understood. More valid explanations for this seemingly endless cycle of failure and reform would be the following. First, the American public consistently believes that the intelligence community's record is worse than it actually is. In the intelligence business, failures make headlines while successes generally remain secret. Moreover, failures also prompt inquiries, the nature of which is to devise solutions to problems, regardless of whether they are soluble and to shift blame in order to avoid political landmines. When's the last time did you hear of a commission established on some topic that comes back with a report that's saying, well, we've looked into this and there really isn't much of anything that's worthwhile doing uh, as, a, as a reform or a remedy. That never happens. Moreover, uh, retrospective evaluations make events that were cloudy and ambiguous in real time seem blindingly clear in hindsight. And I would say hindsight is the single biggest factor affecting uh, popular perceptions and political treatment of, of intelligence failures. Second, calling for intelligence reform serves certain psychological and political purposes that have nothing to do with the intelligence agency's successes or failures. They remain a fixture of public debates because they satisfy Americans' deeply felt need to attribute bad things to a specific fixable problem and because they reinforce Americans' comforting but naive belief that similar bad things will not happen in the future if a proper solution is found. This is a st distinctly American way of thinking that if we simply put enough smarts to a problem and enough resources and enough determination, we can solve anything, we can do anything. And the third valid explanation for the seemingly endless cycle of intelligence failures is what Dick has analyzed and explained so well which is that intelligence failures, not just perceived ones, but real ones are inevitable. You know, I particularly like the way Dick has used baseball analogies to make a lot of his points in this regard. And the same analogy can be used uh, in other ways as well. There is a widespread expectation out there uh, that the intelligence 
agencies ought to bat 1,000. But that, of course, will not be achieved or anything close to it in intelligence any more than in baseball, notwithstanding the uh, far greater potential consequences of failure in the intelligence business as opposed to baseball. Now, in real baseball, when a batter strikes out, the team does not immediately lament a batting failure and assemble a commission of inquiry to determine what the cause is and to come up with recommended reforms. Instead, uh, management realizes that a failure for the batter is a success for the pitcher. And going back to that first kind of enemy of intelligence in, in Dick's scheme, that is to say the foreign adversary, uh, we can say that both sides are batting and pitching against each other all the time. And there's no reason anymore in intelligence than in baseball to expect one side or the other to always win that duel. In baseball, a 300 hitter is considered pretty good, even though he's out you know, more than two thirds of the time. Now we want with good reason for most straight line intelligence projections to have a higher average than that. But Dick also has made some very useful points about the warning function, which is a particular kind of intelligence analysis that highlights for the policymaker, not necessarily you know, the most likely thing that will happen, but rather high impact, albeit perhaps low probability contingencies for which the policymaker ought to be prepared. And if a warning or officer's batting average gets closer to 1,000 than to 300, that officer probably is not performing the warning function especially well, but instead is more likely just telling the policymaker what he or she already knows or expects. The importance of this entire topic of understanding intelligence failures and their inevitability, I think, falls in in the form of two sorts of costs of failure to understand those limits. One is the so-called reforms that overlook the trade-offs, that overlook the inherent problems and create at least as many new problems as they ostensibly solve. The other thing is something that Bob Jervis touched on and that is the failure to understand that policy often must necessarily be based on a high degree of uncertainty. Intelligence, uh, should certainly try to reduce uncertainty. That's what Tom Finger was talking about. But there's always going to be uncertainty left. And the goal of the policymaker must be to maximize the benefit to the national interest without knowing which of several different possible contingencies may occur. One of my models of successful policymaking uh, in that regard, and I may be stepping on, on Peter Clement's turf here, is, is how James Baker uh, handle US policy in the Bush 41 administration as it related to the crumbling Soviet Union. And rather than accepting any one analyst's uh, projections as to whether Gorbachev would stay or go or the, the union would uh, remain or would fall apart, he defined uh, the objective of his policy is to get as much advantage from US uh, for the US interest through understandings with Gorbachev was possible, regardless of what might happen the next year or the year after that. And that was entirely the right way to deal with uncertainty. So uh, Dick, congratulations on a truly eminent uh, career that has addressed this topic as well as others. And on behalf of people like Peter and myself, who, although we may speak some of these same truths, and I've certainly tried to write about them, are always prone to have our observations uh, dismissed as the self-interested excuse making from denizens of the deep state. Uh, but coming from you, it's had a lot more credibility. So thank you. Karen, back to you. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, this was terrific. Uh, Jim, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. See all my friends from Columbia and around the world, especially you, Dick. It's always a pleasure, Bob. Uh, you know, I'd like to begin with an anecdote. Uh, a few years back, I was lucky enough to make the shortlist for a job on the National Intelligence Council, and it was the dream job. I was go I was applying for the NIO for the warning job. It's like, wow, this is the job, right? The job of jobs. And there was a panel of four people interviewing me, and they were asking me some really basic questions. And I, after the second or third, I said, hey, hey, guys, 
Now, I'm, I'm worried here. Uh, you do know the answer to these questions. You know, the suave, sophisticated guy I kind of am. But anyway, so we, 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 the, the, the interview proceeds, and they asked me what would be my first task if I got the job. I said, oh, I'd write my letter of resignation. And it would say, uh, you know, I'm really sorry. I missed the signals that were obviously in the pipeline. And, uh, you know, and, and they said, well, do you think you're going to need that letter right away? I said, well, I don't know right away, but sooner or later, I'm going to need it. Now, where did I get these insights from? This is obviously Dick Betts. I'm channeling Dick Betts. Now, I didn't get the job. And later on, I thought, well, maybe they didn't read Betts. But those are the two fundamental principles of the study of intelligence failure, right? That there is always going to be information in the pipeline that uh, a skilled analyst with the right mindset, with the right cognitive schema could have put together to give that warning. Uh, the other idea is that intelligence failures are inevitable. And those, those, those two ideas really have formed the study of intelligence uh, studies uh, since Dick sort of uh, put them into print and brought them forward. Now, Dick wasn't the first person to talk about the signals in the pipeline. If you know anything about the, um, the, the postmortems that were done after Pearl Harbor, the penultimate uh, big congressional postmortem that concluded in 45 uh, actually did say, hey, it gave the impression there was a lot of information in this pipeline and only dereliction of duty or sheer incompetence could explain why these analysts didn't get it right. Wolstetter came along a few years later and said, no, that's not really right because there's there's a lot of noise in that with, mixed in with those signals, so it's not as easy as it looks. But I, I do believe that most people who study intelligence do accept the notion that there is information in the pipeline, right? That it, it is always within the realm of possibility of getting this right. A few exceptions emerged over the years. One was Elie, Elie Levitt a little earlier on, about 1990, and he came back and said, you know, when you look at Pearl Harbor, there really isn't anything there that would give you an indication of what would happen in terms of those signals. But if you look at the history, it, it's, just, it's just sort of incredible. Uh, you know, the Navy had gained Pearl Harbor strikes, uh, literally with aircraft coming in about five years earlier. Uh, the the uh, Kimmel was the uh, Navy commander at the time of Pearl Harbor. Well, his predecessor was relieved of command because he complained to the Roosevelt administration about the dangers the Navy faced by moving the fleet to Pearl Harbor. So he was actually fired for writing this nasty letter to Roosevelt. So the idea that, that there was a vulnerability there uh, was really not all that far-fetched in, in the 1940, 1941. So you would think they would be attuned uh, to indications that something was afoot and that might be vulnerable, but in fact, it didn't happen. A more recent uh, critique is my colleague, Eric Dahl, who looks at it and says, well, these signals actually have to be actionable, that they actually have to convey some notion of time, place, who, what, where. You need to actually give policymakers something they can act on. Vague, diffuse warnings that something bad is about to happen is, are never going to be acted upon. You really need to be very specific, almost to the point where the obvious solution is apparent to the policymaker. Well, this is pretty far, I, I think this is pretty far-fetched, right? This is not really realistic. It can occur on occasion, but it's not all that realistic. So I think in that sense, uh, you know, Dick's, um, the idea that this idea is embedded in Dick's work is really valid and does form the basis of uh, the study of intelligence failure, surprise, and warning to this day, that it is within the realm of possibility. Those signals are embedded in the data stream. You've just got to pick them out. Now, are surpri is surprise inevitable? And that, that's a good, that's, uh, that's a very good uh, point. And it does also in influence the study of intelligence and intelligence failure. But I, I think for a long time, I misinterpreted that. What Dick wasn't saying is that it's inevitable that you will always get it wrong, right? But that sooner or later, you will get it wrong. And you, you will get it wrong because you can never really fix the problem. Um, you fix one problem, you create others, and since the future is unclear, the kinds of threats you're going to face are unclear, you can, it's, it's only luck where you're going to get it right. So there are always, you know, the world is constantly changing. Any solution can be overtaken by events. It'll do so in ways that are, you know, you might not be aware of. So in that sense, uh, intelligence failures are inevitable because you can never quite fully anticipate the future, fix the problems in advance, and get it right. Um, now, a few years later, I took this on 
uh, in a fetch ref for Michael Hanel where I generated a theory of surprise because I really want to take a shot at that in the sense that is there anything we can do to reduce the opportunity for failure? And I remember as Dick was reading that chapter, one of the comments he wrote was, I know what you're trying to do and I support it, right? Uh, but what is it possible to inoculate analysts? Is it possible to inoculate uh, policymakers by surprise? And in this theory, I identified a few developments that are really indicators, they're bureaucratic indicators of something bad is about to happen. Uh, one is their strange stories begin to emerge uh, through the intelligence pipeline, through the intelligence and analysts or through you know, analysts in general, that people begin to report uh, strange developments, things that don't make sense, the opponent's about to do something crazy. I thought along those lines, that was like the last clear indicator you might have that you're about to suffer a failure of surprise. Um, with this sort of thing, uh, it might be more possible to head off um, uh, intelligence failures in the future. But I also think that Dick is absolutely right. The, uh, and uh, Paul Pillar made the point very better than I could, is that the constant reorganization in the aftermath of intelligence failure really is counterproductive. Uh, if you listen very, very closely to what analysts say after a problem emerges, they really say we need better tradecraft not more or reorganization or re rearranging the deck chairs. Um, so I think those two, that those are incredible contributions to the field of intelligence studies. Uh, I think they still motivate scholars all over the world. They're sort of, they create a paradox of intelligence failure that how can we be surprised uh, if we do the reforms, fix what was wrong last time? How can we be surprised if there's information in the pipeline these paradoxes are really what animates uh, the field of intelligence studies when it comes to surprise and warning failures. Dick, thank you for that contribution. I've used it, I've hung a career on it for many years and I'm sure people after me will do the same. Terrific, thank you. Uh, Peter, off to you. Thank you, Karen. Um, First, let me say it's really a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I have to tell a funny anecdote. There's that old adage about you should be careful what you ask for because you might actually get it. So earlier this week, I contacted Karen and I said, gee, you know, now that I've thought a little bit more about this panel, I really don't think I should be the lead speaker. You've got some serious heavy hitters, well published and famous. Uh, I really should be the last one to kind of follow up. So here I am banning cleanup. And I will confess, I'm like both awed and a little frustrated because everything that Bob said and Paul and Jim are, are so much on the mark and have taken a little bit of the steam out of my comments. Having said that, I still have a few things I think I could contribute helpfully to this discussion. So again, I'm really honored and humbled to be here. I'm a late life newcomer to the Academy. Uh, unlike Paul, I haven't had a chance to write uh, as much, and Paul, I'm in awe of the amount of writing you do all the time. It's always great to see what you have to say. Ditto from my colleague, my other colleagues here. Um, I, the other thing I really like about events like this is I get to actually see, and if we were in person, I would get a chance to meet uh, all these leading voices in the field on all the panels. It's, uh, it's really a great opportunity, and I'm just sad that we can't all be here in person. Um, but the real thing about today's conference is it's especially meaningful to me as I get a chance to thank Dick personally by acknowledging the many ways, probably ways that he has no idea he has contributed to, uh, to help me at various points in my career, both at the agency where I spent a good deal of my life and now these past couple of years here in academe. So I would like to, um, kind of divide up my comments here into what I would call direct and indirect observations about Dick and those contributions. Um, obviously I'm coming here sitting from a very different perch from most of my life and that is as an intelligence practitioner, uh, much like uh, Paul and Jim. So um, my first set of thoughts here are gonna be based on my experience as a career CIA officer both as an analyst uh, and then as a senior manager, which I spent probably the 
the uh, last 15 years of my career on the on the seventh floor. So I've really had a great opportunity to engage with a lot of the things that Dick has contributed to directly uh, to the business of analysis at the agency. So let me share a few thoughts on that part first. Uh, from my perch at the agency, um, and this has already been alluded to uh, by Professor Jervis, uh, there's a unit in the analytic directorate, which is now called the Directorate of Analysis, not the DI anymore. And that unit is called the Sherman Kent School, the very same Kent that Bob alluded to. And it's the training academy for all analysts. And they offer literally uh, many, 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 many courses uh, for analysts, both brand new analysts, mid, mid level analysts, analysts more senior along in their careers, very specialized courses in everything uh, that cover economic, political, military, security analysis. But it's a great little training school. Uh, it has a fairly robust staff, which is one of the big changes that John McLaughlin uh, launched back in 2000 when he set up the school. Uh, the one I want to talk about specifically right now is called the CAP program. It's the Career Analyst Program. It's a mandatory 16-week program for all new analysts. Um, this is the thing uh, John created, John McLaughlin, in 2000. And uh, when I was on the seventh floor as uh, part of the uh, Directorate of Analysis Leadership Triumvirate, I was frequently a commencement speaker at these CAP graduations. Uh, believe it or not, at the end of 16 weeks, we would literally have a formal graduation event. Parents would come, friends, uh, colleagues of the analysts who were graduating in that class. And I can distinctly remember, I think at every one of these speeches, I would say, I am so, so jealous of all you new analysts. Because when I enter on duty back in the prehistoric era of uh, intelligence business, we barely had computers. We didn't have the internet and we never had a training course for analysts. Uh, I went to an intro to CIA class that lasted a week. Uh, and the only thing I remember it about it was I saw John McLaughlin for the first time talking about how cool it was being an analyst, at which point I decided I want to be John McLaughlin when I grow up. Didn't quite get there, uh, but it, it's a fabulous program for the 16 weeks. But what does this have to do with Dick Betts? So um, as it turns out, I happened to be at my old stomping grounds one day this week, and I looked up the director of the Kent School because I wanted to do a little due diligence to make sure my memory was correct about what's being taught there. So I specifically asked, um, what's going on with the curriculum these days? Do you still have required readings from Dick Betts, as well as Bob Jervis, by the way? And here's what they told me. I, I got an email and I want to read it. Uh, explicitly, agency instruction on the IC's enduring challenges of surprise, warning, preparedness, and response continue to rely on Professor Richard Betts' foundational scholarship. The Sherman Kent School, for example, explicitly cites and uses such seminal works of Professor Betts as his 1982 tome, Surprise Attack, and his path-breaking article from 1978, War and Decision, Why Intelligence Failures Are Inevitable. I also talked to some other colleagues. Uh, one of the things I discovered, and I literally did not know this in my many years in the building, I had no idea how many students had attended SEPA. When I started teaching at SEPA and I would occasionally get back into the building, I'd have people come up to me, people I didn't know and say, so how's it going up there at SEPA? Did you know that I graduated from SEPA? And I said, no, I just had no idea. Uh, which also says a little bit about the culture at the agency. Um, and Paul, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but uh, I rarely can remember an occasion where we actually talked about where we went to school. It just wasn't in the culture. Um, and so for that reason, I was a little surprised to just find out how many uh, SEPA grads there were working as analysts uh, in my own directorate. So after talking to the Kent School, I, it really just dawned on me just one more time again just how much of an imprint uh, Dick Betts has had on generations of intelligence practitioners, analysts and others. Um, and I, I can't say enough about that because these are the very people who like Paul, um, who actually hopefully are the people who help inform the thinking among policymakers. 
Sometimes we succeed, sometimes not. But the point is we do spend a fair amount of, amount of time thinking about outcomes, about pathways, about scenarios, and hopefully can help leaders make a more informed decision. And most of those decisions naturally are not easy ones. If they were easy, we'd all be successful. It's really not the way the world works. So a second uh, perch from which I want to discuss a little bit about Dick is my own experience teaching here at SEPA. Uh, I've been here teaching for four years, once uh, two years as an officer in residence when I was still at the agency, and then the last two years since I've retired from the agency. And uh, I will tell you, when I first was here in 2013, I very quickly came to be aware of Dick Betts, primarily because so many students would tell me, God, can you believe this class? It's so intense, it's so amazing. There's so much work. And, and this is the Dick Betts foundational course. And I thought, gee whiz, I wish I could take this class. Uh, Dick was kind enough to let me sit in on one of his classes, which was a full house. It was, I don't know how many hundreds of students there were in that room, Dick, but uh, I was very impressed and I could see you holding court and it was, it was just a great treat to be able to see you in action in the classroom. Um, the real thing for me about Dick though is how I'm using his work in my current class. I teach a class on intelligence and foreign policy and Dick's 2007 book, the one that Paul has alluded to already, Enemies of Intelligence. Uh, I have major chunks of that book as required reading in my class and a little bit of truth in advertising. There's very specific reasons why I want people to read those chapters. Uh, well, for one, there's the obvious that Dick provides so many keen insights about the intelligence business and the fraught nature of the intelligence policymaker relationship. Um, and I like that, of course, because I actually had a chance to live through that, as I know certainly Paul has. Um, and it's a pretty intense issue. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have John McLaughlin speak to my class yesterday, and he spoke 35 minutes, and then we had an hour and 15 minutes of Q&A because the students would have let him go. But he spent a huge amount of time talking about how he would prepare to brief policymakers. And, and I was taking notes myself. I thought, this is just like sheer wisdom coming out of John uh, every second in this presentation. And it just, the whole purpose of this class was to get into the whole question of that relationship and Dick obviously has had a huge impact because of his writing. Uh, I was gonna say a lot of the things that Paul said about the three enemies, uh, the outside enemies, what I call the bad guys, the adversaries, the innocent enemies, uh, that's us. I love that old cartoon, uh, we've met the enemy and he is us. And the way I think about that is it's, it's all the bureaucratics that Paul alluded to, but frequently it's about turf wars which I find maddening. Uh, I've seen it over and over again, but it's a reality and something you always have to work to uh, overcome. And then third is the, uh, the inherent enemies, uh, the analytic thinking problems. Why are we not thinking about this the right way? Uh, Paul's discussion about Iraq, um, it's so easy in hindsight, it wasn't at the time. And Paul, I would love to get your thoughts on the issue of the regional analysts. Um, because I thought a lot about this, particularly since I was involved after I joined the seventh floor in 2005 in doing briefings about where we went wrong and how we're trying to correct it. What lessons learned are we drawing and how are we gonna try to get people to think a little differently? This is one reason why we spent a lot more time focused on the red cell, on training analysts in alternative structured uh, analytic techniques. Um, and I got involved in setting a lot of that up and it was, it was great for me intellectually, most of my life working on Russia. And now I had a chance to deal with a range of other topics and deal with similar kinds of thinking problems. Um, I wanted to actually read something from Dick's book. Uh, it's the final sentence. And here I'm taking a, a little cue from Steve Fiddle, who, who also read something earlier. And it's the last paragraph. Uh, of this chapter on the, the three enemies. And Dick, I too am a fan of your prose, so I will just read this briefly. My survey of the intractability of the inadequacy of intelligence and its inseparability from mistakes in decision 
suggests one final conclusion that is perhaps most outrageously fatalistic of all, a tolerance for occasional disaster in foreign policy. Not an indifferent, lazy, or resigned tolerance, to be sure, but a readiness to absorb once in a while the tragic consequences of assault by the powerful coalition of outside, innocent, and inherent enemies of intelligence. Um, someday I'll have to take a class in writing with you, Dick, but uh, I really appreciate the way you can uh, summarize, but also in wonderful prose that's memorable uh, to bring home a, a, an important teaching point. So let me close uh, with a final anecdote. And this one gets to another uh, facet of Dick's character that I think warrants a particular attention and acknowledgement. And it's what I call intellectual integrity. Uh, when I first found out I was coming to Columbia and I would be actually teaching again, I hadn't been in a classroom in 20 years teaching graduate classes uh, at the University of Maryland on Russian history and Soviet foreign policy. I'm coming here to Columbia to teach a class on intelligence. And so I thought, hey, I, I probably need to brush up a little bit on my knowledge about the literature in the field and specifically about the agency's history. Believe it or not, when you actually work in the agency, you have not you don't have a lot of time to actually read about its history. You're busy doing your job. So uh, I, had, I had a summer to basically start getting ready for this first uh, semester class. And so I came across this book, Legacy of Ashes, the History of the CIA. So I called up my friends at the uh, CIA history staff and I said, so what's the word about this book? What do you make of this book? And they said, well, I'm not sure I would recommend this book. Uh, it, yeah, it did win a National Book Award Prize for nonfiction in 2007. But Peter, I have to be honest, uh, this book is replete with factual errors, inaccuracies, and it's, it's incredibly biased in its uh, interpretation of the history of the agency. So when I first was told this, I thought, well, you know, you're the agency historian. I, I, I'm not entirely surprised that maybe you'd be a little critical of a book written by an outsider, um, which is particularly critical. But what was most important about this conversation was the person who gave me this insight about the book um, said, let me show you something. I have a letter here. And he gave me a copy of a letter. And it was written by some guy named Richard Betts. And I'm reading, oh, oh you mean that the respected serious Columbia University professor, that Richard Betts? He said, yeah, that's the one. So he showed me this letter. And I'm looking at this letter and basically Dick very clearly and in his unique uh, style, dressed down the committee for granting such a prestigious award to a book with so many factual errors, inaccuracies and bias. So I looked at this and my first reaction was, is this letter for real? Who would do this? Who tells a prestigious New York based award committee that they did such a bad job? Well, the answer, for those of you who know Dick, it's, yeah, it's someone who feels very strongly about facts, bias, and the critical importance of telling people the way things really are. So I read this, and uh, as I've come to know Dick over the years, yeah, I wouldn't say Dick is like a front man or a cheerleader for the agency or the intelligence community. He's an honest, able analyst who takes in a lot of the data and then comes up with very special and sometimes unique and sometimes critical analytic judgments about the way things are. And so uh, the thing I, I've really come to admire about Dick is just the way he represents what I think is the goal of all scholars in the academy in a search for truth and summing up things correctly. So uh, to sum up then, I would really say the thing I have really come to admire about Dick is he is a man who exhibits the courage of his conviction, the willingness to stand up and call out things the way they really are. Um, and I will confess, Dick, I was a fan of yours even before we met, but after I read that letter, I thought, wow, I really wanna, I'm just delighted to have the opportunity to work with someone like you. I will stop there and thanks again for the opportunity to be here today. 
Great, this was terrific, uh, Peter. Thank you very much. And I would like um, the audience to uh, um, raise their hands if they have any questions. I will just add that, as I said at the beginning, between Bob Jervis's work and Dick Pitt's work, work on this, you know, enemies of intelligence, it was really, you know, difficult for a young scholar like myself trying to figure out how to intervene. This is literature. Everything seems to be have you know we've said they've said it all. Those two <laughs> um, uh, amazing scholars, and between the two of them, how, how what what else could I add, and how I would do it? Um, and you know, one of the people mentioned already how inspiring this book has been. And if you look at the topics um, that that Dick discusses in in, in this book. And think about the new literature that the new generation, the younger generations of scholars has, you know, have been engaging with. It is remarkable. Um, the idea of the double edged sort of expertise and think about the literature we have now on this, on politicization, uh, on thinking about culture of organizations and how to think about reform, secrecy and international security. All of those things are, are Part, are the, the part of, of Dick's analysis and you see the seeds of the analysis of the younger generation of scholars and it all traces back to the work of Dick Pett and Bob Jervis on this. And with this, I will start with my first question and then I'll, I see uh, 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 a hand already. But my question to my two colleagues who have uh, Bob and, and Dick who've worked on this on similar topics and um, you know, as, as Bob said, work together on postmortems. So if you think about the Venn diagram of the Jervis and Betts, um, uh, um, thinking about intelligence, thinking about intelligence failure, thinking about analysis, intelligence analysis, if you think about the Venn diagram, I can see where you agree. I can see a lot of areas of agreement, but I just want just to make it interesting a little bit for us. On what do you disagree? Uh, and can you think about moments where you were, uh-uh, this is, I, I don't see it this way. I, I would just love to know. And I, and I have a sense our audience might want to know as well. So it's an invitation. You don't have to take it right away, but it's an invitation to reflect on this. I, I find it interesting. Bob? <laughs> a very good and interesting question. Um, I think, you know, partly given how I got into this, which is through the, partly through the signaling, but more through the perception and misperception. So it isn't as much a disagreement as it is that I look at the political psychology, um, I think, a little more than Dick. So I both think of the biases of cognitive and affective as sort of my starting point. And um, in that, I don't think it's a disagreement, but it may be a slight uh, difference in where, where we start on it. I'd also look, and related to your second book, at individual differences, because I'm struck by the fact that uh, you know, both in the IC, in the academic community, and really an educated public, we look at the same information, Cold War about the Soviet Union, today say about China, and we reach quite different conclusions that are intelligence in the broad sense. I mean, how expansionist is China, uh, if it uh, 
to what extent is it insecure and a fear us to what extent is it dedicated to really being oh if it can a world leading by we differ on those judgments that are as in a broad sense intelligence and why is that um i don't know what has an answer but as you've paralleled it, your argument about self-monitoring it partly i think it is a personality factor i find it striking that among those people whose careers spanned cold war and today by and large not completely by and large people who were very hawkish in the end of the cold war are very hawkish toward china people who were more dovish toward the soviet union or it's more dovish not toward china uh personality politics here in line with what peter said this morning uh if your party aligns one way are you aligning that way so that isn't as so those two things aren't i think as much differences uh where dick would necessarily i think like to disagree the things that i would focus on i think probably more than he would now karen's question's a good one and i think the difficulty in uh thinking of substantive matters on which we disagree maybe a bad sign maybe that's an alert that uh we should reexamine our uh our own uh thinking or or mutual interaction on this uh uh and bob and i do disagree on a number of things policy questions some of them related to intelligence like the balance between concern for civil liberties and intelligence collection and so on but on the uh, on the issues of uh analysis and the barriers cognitive problems and so on uh uh real differences don't spring to my mind easily um i'm reminded of a, some of the comments that were made this morning too that uh my approach to a lot of things is in in a rough sense more inductive than uh, is maybe fashionable for elite social scientists these days um but the very fact that i've been able to write anything about intelligence that is taken seriously as not hopelessly naive by professionals in the business uh is a mark of something else too that's that's relevant to to my career at least and i imagine potentially to others and that is opportunities and timing and when we get into a subject um i uh started writing about these things in the late 1970s after working on the church committee staff and learning more in a concentrated period than i ever have before or since about these things before that the literature on intelligence was pretty thin or pretty naive simply because uh uh there was relatively little access to uh a lot of the relevant information with the the main exception being pearl harbor and roberto wallstetter's uh book so it wasn't possible before the time i just happened to get into the business as it were it wasn't possible to really write things that were reasonably uh informed uh so the timing was favorable for me uh in two senses it was it became possible because a deluge of reliably uh revealed information or declassified information began around that time uh and also i was uh one of the the, the first out of the dock in a way uh these days there's a huge open literature on intelligence two serious journals or 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 more on the subject uh but uh 30 or 40 years ago that wasn't true so it was easier for someone like me to uh 
uh, to make a mark uh, and to be inductive. Uh, being inductive requires that, that the information uh, be there. So uh, those sorts of fortuitous accidents are something that uh, I think have helped me more than once in, in dealing with other subjects uh, as well. But on your question, uh, yeah, on these matters, uh, maybe Bob and I think too much alike, despite great minds supposedly thinking alike. We'll, we'll put you the red, we'll make you the red team from now on. Whatever Bob says, you'll be the red team. <laughs> Look, let me, uh, because when I, I chaired, put together <coughs> the committee, the group to look at the Iraq WMD failure, my first choice to join was Dick, and second was Jim Wirtz, whose dissertation was on the surprise of the Tet Offensive. But I worried that we were all too much alike. And so I, I had to, uh, for the, the fourth person, restricted to those I knew who had uh, code word clearances. And I, that's why I asked Mel Leffler, who was different discipline, so much different political orientation, different approach. And I think it was quite striking that uh, there were very few disagreements among the four of us. That's, that's terrific. Uh, all right, uh, Barry Posen, floor is yours. Great to be here. I've enjoyed this panel a lot. Um, I want to return to a question that you've all treated one way or the other in your work and Jim treated fairly explicitly, but the, the distinction between surprise attacks that start wars, which you might call, you know, strategic surprises and surprises in wars. And I've always, you know, and I think this through, I always say, well, gee, you know, should the same theories really apply, you know, in the, once you're at war and you're, you've been fighting the same enemy for a while and you know what the consequences are of getting surprised, it seems like you should be kind of leaning forward and really have hypersensitive antennae and everything else, but it turns out not to be true. So I, I guess I'm just wondering, since we have you all together here, whether you could all kind of, you know, reflect on this issue a little bit and, and say whether after thinking about these things for all this time, you think there is much difference between what you might call interwar surprise versus intrawar surprise? I'll jump in because uh, I have a vested interest in this question because Ariel Levita many years ago wrote a whole book, uh, uh, a large part of which attacked me uh, on this question because he said, look, uh, Midway contrasts with Pearl Harbor and Midway uh, surprise was not inevitable. And uh, uh, he made a big deal out of the Midway case disconfirming uh, my pessimism. And my argument then and, and now would be there's a fundamental difference between pre-war and intra-war surprises, which is largely a political difference in the political context of perception and decision. Uh, and before the war, the question of surprise about whether war would occur is fundamentally different from trying to anticipate exactly how or where surprise will occur once you are at war and when there's no doubt that you're expecting the enemy to take advantage of any opportunity. So my short answer would be there's a fundamental uh, difference. Uh, the same explanations do not apply. And anybody who cares about this question can see an article I wrote in International Studies Quarterly responding to Levita, and, and he had a, a, a response to that as well. Uh, and that would have been around 1987 or 88. Uh, I would agree so that there was a, little a major difference. Sorry, go ahead, Jim. Yeah, you know, I was just gonna say, you know, I. Uh, I I sort of referenced that debate, not as closely as Dick, Dick, Dick just did, but you know, if you think about it, surprising the Americans with a, you know, a surprise carrier raid in the Hawaiian Islands after December 1941 was going to be problematic, right? I mean, that's that really is kind of a problematic uh, endeavor. So, uh, 
uh, I think there's a, you know, one, one other thing, there's sort of a, a lethargy, there's sort of a um, uh, inertia of peacetime that has to be overcome that shouldn't be present in war. But sometimes there is inertia in war too. I, I would offer uh, in two respects, the intra-war situation is uh, uh, much less acute uh, than, than the uh, earlier situation. One is you've got a, a, a surfeit of, of resources, uh, collection and otherwise, uh, collection and analytical that are applied to a topic because it has suddenly become a front burner for actually fighting in a way that was not the case before war broke out. And the second respect, and this gets into some of the things that Dick has written about the policy intelligence interface, is, is you know, what's at stake and, and how policy makers deal with uncertainty. Um, when, when a war is underway, the gloves are off and many policy responses would occur that would not have occurred if a war had not already broken out. And I'm thinking back uh, to the terrorism issue again. Um, you know, we could have we could have zapped bin Laden in Afghanistan before 9-11. We knew exactly where he was. The intelligence was very good on it, but there wasn't you know, the uh, political basis for initiating a new war in Afghanistan at that time. After 9-11, the gloves were off. Um, and this is pertinent actually to uh, some of the current debates about what we do in Afghanistan. You know, The hesitation about uh, employing uh, air power to rub out some incipient uh, uh, terrorist threat would not be there the way it was pre-September 2001. And that, that is directly relevant to how policy is responding to uncertainty. So I, I think the two situations are very different. I just a couple of things. It's a great question. I don't have an answer worthy of it. Um, on just tagging on Paul's last point, um, yeah, I think, uh, I, doubt, uh, I doubt if the intelligence on bin Laden would have been sufficient to trigger an attack if that had happened pre-9-11. That is, you know, you weren't positive he was there. There were lots of ways the raid could fail, uh, but the post-9-11 context is very different, which means the decision maker's willingness to act on various risks was very different. Um, on the, I think there have been some studies of attacks in wartime. Uh, Bart Whaley compiled a compendium on them, but I don't think mind it completely, and that's there to be worked on. Uh, Jim's book, of course, on the Tet Offensive is an example, and one of, as I remember, findings is the timing problem. But to do a big offensive takes a long time to prepare. And when you and intelligence are looking, uh, you know, you may see things, but you've missed the context of when the, of the, the decision isn't being made then, it was made much earlier. And that's hard to, to grasp. Um, finally, there's two things in surprises. It's interesting, the Battle of the Bulge, uh, one of the big surprises of World War II, it was we and the Brits had gotten used to uh, um, ultra, that is the code breaking. Once the Germans were pushed back, much more went by landlines. So we, in a way, got, we lost some of the muscle of doing intelligence using the other sources. Um, and on that, also on Midway, uh, Midway was great, but partly we were lucky. And it took quite a bit to convince the admirals that, um, that it was Midway and not the Aleutians. So yes, I, th I think the contrast Midway, I mean, the Midway case is interesting, but uh, doesn't mean it's easy. And interesting, the in-between cases, 
that is the Cold War, we knew the Soviet Union was an adversary. We knew it was trying to fool us. We knew it was, would try to build weapons we didn't see. And it's interesting to think about our record. <clears throat> I think people often say, well, the Soviets never deployed a weapon that we didn't have really long leave warning on. But it's not true. The biological weapons program we missed. And it's an enormous intelligence failure. Uh, now, it did not, as it turned out, have consequences. But that's an interesting, you know, those cases isn't wartime, but uh, something we were looking for and didn't see. Great. Um, I have Steve Watt next. Uh, hi, everybody. It's great to see uh, everyone and uh, congratulations, Dick. Um, so uh, given the quality of this panel and the people who are on it, I have a meta question uh, that I, I have to ask. Uh, if Dick is correct, and I think he is, that intelligence failures are inevitable, well, of course, scholarly failures are even more so. Um, so I wanted to ask this group, in the study of intelligence, what has the field gotten wrong over the last 40 or 50 years? And most important of all, what should it be doing differently in the future so that the failure rate goes down a little bit? We, we, we kind of select on the dependent variable. So we don't know if the problems that affect failure are also present in success. We, we don't really know. I don't think we know. I should add, Karen should weigh in on this one too. I think related to Jim's point, the, uh, you know, the evidence that is used still tends to be heavily weighted toward what becomes public and what becomes a matter of controversy. I cited the example earlier of Amshin Rico in 95 as one that never was out there as a you know, controversial intelligence failure, but looking at it from the inside, yep, it sure was a failure. I think even more sharply so than many others that are so labeled. So I, I think the, the, um, the constrained nature of the data that are used in, in the literature is, is one of the main problems. I mean, and of course, the field is still very much too heavily, I would say, U.S. centric. Um, and you, you get a set of problems that come with that. Um, the, the selection on the dependent, the de dependent variable, we've tried, you know, some studies are, are better at, at, you know, accounting for it. And the Rose McDermott and Uri Bar Joseph are explicitly trying to kind of open that up, which, which is great. The other problem we have is the aggregation issue, right? I mean, we're looking at the level of the organization and kind of look at the intelligence community as a whole, whereas there, as we kind of see, there are issues of individual personalities, as Bob was saying, and individuals that matter and what's their role within this organization and how to think about those, um, this aggregation problem. We, even when you talk about intelligence organizations between the agents and, and, and the, the interplay between structure, culture, um, agents, I think it's an overall problem we have when we think about decision making uh, and analysis as a whole, but definitely when it comes to intelligence. These are just a um, couple of issues. I don't know if it's something uh, we've gotten wrong, but uh, maybe that we have not gotten. And uh, that, as I've argued, there's not enough attention to analyzing and understanding intelligence successes. Uh, and I think there may be reasons for that having to do with problems and availability of relevant information that are maybe different from uh, the others. But I think uh, the literature has been overwhelmingly and, and in that sense, too much focused on failures. Uh, and understanding both sides of the coin better probably <clears throat> is necessary for a, a full understanding of the proper and uh, normal role of intelligence and policy. Let me just add one thing. There are on that uh, two good books that Jim mentioned his colleague, colleague Eric Dahl does 
one and um, um, Mar Yuri Bar Joseph and our uh, former student and friend Rose McDermott have another to compare successes and failures. Uh, but I, it still is, uh, uh, my colleagues have said, quite skewed also. When we look at successes, we tend to look at things like midway, you know, a specific event rather than a deeper understanding, at least important, our general understanding of another country and its political and social system and where its foreign policy goes. The more, for a long run strategic analysis. And, uh, you know, we have very few studies, I think, of that. Also, few studies of the variability in intelligence and um, policy making relations. And to put a plug in, there's a symposium in the, I don't know if it's out in print, but it is available on the web in the um, International uh, Intelligence and National Security Symposium that Jim introduced on the 2007 Iran nuclear NIE with pieces by the analyst for the NIO who wrote it, Richard Immerman, who was faked over the coals by the Pithiab about it, my discussion of the uh, reaction of policy makers I dealt with, and uh, John McLaughlin's uh, perspective doesn't have everything, doesn't have the policy makers themselves. But that interface is still I think understudied, partly because, and this is my final point, it's not only for intelligence, but so much of what we do, um, you know, we look a lot of us on the cases, past cases, going mostly by documents. And we know, I mean, the documents are great, but they also deceive and Karen tells the marvelous story that for her first book, she uh, was interviewing Brzezinski and she had his monthly and weekly memos to Carter. It's about the Soviet Union. And correct me if I got it wrong, but Spig said, well, you have to understand that I would never lie to the president, certainly. But if there were four arguments I could make, I would stress the one I thought would carry weight with him. Doesn't mean that was the, didn't reflect, I mean, it wouldn't distort my thinking. I thought it was wrong, I wouldn't say it. But I might think that's not really important, but I'm putting it right there at the top. And, but that's telling you what I think the president thinks, not what I think. Historians uh, get maybe more skilled at this than we do, but it's very tricky. The documents we know omit, they mislead, and yet they're what we have to use. Karen, could I interject here? Of course. Sorry, I can't make my flag work, so I apologize. Um, I want to get to Professor Wall's question, though. I, and I know uh, Bob and I have talked about this a lot about Phil Tetlock's work, which I love, um, but also Rob Johnston's book on uh, the analytic culture of the intelligence community, which I'm assuming some of you have seen, but he gets into some of Tetlock's work and he talks about the question of the paradox of expertise. <laughs> I suspect I'm speaking to the choir here, but it is striking that on major discontinuities in terms of strategic change, it is generally the non-experts who are closer to the mark than the experts. It's, it's the foxes and the 
hedgehog's problem. And I don't know whether you all share that, but I've become increasingly a believer. And I can share one anecdote. When we were going through the Arab Spring, and I was on the seventh floor doing pretty much nightly PDB review, after Egypt, I can distinctly remember I would meet with analysts on the other countries. And I would get all the reasons why that can't happen here, Peter, because all the deep, deep historical knowledge, the relationships, the culture, the tribal affinities, blah, blah, blah. And I'd say, hey, I, I hate politicization of analysis. You have to write the way you see it. That's great. Please do me one favor. Add a paragraph at the end of your piece that says, if we see any of the following indicators, I would have to revisit this judgment. Um, and then please listen for the reader. And I want you to keep track every day and then in the coming weeks. If you start to see some of those indicators really change in any kind of way, you better write about it and say, hmm, something different is happening here. But it's, it's, it's just that occupational hazard. And Paul, I would also agree that the, the warning, I was at Jim, you talked about the warning officer, the most hated job I could imagine. It was Nobody liked these warning officers because they would tell you all how wrong you were all the time. You're missing this. You're not worried enough. And of course, at some point, they're going to be right. But finding that, that right balance between the relationship among the political analysts, particularly, and the warning officer was, was always a big, big management challenge. It's no wonder they abolished that position. <laughs> I one bibliography, the, the Mideast uh, Arab Spring postmortem, um, the academics were largely very, very wrong, and the agency, or really ODNI, commissioned some studies. And Greg Gauze has a very interesting piece on the why the academics were wrong. I, I will just add the last point because this is a great question, uh, Steve. Uh, maybe we have focused too much on this issue of success and failure as the dependent variable. There's a lot of other interesting dependent variables to explore when you talk about intelligence. And if this is a shout out to those kind of younger folks uh, here wanting to write on intelligence, uh, don't be intimidated. There is a lot of, <laughs> still a lot that you can contribute. Um, Jack Snyder has his end up. I have a couple of comments on that previous discussion on surprise in war, uh, but my question is about intelligence as a sacred cow. So I actually read the thousand page compendium by Barton Whaley on surprise attack in war. And the only thing I remember from it is that even on a, even in wartime, if you attacked on a Sunday, it would surprise the other side. Uh, the other tidbit comes from uh, class lectures by Warner Schilling about the Japanese biological warfare program, where part of it was sending balloons across the Pacific which landed in the woods somewhere in the Northwest. And Schilling told us that he thought this was the Japanese trying to signal to the Americans that they had a way of delivering BW to targets in the United States and uh, which signals, which of course we didn't pick up. So take that for what it's worth. But my question is, based on my very casual sitting in on uh, cyber conflict discussions over the last couple of years, uh, something that I hear repeatedly uh, from Americans who are kind of inside the, the policy discourse uh, is that it's really important to develop accepted norms of cyber behavior, cyber, cyber conflict, and the Chinese have to learn to accept that they can't steal American business secrets. And the Russians have to accept the norm that they can't meddle in our elections. But when it comes to American intelligence activities and espionage, limiting those with some kind of norm, um, 
telling Angela Merkel, I'm sorry, we'll never listen in on your phone calls again. Uh, the, the assumption in the room is always, well, wait, that's just espionage. There's no norm against espionage. Everybody does it. And it's not our fault that we're better than everybody else. So a norm there is completely off the table. And uh, I'd be interested if any of you intelligence experts want to comment on that. Yes, I do. But <laughs> Jay Healy and I have just published an obscure piece partly on this that I think certainly the decision makers um, you know, have the sense if we do it, it's fair. If they do it, it isn't. Uh, the the presumably Russian solar winds was referred to as an attack. Well, no, it was espionage. I've granted, and JD has his hand up and knows much more about this than I do. But as far as we know, there. Uh, there was no offensive uh, use of uh, payload on the end. They might have put one on, but still it was like what we did. And of course, we've interfered in the elections of almost every country in the world. And so there's, I think, the, the double standard. I think the problem for intelligence is that because cyber, especially offensive cyber, is so heavily compartmentalized, uh, there the, the analysts don't know what we're doing. So if they see another country do something, the other country might feel it's a response to what we did. It's hard for the analyst to reach that judgment or consider it because he or she isn't likely to know what we've done. So I think this is a really, it's a general problem that intelligence analysts are told, you know, you're not second guessing American policy. And I think, and see if Paul and Peter, you know, want to agree that that, uh, that leads analysts to, be a little shy about factoring in American policy as the other side perceives it to their analysis of what the other side is doing. And I think in cyber, the problems are really, really compounded. All right, I see JD and we are almost at time. So we are, at, um, uh, so JD uh, briefly, and then I'll give an opportunity to respond and then we'll, we'll end the session. Sure. Um, the gentleman asked about the applicability of the current work around theories of intelligence failure and uh, inevitable surprise in uh, war as different from uh, warning of approaching war. How would you all reflect upon the question of these states short of war in these gray zones of high-end competition, um, low-end conflict or gray zone conflict that we're currently facing? Part of that reflects a bit on this question of on persistent cyber engagements where we're seeing constant exchanges where you know it's not a zero state. Um, there, there's a variety of ongoing actions at all times in the space. Um, how do you think this changes how we ought be approaching the question and uh, how much the work can be extended into that area. Anyone from our panel? You know, surprise is the great enabler of the fait accompli, right? And the idea is in the crisis, do you want to, you, you seize what you want, minimal price and blood and treasure, and then you shift the escalation burden onto the opponent. Now you're in the superior position. And maybe, I mean, the Japanese thought at Pearl Harbor, maybe they won't be willing to pay the price in blood and treasure to make this a big, you know, to come back at us. And after all, Hitler's going to keep them occupied. So I think in, that's, that is the, the key uh, uh, intelligence problem we face is the, uh, is the use of surprise as the enabler at the outset of war to, for the quick grab. And then, uh, and then these things usually deteriorate into 
uh, a you know attritional slugging match. One, one of the two points I made earlier about the wartime situation, namely that there would be already a lot more resources, analytic and collection, devoted to a problem that the policymakers uh, have have accepted as a problem. If it's a crisis short of war, that that means uh, failure and surprise are for that reason less likely than with something coming out of the blue in a totally peacetime non-crisis situation. I wonder, and, and Paul may want to comment here, if one thing, a particular problem with the gray zone and would apply to terrorism is if you, know, you see a pattern, but then when the pattern changes, that is, you, we generally expect tomorrow to be like today and seeing, whoops, no, the other side is really changing, either yeah, de-escalating, maybe trying to speak over the wants of better relations, or is found a, a, a vulnerability we didn't know, or is shifting the level of conflict. In a way that may be particularly hard when you're in a sort of steady conflict. Okay, great. Um, so I would like to uh, thank my distinguished uh, panelists for an engaging conversation. Um, we, I mean, thank you very much for your time and for your comments. We're going to take a short break of about uh, 12 minutes and we will reconvene here at uh, 2 p.m. Uh, for our third panel. Thank you very Thank much. You. All right, well, I think we're ready to begin. Jack, can I hand it over to you? Uh, yes, uh, welcome back for our panel on foreign policy and the use of force. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing the moderator uh, for your panel, and that's Tom Christensen, who's the professor of public and international affairs at SIPA and the director of the China and the World Program at Columbia. Uh, from 2006 to 2008, he was the deputy assistant secretary of state for East Asian and Pacific Affairs. Uh, but the most important thing to tell you about is that Tom is the author of an article that came out just this morning in Foreign Affairs. And he's telling us why there won't be a Cold War with China, which is a great relief to us all. So thanks for sharing the good news, Tom. Uh, take it from here. All right. Thanks, Jack. Um, yeah, the, 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 the longer version of the story, though, is we're still in a big strategic competition. So it's not all, it's not all uh, uh, roses and honey. So, um, uh, but thanks. And I thought you were going to say the most important thing was that I co-authored an article with you when I was a grad student. But I, I, that's why I was smiling when you were saying that. <laughs> um, uh, so so uh, I have a great panel. I have you know, four giants in the field of security studies. And it's an appropriately uh, structured panel in that all the people involved have done the things that Dick Betts have has done so well in his career, uh, publishing really important articles and books on security studies issues, um, teaching uh, about security studies to uh, future generations of scholars and practitioners, uh, and building organizations for the study of sec security studies, very importantly, engaging the policy world either directly as policy makers or implementers of policy uh, or advising uh, those who do both of those things. Uh, and Dick has uh, a, a strong record in all of those scores. And uh, rather than going, I'm gonna introduce them all and ask them each to speak for uh, no more than 15 minutes about the topic of force and foreign policy, which is at the center of, of Dick's work. Um, but rather than going through their CVs, I just wanted to say something uh, more personal about their backgrounds or maybe about something that, uh, you, that people might not have realized when they hear the names uh, that I'm about to list that they might not realize fully uh, that I think are important parts of their own 
careers and legacies and uh, tie into Dick's legacy very well as well. Um, so John Mearsheimer um, uh, is famous for his international relations theory work and his ability to make uh, very provocative, strongly argued positions based on theoretical assumptions uh, in, in his scholarly work and also in the world of uh, public policy. So he's published in a lot of a lot of op-eds and a lot of foreign, uh, foreign affairs articles, foreign policy articles. So, so uh, you know, that's what he's famous for. And he's particularly famous for uh, having very strongly held positions, both on the theoretical side and on the policy side. And those two things are connected. His strongly held policy positions flow from his strongly held theoretical beliefs. Um, what's less known about John is that John is a great teacher. Um, you know, you don't, you think of John as that kind of guy out there on, 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 on CNN or on some television show defending a position or as PBS defending a position um, uh, with great strength, but he's a great teacher. He, he's, he's won awards from the time he was in grad school and at the University of Chicago. And why is that important? Because to be a great teacher, you have to be open to the views, the theoretical views and the policy views of others. And this really shows up in my experience with, with, with John's uh, imprint on the field. When people apply for jobs out of the University of Chicago, you get files of people that are not writing things that are in agreement with John Mearsheimer's theoretical or policy views, but John is on the committee and John is writing very strong, positive letters for these people if they do good work. And, uh, I just have a lot of respect for that. And I think that's very consistent with Dick Betts's own approach to teaching. Um, and uh, other people don't know that John went to West Point and served in the Air Force for five years, but that is on his uh, bio as you have it. And uh, uh, that, that's an aspect of his background that a lot of people don't know. Uh, Barry Posen will speak next. We're going in alphabetical order. Barry, I worked with Barry for five years at MIT. And uh, Barry, uh, again, a uh, great scholar, lots of great publications. Um, people don't uh, really, and he also served in the Pentagon. So he has a lot of uh, experience on, uh, on the ground tying these, uh, these scholarly works into the policy world. Uh, but people probably don't fully appreciate uh, in other places uh, the strength of the security studies program at MIT and why it's so important. Um, and Barry's really at the heart of that institution and it's important because it brings together military officers every year from the various services. It brings together uh, uh, scientists, a uh, rocket scientist, we're always down the hall, uh, and, and it brings together political scientists in an integrated way that's rare to find in the uh, academic world and rare to find in the policy world uh, as well, and is really needed. And uh, Barry's really been at the center of that, and of Seminar 21, which trains mid-ranking officials in the US government. Uh, and John Mearsheimer is a, a rock star in, in, uh, in that uh, Seminar 21 tradition. He's always been a, a major presenter uh, uh, at those meetings. And I've met Seminar 21 grads around the government and they always praise that experience. And uh, Barry's been a huge part of that. Steve Rosen, uh, another you know, great scholar, uh, great CV, um, also award-winning teacher at Harvard. Um, uh, what people might miss in, uh, in, in, in Steve's uh, background is uh, it truly champion work that he did uh, as the associate director at the Olin Institute um, in the early post-Cold War years. I, I'm strongly of the opinion that the Olin Institute at Harvard kept the field of security studies alive at a time in which you know, the knives were always out for security studies during the Cold War for a mix of uh, intellectual and ideological reasons. When the Soviet Union broke up, uh, the field of security studies was in big trouble. And the Olin Institute was just a lifeline for uh, younger scholars uh, who wanted to go into the security studies field and really gave us a leg up in our careers. And Steve was just a life force in that. Sam and Steve uh, really deserve a lot of credit for that. And it's not a trumpet that Steve's gonna blow, but I'll blow it. So it's, uh, um, I think it's, it's a, a, a terrific uh, achievement. And uh, he's also been very involved in SWAMOS with, with Dick, which is a great institution. Um, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a beneficiary of that. So I'm particularly grateful to Steve on a personal 
And with Scott, I mean, Scott's done all these things. He's advised the, 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 the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He's done the, the policy work. He's written policy articles uh, that address real world issues. And all these scholars address real world issues and preserve the legacy of doing real world issues in political science, which is so important and is always under threat as political science spins out into the ether. Um, and, and Scott's been a champion of that. And, and the big thing that I associate with Scott is all these people are worried after 9-11 about, about non-state actors getting nuclear weapons. And I just think, I always think of Scott and I think Scott Sagan will tell you, uh, worry about the state actors getting the nuclear weapons too. Uh, don't just worry about terrorists with nuclear weapons. More state actors with nuclear weapons, not a good idea. And he offers the various reasons why in a very articulate uh, uh, fashion. Um, and that's gonna become more important over time, I gather, uh, not less important as more states do develop the weapons. Um, so I'm really honored to, to, to be uh, uh, the moderator of this panel. And I just wanted to say something about why, and then I wanna turn it over to them. Uh, so I'm gonna go in alphabetical order and start with John Mearsheimer. Thank you very much, Tom, for the kind introduction. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. I'm actually thrilled to be here, and I mean that, uh, to celebrate Dick Betts, the person, and Dick Betts, the scholar. Uh, I've known Dick for a really long time, uh, going back to the fall of 1979 when I went to the Brookings Institution, uh, and I met Dick every morning and every afternoon for an entire year at the Brookings coffee table. Uh, it was one of the most important experiences of my life in lots of different ways. Uh, I also have a special place in my heart for Dick because we were born uh, at roughly the same time. In the second half of 1947, Dick was born August 15th, 1947. I was born December 14th. And of course, in between us, Bruce Blair was born. Bruce was at Brookings when Dick and I were there. Uh, and I often think of uh, Dick, uh, Bruce, and I uh, in the same way, because in very important ways, we grew up in the same world, and the world that you grow up in greatly influences how you think about the world that you now live in. Uh, and I think very importantly, we experienced the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, the assassination of President Kennedy, and most importantly, I think, the Vietnam War. I think when it comes to the whole subject of force and foreign policy, for people like Dick and me, the Vietnam War um, looms over us in, in ways that are hard to uh, uh, describe, but nevertheless are very important. I would also note, um, and I've made this point before in another celebration of Dick's career, that he is really the only person who was produced in the security field uh, in the 1965, 1975 period. Most po people don't realize it, but security studies basically died uh, between 1965 and 1975. There's a missing generation there. One of the principal reasons that people uh, on this panel have succeeded so well in academia is because there is no generation in front of us. Uh, and that was because of the Vietnam War. The one exception to that is Dick, and uh, Dick is a 1975 PhD, so he was educated in the early 70s. Um, and, uh, but Dick was not a strategist at the time. I would argue he was basically a comparativist, and of course he worked very closely with Sam Huntington, and he was Sam's principal research assistant on Sam's famous book, Political Order and Changing Societies. Uh, but he's a very special person in that regard, uh, in my opinion. Now, the subject on the table today is force and foreign policy, or I would define it a bit more narrowly to mean war and foreign policy. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about Dick Betts's views on force and foreign policy or war and foreign policy. Uh, I was looking at his book, American Force, uh, and what was very interesting is that in the front of the book, he made it very clear that he was a hawk during the Cold War, and he was a dove during the unipolar moment. And he uses exactly that language. And what becomes clear when you think about it is that Dick was firmly in the mainstream during the Cold War when he was a hawk. 
but he was not in the mainstream in the unipolar moment when he was a dub because remarkably few people in the American national security establishment were doves during the unipolar moment, but he was, he was at a step. So the question is what explains that, right? I'm also interested in trying to determine what explains why Dick is widely seen as a person who is, who has good judgment, who's prudent, who's not extreme in one direction or the other. Why is that the case? Why is he held in such high regard by so many people from different persuasions? So I kind of want to answer these two questions. And my answer is that if you look at his work, there are two dimensions that stand out. And those two dimensions, when you marry them together, provide answers to those two puzzles that I've just put on the table. And briefly, the two dimensions are, first, Dick really understands that war is a profoundly political process. And he also understands, and this cannot be emphasized enough, that politics is an incredibly messy business. That's the first point. The second is that Dick understands that the military is a giant killing machine. This is something that most academics don't understand at all. It's a giant killing machine. And as such, it is a blunt instrument that is very hard to control. Now, let me expound uh, on those points. And by the way, I want to emphasize that I could find plenty of support in Dick's writings uh, to buttress my argument here. So these are not arguments that I'm making up. First, on the business about war being a political process, everybody in academia, you know, says that's true. It, that's kind of standard fare. You admit that you're a Clausewitzian, you say war is a political process, and pay the argument lip service. I don't believe that most people really understand how fully true that statement is. Uh, and let me just say a few words about the Vietnam War that drive this home. Uh, war is a political process on the home front. It's a political process in terms of how you conduct the war. And it is of enormous importance. The politics are of enormous importance for determining who wins the war. But just to talk about Vietnam on the home front, it's very clear from the historical record that one of the principal reasons that LBJ took us into Vietnam in 1965 is because of domestic politics. He did not want to be accused of having lost Vietnam the way Truman was accused of having lost China. Domestic politics weighed heavily in his mind. Furthermore, it's quite clear that the reason that we lost the war, or one of the reasons that we lost the war, is that American domestic public opinion turned against the war. Uh, there was no way that it could go on past 1972. Uh, and in fact, it ruined LBJ in the process. So it mattered on the home front and politics mattered enormously in the conduct of the war, right? Whether you believe that the North Vietnamese were a formidable foe because of communism, or you believe like I do that they were a formidable foe because of nationalism, the fact is that nationalism and communism, some mix of the two, fuel the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong, and those are profoundly political ideologies. And if you think about the Arvin forces, these are the South Vietnamese military forces that were allied with us, they were hopelessly inept. And one of the reasons that they were hopelessly inept is that they were joined at the hip with us. And this caused all sorts of political problems within South Vietnam itself. And as long as we were there and we were supporting the Arvin and the Chu government, it caused all sorts of political problems for them. So the conduct of the war was deeply political. And by the way, during the Vietnam years, it was commonplace to say that we won every battle that we engaged in, which was true. We won virtually every battle, but we lost the war. And why did we lose the war? Because war is a political process and we lost politically. We did not lose militarily in the sense that we were defeated in battle, there was no DNBN foo. Uh, and then with regard to what determines victory, right? Uh, as Dick writes, uh, war has many causes and each war is unique and complicated. 
but the root issue is always the same. Who rules when the fighting stops? Who rules when the fighting stops? I argue in my writings that politics is all about who gets to write the rules, the rules. What Dick is telling you here is that politics is really at the heart of determining who wins a war. So war is a terribly political process from start to finish. But furthermore, and this is a point that's not emphasized by Clausewitz because he's talking about the military instrument, not so much the surrounding politics. But when you think about the surrounding politics, the surrounding politics are incredibly messy. Politics is a contact sport, as both Bill Clinton and Barack Obama said. Politics can destroy the lives of presidents. Look at what happened to LBJ. Look at what happened to George W. Bush. Politics is a really tough business. It is really messy. First point, war is a political process. Second point that's very clear in Dick's writings, and I would suggest that people look at his book, American Force, to see evidence of that, is that the military is a giant killing machine. Most people don't understand that what militaries are, are huge conglomerations, of mainly men, right, who are armed to the teeth and are trained to kill each other. And you've got huge numbers of weapons, and those weapons are designed to make sure you kill as many of the bad guys before the bad guys kill you. This is what war is all about. When you go to a place like West Point, you're basically trained to be a killer. Nobody uses that language. It, it's just not politically correct, but that's the basic essence of the enterprise. If you go to war you know, against the Wehrmacht in 1944, right? you wanna kill as many Germans as you can before those Germans kill you. And it's killing on a massive scale. Just important to understand that. And the United States in recent years has been in the business of engaging in unfair fights. We're basically bullies. We run around the world picking on weak people, but you get into a fair fight, it is incredibly lethal for you as well as for the other guy. It is really horrible. And these giant killing machines crash into each other. And furthermore, when they get desperate, there's no end to what they'll do. If we have to burn every Japanese city to the ground and kill, or murder a million Japanese civilians to avoid invading the Japanese home islands, we will not hesitate to do it. We'll do what's ever necessary to save American lives. So when you go to war, lots of civilians are gonna get killed. And again, this is not only a blunt instrument, a point that he makes, it's also an instrument that's very hard to kill. Just look at all the friendly fire casualties in wartime, very difficult to control this instrument. Right. It is a blunt instrument. Now, what this tells you is that if you're going to do social engineering with that instrument, you're in real trouble. <laughs> this is not an instrument that's designed to do social engineering. This is an instrument that is designed to break things and kill people and kill lots of people and break up lots of material things. It's what armies do and air forces do, and navies do, right? And Dick's work captures this. So it's these two things together, you put them together. War is a political process and that political process is messy, number one. And number two, recognition of the fact that you're dealing with a blunt instrument that's hard to control, that makes Dick a very prudent person. Dick fully understands these things. And when you fully understand these things, you're very cautious about employing that instrument. And if you employ it, you think long and hard about exactly how to do it. And you understand full well, and this gets in the clause wits, that things might not work out the way you intended. But this is what Dick Betts is all about. Now, this brings me to my final point, trying to explain why Dick was a hawk during the Cold War and why he was a dove during the unipolar moment. Well, during the Cold War, we faced a dangerous adversary. Most people today don't realize that we did face a dangerous adversary during the Cold War. And as Dick points out in his writings, the central focal point of that competition between the United States and the Soviet Union was on the central front in Europe. And most of what we did revolved around the central front. And 
what we tried to do there was take this blunt instrument, the US military, and prepare it to fight a war on the Central Front. And we also used it to fight wars in places like Korea, and we thought about using it to fight a war in the Persian Gulf in the latter part of the Cold War. That's what this instrument was designed to do, right? And it made perfect sense. And it was easy to be a hawk under those circumstances. We did not do much social engineering in those days. And I would say that the one time we did engage in social engineering was in Vietnam. And you all know how that ended, not very happily. But anyway, that's why Dick was a hawk. And I think it made eminently good sense to be a hawk during the Cold War. Then comes the unipolar moment. Okay, what does that mean? First of all, it means we have no rival great power and we have this incredibly powerful military that we can run around the world with knocking off regimes. You all understand that except for maybe China and Russia, there isn't a government in the world that the United States couldn't take down quite quickly because it has so much military power. But the problem that you run into is once you knock off the regime and you own the place and you engage in social engineering, you have to do it with this instrument that is terrific at knocking off regimes, but is basically useless at social engineering. Now, just let's talk a little bit about social engineering. Remember, politics is an incredibly complicated process, period. And you're talking about doing political things like nation building and state building in a country that you've just wrecked with your military, with an instrument that's basically good at killing people, but not good at doing much else. This is a prescription for really big trouble. And furthermore, what makes it even worse is that there's just no end to the number of countries that you can invade and knock the regime off, right? So it's hardly surprising that you're going to end up as a crusader state and you're going to end up fighting lots of wars that do not end happily because social engineering is the principal goal. So what's Dick Betts's legacy? Dick Betts's legacy is that he was right about US foreign policy in both the Cold War and in the unipolar moment. There are very few people in the United States' national security and establishment who can say they were right on both counts. He can. And the reason he can is that he understood the relationship between war and foreign policy, between force and foreign policy, in ways that few other people did. And for that, I admire him greatly. Thank you. Thanks very much, John. Uh, very powerful comments as always. And uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Barry and just say one last thing about Barry, that Barry is a champion infighter for keeping the field relevant in faculty meetings and uh, stood shoulder to shoulder with him in, that, in that, uh, those struggles and he's a master. So over to you, Barry. Well, if you fight long enough, sooner or later, you're going to be defeated, Tom. <laughs> it's just like the intelligence lecture we heard earlier. <laughs> well, it would be easy for me to just point at John's little face on the screen here and say what he said. And in this case, that's going to be pretty close to right, right? And I don't think it's a surprise that John and I have a pretty similar take on, on Dick. Um, I've said this before. It's a, you know, it's a typical Barry observation. David Letterman, late night talk show host, used to call Larry King, this, you know, the longtime radio and television broadcaster, the iron horse of American broadcasting. And of course, we know what iron horse means. It means locomotive. It means powerful, steady, directed, um, uh, and really made of steel or made of iron, right? And if Larry King was the iron horse of American broadcasting, then Dick Betts is the iron horse of American security studies. And he was particularly a leader in those, we'll call them the amnesiac years after Vietnam. John said, made it, made it sound maybe even worse than it was, or maybe as bad as it was, but certainly the amnesiac years after Vietnam, Dick Betts was 
the person who was just ahead of me in this field who remembered what this was all about. He was a mentor to me when I started out, and I'm sure he did me a few favors that I still don't know about. And even his citations to my work, which are critical, and I think there are some, maybe more than some, citations are citations, and if you're cited by Dick Betts, then you should damn well say thank you. Um, now, like John, I think Dick has been a voice for a particular approach to security studies, which I would call Clausewitzian, although even that does not quite do just, justice to his system of thought. Sometimes you're reading along in Dick and you're going, oh, this is kind of a Hans Morgenthau kind of observation. And sometimes you're reading along and go, geez, man, this guy really understands his organization theory. And then you're reading along and going, wait a second, this guy's a comparative politics guy. Look at what he gets about the way other countries work. The trick is he's able to pull it all together, right? For almost anything he chose to study. Um, just as an observation, you know, Dick is a reader of Clausewitz. He lectures on Clausewitz. I've heard him do it. But it's an open question whether Clausewitz creates Clausewitzians or instinctual Clausewitzians somehow find their way to on war and go, at last, someone thinks of the world the way, the way I do, even though many passages are impenetrable. Now, rather than drive by and wave at Dick's voluminous work, uh, which I couldn't remember anyway, because my brain is going, uh, I want to remind you all briefly of one that I like very much uh, and which exemplifies his approach to security questions and which I've often assigned in my class on intervention. And this is the article, The Delusion of Impartial Intervention, published in 1994 in Foreign Affairs. And by the way, I noticed doing a quick Google Scholar search of Dick's work that this is one of his most cited articles, right? It pops up first, I think, on the Google Scholar list. And this is a surprise and it's not a surprise. Dick obviously did not exactly cut his teeth on humanitarian intervention or the United Nations, or even on the study of civil wars, although you could argue his study of Vietnam really primed him for this kind of work, right? But this really wasn't his area. As John pointed out earlier, intervention came to us. Humanitarian intervention came to us in the early 1990s and was put on our plate. And as strategists, we could either take it seriously or not. Um, now, the timing was right. Because at that time, there wasn't much good analysis to read about humanitarian military intervention. I know because I tried to put the course together in those days, and it was one of the few smart things you could assign. Dick saw a need and he used the tools that he had to fill it. The US and others were doing this sort of thing without any political military strategy and without any understanding that when you strip away the morality questions, this was about others' wars and the American inclination, as well as the rest of the Western worlds, based on principle to make these wars our wars. So if you knew something about political military strategy and the difficulty of achieving political goals with military power, you had knowledge that others needed, and Dick answered the call. And the rate of citation shows that he answered it extremely well. I'll just briefly remind you of the argument. The West was intervening in civil wars, which as Dick clarified, and as John said, are about who should rule. Amazing how often this basic point was overlooked. Interveners simply forgot about this, the occasion for their wars, when we rushed in to help on the basis of our premises, which is that people need help and we have the power to do it. The essay is a critique of two intervener proclivities, one idealist and one a practical constraint embedded in Western politics. The idealist premise, judging coming from the UN peacekeeping experience, was the commitment to impartiality and the practical domestic political constraint that secretly governed the West when it went into these things was the proclivity to invest only limited resources. Now, UN peacekeeping may have worked in the past because it was impartial, but impartial doesn't work when there's no peace to keep. If impartial, Peace enforcement merely prevents either side from winning and thus prolongs the war. And as Dick points out, this is not exactly a humane outcome. Despite that, limited intervention seems attractive given that these wars were not vital interests, but it is hard to achieve much with limited means unless one devotes those limited resources to supporting one side or another to achieve victory which is to say you suspend the commitment to impartiality. So it's simply hard to be both limited and impartial. One can perhaps be impartial if one is imperial, which is to say, throw a lot of resources at the problem. Otherwise, you're gonna to have to pick a winner. 
Dick also makes the point that outside interveners often hope to achieve both peace and justice. And he reminds us that for practical reasons, these objectives are often at odds, or at the very least, combining the two means that you need to bring a lot more force to the table. Now, if you help the strongest win, you can get to peace pretty quick and perhaps sustain it, but you're almost surely not going to get to justice. If you try to distribute power or territory in a way that is just or in a way that is respectful of where groups live before the fighting or the rights they enjoyed before, you may create boundaries or expectations that are indefensible at, when, the, when the war is ostensibly over. Now, Dick brought to this problem a hard-headed clarity about how to think about these problems, a clarity of mind which is present in all of his writing, which many of you have observed already today. And here we return to Clausewitz. Clausewitz teaches us that war is an extension of politics, so the objective is critical. You had better decide what it is. Strategy is a series of interlinked means and ends, each one of which is meant to contribute to the next and to the ultimate desired outcome. Politics must infuse every part of the activity. Thus, outsiders ought not to go into these wars without knowing what they are about, and again to repeat, they're about who will rule. So you as outsiders have to have an objective to organize and discipline your military activity. You have to decide who you want to win. Right? But you also have to estimate the resources it will take to secure the desired outcome and whether you are willing to invest them. Means must be consistent with ends. Now, as John pointed out, Dick often, Dick carries with him an, another understanding. And this is Clausewitz's observation that war is a dynamic environment and that environment changes the combatants and not necessarily for the better. Once the local factions that one hopes to induce to stop fighting have instead started fighting or at war, it's very hard to get them to stop. If the local parties were reasonable before the fighting, they're not reasonable now. It takes a lot of information for them to measure their relative power and their relative will. So that means that the fighting has a tendency to persist. Though many who study civil war, including me, believe there are diplomatic openings created by the so-called herding stalemate, Dick reminds us that these stalemates can go on for a long time before, before they hurt enough to constitute a change and a chance for diplomacy. And if the outside intervener, aka the United States or the UN or the international community, takes sides, the outsider is then engaging in a war that the chosen enemy of peace is geared up to fight. You can't just show up and tell the bad guys how it's going to be or tell, tell all guys how it's going to be. You are entering a kind of maelstrom, right? And being able to stop that maelstrom with your power is extremely hard. Now, before I close, I want to make an observation that's a little bit off the Clausitzian um, you know, theory and about something much more fundamental. Um, one observes in all of Dick's work about this kind of question, a really strong ethical sense, and a special ethical sense, which I think is shared by many strategists, but it's often unexpressed. This observation may seem odd given the hard bitten tone of the advice Dick provides in this piece and in his other work. And I'm not talking about the laws of war here, either before war or during war. I'm talking about a simpler principle. If the use of military force is not subjected to very severe strategic analysis, if those who advocate its use fail to acknowledge basic facts about the nature of war as a special environment that lends itself to escalation rather than de-escalation, and lends itself to pure destruction, the breaking of things and the killing of people, then that is simply wrong. The failure to approach this problem with the respect it deserves is simply wrong. Wielding force without a reasonable and clear strategy is simply waste. War is unforgiving enough even when the best strategic practices have been pursued. But when the most slovenly practices govern, everybody will pay more than is necessary. Now, all of these insights are embodied in two bits of advice in the essay, one at the beginning and one at the end. At the beginning, he reminds us of the physician's motto. And he says that peacemakers would do well to adopt it, first, do no harm. And at the end, he says, 
Calling attention to mistakes, confusion, and uncomfortable choices is not intended to discredit intervention altogether. It is meant to argue for caution because confusion about what is at issue can make such undertakings cause conflict rather than cure. So much wisdom encapsulated in one short piece, a piece that's basically available to readers of every stripe, social scientists, political actors, journalists, right? This is one of the great things he has left, right? That he has left and he's gonna to continue to do. It's clear that this man can't stop. So thanks for everything you've given us so far, Dick, and thanks for what you're gonna give us. Here we go. I, I wanted to say a brief word about Steve before he starts. And that is that I left out his policy um, uh, experience at the NSC and one that's uh, close to my heart with the uh, Office of Net Assessment at the Pentagon with Mr. Andrew Marshall. And just something occurred to me recently that I thought I should mention, which is that we used to do these summer war games at the Naval War College, uh, unclassified war games about you know, what the world would look like in 2020. And it was back in 1994 or 1995. And some of these things were dismissed by some of the participants as, uh, oh, this is science fiction. This could never happen. I have to say that some of those some of those games um, look an awful lot like meetings at the Pentagon today about contemporary events, um, about the capabilities and and, uh, and and assets that are actually available to potential adversaries in the United States. So, uh, kudos to the imagination of uh, one Steve Rosen. So, uh, over to you, Steve. Thank you, Tom, and thank you for the organizers uh, of this uh, uh, celebration of, of Dick's uh, career, which uh, ha happily is, is still far from being over. Uh, I will note for the historical record that the last time all of the, the members of this panel were in the same place at the same time were at the famous Wiano conferences sponsored by Sam Huntington and the Olin Institute uh, during the uh, unipolar moment. If the unipolar moment had nothing else to brag about, it was that we had great conferences, uh, which, brought together, which brought together people who ordinarily would not talk to each other. Uh, I want to brag about my most significant accomplishment, Dick, which occurred the first year you and I were teaching uh, uh, at SWAMOS. You were the director, I was your assistant, but, but I conspired with your wife to smuggle her up to Cornell so we could give you a surprise birthday party. <laughs> uh, and I, I met your wife and I uh, uh, met your children and it was a wonderful experience, which is, still is very vivid in my memory. Uh, for the purposes of this panel, I, I, I want to do three things. One to begin as properly as, as John and Barry did by uh, giving my understanding of, uh, of the core of, of Dick's uh, intellectual corpus. And I, by and large, uh, happily agree with John and Barry, um, but then go on to explore the strengths and weaknesses uh, of the approach that uh, uh, Dick has adopted or developed over the course of the years. Uh, and then finally, uh, do something I think, Dick, that you would approve of because you approve of policy relevant uh, scholarly studies, which is okay, Dick, you, you've developed a perspective on the use of force. Uh, what does that tell us about what we should do about China? Uh, we may not be in a cold war, Tom, but the possibility of the use of force in, in interactions between China and the United States, as you pointed out in your kind second introduction to me, the use of force is no longer unthinkable. Well, if it's not unthinkable, we should think about it. What does Dick teach us about how to think about it? What are the strengths and weaknesses of it? Okay, so uh, what's the core of Dick's perspective or intellectual uh, 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 take on security to the use of force. Uh, quite clearly, as the people have gone before me have pointed out, Dick is a, a conservative, a really deep and fundamental conservative with a small C. Conservative, not as a hawk or a dove or a right winger or, or a left winger, but a conservative who, who understands or takes tremendously seriously the power of unintended consequences of our actions especially big actions taken by big government. And John and Barry said, war is a big action taken by governments uh, and often they have consequences which are uh, not anticipated. But still uh, governments do take action. They often think they must take action. They are not, uh, Dick is not a dove. He doesn't say that the use of force is never right. 
Uh, but you should be prudent, as John said, or cautious, as Barry said. What does that mean in practice? Uh, in the works of people like Edmund Burke and Michael Oakeshott, who were associated with European conservatism, the, the policy injunction or teaching is to be incremental in your approach. Don't do a big thing right away. Test the waters, see what happens, get some feedback, see, then take to the next step. Learn as you go along. Don't act on the basis of pre-existing assumptions of what the adversary will do if you take action against him. Uh, war is full of uncertainties. Uh, as the previous panel pointed out, there are uncertainties uh, that arise as a result of the limits of the intelligence process pre-war. There are limits on intelligence during war due to the uh, fog of, of war. Uh, so you must be empirical. You must try things out step by step and go through in war. Dick, I remember as an undergraduate listening to you give a lecture on nuclear war. So people think nuclear war is a matter of physics and it can all be calculated. Nonsense, you said. Look at all the organizational uncertainties. Look at all the physical uncertainties. Even nuclear war is very uh, hard to predict. And in your lecture, Dick, at Swamas on Clausewitz, I think I'm correct in remembering a U.S. saying that, the, or my memory was that the, your favorite part of Clausewitz was his discussion of the culminating point of victory. As you enter into a war, war will take you along and make you do more and more, but you should watch what's going on in the war and know when to stop or even to pull back. Again, this is only can be done if you don't jump in with both feet at the beginning, if you don't uh, do what is usually thought of as the Napoleonic dictum, which is audacity and decisive action at the outset, which is often the propensity of many military, uniformed military planners, Japanese, American, and otherwise. So Dick, I think you are a, a principled intellectual conservative whose conservatism gives us uh, actionable advice about how to uh, deal with our adversaries if force needs to be used. End of part one. Part two, what's the strengths and weaknesses of a conservative approach? A conservative approach allows you to learn as you go along, allows you to adjust your policies, allows you to take into account the realities of your environment and your adversary, realities that you must be cognizant of. You can't, uh, you're trying to impose your will, but you may not be able to. That assumes that you can learn about what's going on and take advantage of it. You can learn to your advantage. But the book, Dick, that you wrote that had the biggest impact on me was about how this approach failed. This, of course, is your book, uh, The Irony of Vietnam, The System Worked, which you co-authored with Les Kelb. Sam once told me that you really did all the serious intellectual research and analysis in that book, which I, I believe wholeheartedly. And the argument of the book, which seems uh, counterintuitive to many people, is that the American political military system worked in Vietnam. And you were careful in how you made that argument. It worked in two specific ways. The military and the intelligence community provided accurate assessments of the nature of the adversary and of our progress or lack of progress in fighting the war. We weren't deluded. We didn't fool ourselves into thinking uh, the adversary was different from what it was or that we were doing better than it did. And we carefully managed the risks of escalation. People still have the memories of Korean, uh, Chinese intervention in Korea, the near war we had with the Soviet Union in Korea. And the war was carefully managed despite the fact that it's a killing machine, uh, which does, does uh, many brutal things. It was carefully managed and escalation of the war uh, to drag in China or the Soviet Union was avoided. And yet, as we all know, we lost the war in Vietnam. John and Barry argued that's because we tried an experiment in social engineering, which we clearly did and which clearly did not work out. But there's another military reason why we lost the war. We did fight the war incrementally. We didn't put in as many troops as we could at the beginning. We brought in 50,000 first, uh, the 173rd Airborne and the Marine Brigade, then we escalated it. This was Johnson's way of managing the political costs of intervention, didn't work, but he did intervene incrementally. And we won all the initial battles. John is quite correct. The, the, uh, the, the, the first Air Cavalry, the first Cavalry Division Air Mobile uh, annihilated the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese opposition. 
but the incremental strategy failed because the enemy learned faster and better than we did. Proceeding incrementally gives the other side time to learn and adjust as well. The reason why military planners advocate surprise and audacity and, and Clausewitz advocates the maximum use of force early in the conflict is because it reduces the ability of the adversary to respond, react to, and devise ways of defeating it. So the strategy, uh, a conservative incremental strategy for the use of force uh, often has many advantages, uh, but like every other strategic approach, uh, is not perfect. Uh, and the second part. What does this tell us, or uh, what does this at least ask us to think about with regard to China? If, if there are clashes uh, with China that involve the use of force, as could happen, what's the proper approach? The conservative approach, Dick, is proceed cautiously and incrementally. Don't leap in with both feet. Do the minimum amount that's necessary. See if that's enough. If it's not, maybe do more, maybe do differently. Watch and, watch and learn and calibrate your actions with, respect, with regard to what the adversary does. Uh, okay, here's the question. Is this an appropriate strategy for dealing with China? Does an incremental cautious limited uh, uh, war strategy with regard to China play to China's strengths or to American strengths? I honestly don't know the answer to that question. The alternative is to uh, act decisively at the beginning of a conflict, take advantage perhaps of the fact that China faces even more uncertainties in war than the United States does. If force is used by the Chinese, They'll be using weapons that have never been, that they own, that they have never been tested in combat. They'll be using combat forces, in particular the Air Force and the Navy, which have never fought in modern war. Maybe learning will help the Chinese more than it will help us. On the other hand, as uh, Dick, uh, uh, Barry, and John have suggested, the political character of the American political system suggests that a war which appears to be a war fought by the United States before it was absolutely necessary for the United States to use maximum force may not generate popular support. The genius of Abraham Lincoln, the genius of uh, 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 Franklin Roosevelt was to wait until the adversary made the mistaken step of attacking us decisively. And because a united America is best likely to prevail in the conflict, uh, maybe it's best for us to suffer the defeats that, we, uh, that are the result of initial restraint and then go on to fight united. Uh, I, I am usually understood as being as a hawk and I can see why that's so. But at this moment in time, I am genuinely searching for guidance from your work stick and from others about how to deal with the possibilities uh, that now are unfortunately too real. Thank you. Okay, so our, our last speaker is, uh, is uh, Scott Sagan, who I no longer see on my screen for some reason. Uh, it's a wonder of Zoom. Uh, I assume he, okay, you're still here. Thank you, Scott. And uh, I, I think I may have mentioned it before, but I just want to, uh, I'll double track it and say that uh, Scott has been an important advisor to Joint Chiefs of Staff and to our weapons labs, in addition to uh, having cutting edge writings on uh, the implications of a, a world with states with nuclear weapons. So over to you, Scott. Thank you. I, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I met Dick in 1981 uh, when I was a pre-doctoral fellow at Brookings. And it was an extraordinary place at the time with Dick Betts and John Steinbrunner, Jan Nolan, Bruce Blair, um, the, 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 the last three who, of whom are, are deceased now. Uh, but it was Dick who not just led the coffee tables every day where we talked about contemporary issues, it was Dick who was actually the most detailed commentator on the younger people's work. And I thought at the time, you know, that's perhaps that's part of his job and maybe it's because I was writing about Pearl Harbor and he was interested in, in surprise. But I later be, be 
got a much better sense of that that's because to the court, Dick really wants to help the next generation understand the problems uh, of security studies. And I think if Google had not a citation index, but an acknowledgments index, that the number of citations, that, uh, the number of times that Dick Betts is thanked for providing really helpful comments to people, he'd be just soaring uh, off the charts. I wanted to talk about three different um, pieces of work that I know were very influential to me. Um, the first is the surprise attack book. And we talked about it a lot in the last session. So I just make one really interesting um, observation uh, about it, which is how widely, not how widely cited it is, but how diversely cited it is. Uh, Dick's argument that um, surprises often occur not because of lack of warning, uh, but because the actions that you might take in response to warning, you're concerned about taking them because that might actually trigger the other side to do what it is that you fear they might do, has had uh, impacts not just in security studies, but I just looking at Google Scholar the other day, I noticed that it's influential in business studies, Journal of Project Management, cites his, his work. Uh, it's, in, it's influential in criminology, uh, cited in a work on the disruption of international crime, an analysis of legal and non-legal strategies. And it's even cited in the Journal of Contingencies and Crisis Management in an article on Hurricane Katrina and the problems about response. So I think that one thing that Dick has done is not just be influenced on security studies, but on a wider set of, of interests. The second book that uh, it's probably the one that's most influential on me was the Nuclear Blackmail and Nuclear Balance. That has been cited actually more often, 442 times, than the Surprise Attack book, which is close behind that. Um, and I do note that it's mostly in security studies uh, and nuclear studies, as you would imagine. Uh, there is one citation in uh, in a book about bribery and blackmail. So uh, so people who are interested in that aspect of the work are, are also there. But to me, what I learned from Dick's really special qualities in this book is that um, it's not just generous, generous with his time. He is um, remarkably um, careful and painstaking in his attention to detail and his willingness to come to conclusions that he didn't originally have. At the time when Dick was writing this in the 80s, it was very commonplace for people to argue that uh, nuclear weapons uh, didn't, uh, or the nuclear balance didn't matter during the Cuban Missile Crisis. It was a conventional balance. It was all about US resolve um, locally. And what Dick pointed out, I think, was that um, in order to understand this, you should not be biased by your contemporary sense of what policy should be, but actually look at the documents really, really carefully. Um, I don't think it was Dick. I think it was uh, Mark Trattenberg who first started looking at the failure for, of the Soviets to um, alert during the uh, and to, to mobilize during the Cuban Missile Crisis as evidence that the American uh, balance that is uh, the threats to preempt uh, existed, but Dick analyzed that much more effectively than others. But it was Dick, I think, who first, and I just looked this up, and I, I must acknowledge, I thought I knew this case extraordinarily well, but I had forgotten this, that Robert McNamara uh, recommended in the XCOM, as Dick points out, that the United States threatened to preempt against the Soviet Union quotes, if there's ever any indicator that they, the missiles in Cuba, are about to be launched against this country, we will respond with uh, not just against Cuba, but we will respond directly against the Soviet Union with a full nuclear strike. That's not, Dick points out, the kind of comment of someone who thought that US nuclear superiority didn't matter. Dick, in the book, does note at one point that one of the top decision makers in the Cuban Missile Crisis was later asked whether US nuclear superiority had anything to do with the outcome. He answered, hell no. Asked whether he would have been comfortable going through the crisis if the nuclear balance had been reversed. He, repri he replied, hell no. 
Uh, Dick notes in footnote 116, when I asked the individual about the story, he did not recall it or deny it, but he again downplayed the significance of the nuclear balance at the time. So I hope today, many years later, Dick, you'll be able to say who that individual uh, was. But what was makes this book- America. That's what I suspected. What, what I thought was so valuable about this book was not just the detail of analyzing what people said at the time rather than what they said later, it said he also has a, a, a long section called the myth of the golden age that reminds strategists on the theme that I think other people have mentioned about what a messy and difficult to control process this is. Dick writes, what denizen of the Washington strategic dinner seminar circuit has not at some time beheld a one time or would be insider with a wistful glint in his eye recalling with a shake of the head, the good old days when the United States could have quotes, clean the Russians clock. As Colin Gray writes, Sack probably could have won World War III at any time from the early 1950s until the mid 1960s at very little cost and direct damage to US society. And Dick really scolds the strategic studies community for holding such views. In reality, he writes, the situation in the two decades after 1945 were never as rosy as those nostalgic for it seemed to think, because there was never a time when leaders were confident that the United States could wage nuclear war successfully, that is, parry and repel a Soviet attack in Europe while restricting damage to the West to acceptable levels. And I would just note that that's a lesson that we really need to learn again today. I think there is a new generation of young hawks in the nuclear field, who, whether they're talking about um, China or North Korea, do have a tendency to, to think about war in that way and to not understand how uncertainty and things going wrong uh, can um, screw up the best laid plans. And here I want to just cite one last piece of, uh, of work of Dick Betts, which is his Foreign Affairs 2018 article, The President and the Bomb. Um, this piece came out of a workshop that Dick gathered uh, together a group of people, political scientists like me, Barry, uh, Peter Fever, who was on earlier, uh, operations researcher like Bruce Blair, lawyers like Eric Saltzman and Matt Waxman. And he and Matt produced afterwards, I think a superb analysis, arguing that the United States should change uh, the chain of command so that the president doesn't have sole authority to use nuclear weapons if it's not in a response to a nuclear uh, attack on the United States and that we should add the uh, secretary of defense and the attorney general, the secretary of defense to make sure that the scenario is well understood and the attorney general to make sure that the response would be legal. And here I just want to note on reflection two other uh, issues. One is it's not clear, and I think Matt actually agrees with me on this now, um, that Congress could actually impose that new chain of command. It might be unconstitutional, and therefore the only way to do this, I think, would be if the president decided he or she wanted to tie his or her own hands by having um, a expanded uh, command authority in the chain of command. But the one other thing that I think needs to be done that's different from what um, Dick proposed in that is that rather than having the attorney general, who I think frankly is the senior legal advisor, but is not a specialist on war at all, very rarely, you would want to have a senior lawyer, either a JAG officer or a senior civil lawyer of the US government, and he or she should be the one who is there to try to decide whether the action taken is, is legal. And I think that's really important. I know people, when I have argued this, sometimes say, well, all the pre-planned options that exist are already legal. They've been vetted, and that's why they're in the, in the codes. That's why they're in the football. But that's only true if we have gotten the scenario right. And in war, as we all know from Dick Betts' work, that's rarely the case. 
And therefore, it's very important, whether we're talking about North Korea or something in the Taiwan Straits or Estonia, that since we can't anticipate all the scenarios ahead of time, we need to have a legal advisor also saying whether our response, conventional or nuclear, is actually legal at the time. That should not be decided solely by the president, who may not know. So I thank you, Dick, for all your work and for that continued work in 2018. Well, th thanks a lot to our panelists. Um, tremendously uh, constructive and insightful talks. And uh, Scott just finished up and I wanted to share a, a, a story with Scott, a very brief one that uh, recently at one of our Saltzman lunches, uh, we started to talk about uh, nuclear command and control. And then we started to talk about the football and then someone talked about permissive action links. And by the end of the conversation, everyone was scared out of their wits about uh, the way things uh, work in this realm. And uh, I got, I started to get depressed. The lunches are supposed to be fun. And I said, who invited Scott Sagan? So, uh, <laughs> so um, uh, there are a tremendous number of issues out there. And, and Steve, you know, touched on issues that are near and dear to my heart. And um, I, I, uh, I want to tie it into the tail end of the last session, which I joined after teaching all day, um, and maybe start start the conversation and open up to the audience for questions, but start the conversation by asking the panel in general, but also Steve, uh, given John Mearsheimer's point about the giant killing machine of the US military, it appears that some of our potential adversaries recognize John's point, and that is why they pursue some of their uh, uh, more uh, aggravating uh, military political maneuvers with forces that are below the military level, uh, with coast guards and maritime militia in the case of China, um, knowing that, you know, the United States doesn't really want a CNN moment where a, a U.S. destroyer kills, you know, 50 ships of fishermen with rifles. Um, and Dick is here, so we don't have to think about, we don't have, you know, we, don't, we shouldn't talk about what would Dick Betts say, because we can just ask Dick Betts. You know, what's the, what's the solution to that problem for the United States? Should the United States just not get involved in those lower level gray zone uh, problems because we have a giant killing machine that's inappropriate for it? Or should, should the United States be developing a much more di diverse set of, uh, of militarized capabilities that can respond at different levels of violence to uh, challenges from in, in these gray zones. I'll, I'll respond quickly because I'm more interested in hearing Dick's views and uh, the views of the other panelists. Uh, there is a well-developed strand of security studies in the United States, which argues that military instruments can be used not simply for inflicting mass damage, but for the purposes of signaling and deterrence. Uh, and the limited, use, the limited use of force was a major issue of study in the uh, United States academic world for 30 or 40 years uh, because military force was seen as useful of, uh, short of the massive destruction of the homeland of, of the adversary. Whether or not that academic view has been borne out by experience and uh, data is an, is an interesting question. I am uh, struck by how poorly other states receive signals that we deliver by military instruments, which we think are very clear, uh, but which in fact, when you look at the other side's interpretation of them are not clear. Uh, so I'm more on the side that military force uh, is less useful for signaling and bargaining and more useful for destroying uh, adversary capability. On the other hand, in these gray zone kinds of uh, activities, you're referring to Chinese maritime militia and uh, Iranian activities, uh, the United States currently thinks it needs more gray zone capability of its own. As you know, Tom, much better than I, the U.S. Coast Guard is increasing its, uh, its uh, deployments to the Western Pacific and also increasing the armaments on Coast Guard ships. Uh, and I guess my observation is a classic shelling observation. The United States is adopting or is employing gray zone capabilities which have the virtue and the vice of the threat that leaves something to chance. Uh, they, they are uh, 
possibly, uh, they could possibly lead to escalation, but they are valuable from a deterrence point of view, precisely because uh, there, there is the danger of escalation. They are costly signals. They are signals uh, that create the perspective in the adversary's mind that you are willing to take risks and therefore you are serious. Uh, I think the United States is doing that now. I think that's probably the appropriate step to take. Uh, the alternative is to withdraw uh, and to fight only one attack, uh, attack which is um, also has problems. So I want to avoid my own Marshall McLuhan moment by saying what Dick Betts might say while he's here. So I'll just turn it over to um, to to, uh, to Dick Betts and say, you know, how, how do you uh, think we should address that? Because one retired Coast Guard person that I spoke with said, if you're going to use the Coast Guard in the Western Pacific, you better triple our budget or legalize cocaine because we can't do what we're currently tasked to do. Um, and and uh, and take that 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 on as well. Yeah, these are all uh, good questions and fair questions, and several of them, unfortunately, are ones uh, because they're good questions that I don't have a satisfactory answer to, especially what to do about China. And let's not even get into Afghanistan uh, on that score. But uh, I'd say, uh, in regard to the general question. Uh, the default option should be um, abstention. In other words, the burden of proof should be on the use of force uh, with the, the rationale that's convincing for, uh, for, for how it'll be effective. Um, the question about whether partial or incremental strategies do or don't make sense, uh, I think this uh, depends a lot on the specific contingency. Um, there's a case, uh, especially in regard to uh, uh, certain types of potential conflicts where the argument for, as it were, all or nothing uh, is uh, reasonable strategically and politically. Uh, and when it comes to the use of force, I think that's more often the case than not. Although then that puts a, an extra burden of proof on whether, uh, uh, uses of large doses of force will or won't be politically counterproductive. Um, I use as one of the epigraphs to my last book, uh, the line from Clausewitz about uh, how uh, a short jump is easier than a long one, but no one wanting to get across a wide ditch would begin by jumping halfway. Um, the problem is uh, the risks involved. Uh, and incrementalism makes great sense for many, uh, and in some political systems, most problems in politics. Um, so in one of my classes, I've assigned the old classic uh, article by uh, Charles Lindblom on the science of muddling through, which is in large part an argument for incrementalism, experimentation, compromise, and so on. Uh, and uh, as a general model for policy making in complex democratic systems, I'd argue that uh, most often makes sense. And then I make the class then consider the uh, example of Vietnam policy where the process of incrementalism uh, proved disastrous. Figuring out which type of problem um, is really susceptible to either approach all or nothing or incrementalism is the is the first strategic question, I think. Uh, it depends a lot on whether the stakes are divisible and clearly susceptible to compromise or not. And deciding who rules, who controls the government rarely is. Um, just a couple other uh, words. Uh, Steve mentioned as an aside the a uh, book with uh, Les Gelb on the irony of Vietnam. I would like to take great credit for that <clears throat> uh, since it's uh, uh, been more widely read probably than uh, any other book I have my name on, but uh, it is not true that uh, I was responsible for the bulk of it. Uh, the conception was Les's and he wrote about two thirds of it. Uh, so uh, that should be clear for the record. But uh, <clears throat> I think Steve raised 
the biggest question for strategists now, and that is what about China? And as awful a cop-out as it sounds, honesty requires my saying that I don't believe there is a satisfactory answer. There will have to be an answer and it will be an unsatisfactory answer. Um, but in my view, uh, any of the main options have uh, excessive costs and risks. Uh, and we could get into details in a longer discussion offline, I think. Uh, but uh, any greater moves are going to be so costly that, of course, we don't make those moves. We continue trying to split the difference and have it both ways. <laughs> and may be able to continue doing so for a long time. Uh, and of course, Tom, your views on this would be more informed and more interesting than mine, but those are my uh, instincts and why I'm so pessimistic about finding the right, uh, the right answer. I am skeptical about the use of military forces for psychological signaling purposes for a number of reasons. Um, but uh, the, the critical question uh, now uh, in regard to China is also complicated by, uh, if not an unprecedented, a very unusual situation in modern times. And that is the extent to which uh, economic conflict and competition uh, has displaced or taken precedence over uh, military competition in the what I would call new cold war and you would adamantly I gather uh, argue is not but whatever terminology we use uh, that's something uh, that's going to play out uh, very soon at least in terms of the clarity of uh, how much leverage the United States has over the confrontation uh, and that will in a way play out separately from the military dimension, but they're obviously linked. Uh, the critical question though is Taiwan, since it seems to me at least the status quo there may be sustainable for quite a while, but is not indefinitely sustainable. And I can't figure out a policy and strategy on Taiwan that gives me any confidence. So I look to you to tell me I'm too much of a pessimist. Well, I'm not going to do it today. That's my day job, and this is your festival. Um, so uh, what I will say is that uh, in 1999 to 2000, uh, Harry Harding, uh, Dick Betts, and I ran a China security workshop at the Council on Foreign Relations, one of those multi-meeting uh, events with a panel of experts, some retired admirals, things like that. Um, and I learned a lot at, at those meetings, but I, the most I learned at those meetings were, were from Dick. And I just remember at the first meeting when Harry Harding uh, introduced our, our workshop to the group, he said, uh, uh, this is not just any Tom, Dick and Harry. Um, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> that, that always stuck with me. But in the process, Dick and I wrote something together and I rarely write with anyone else, uh, probably because I'm intolerable. Uh, but I wrote with Jack, I see Jack up there, I wrote with Jack once, and I wrote with Dick once, and one of my students once, uh, but we co-authored something, and I learned so much in that process, and I, I revisited that article this morning uh, before my first class, and the first paragraph says, uh, it's the post-Cold War world is what John calls a unipolar moment. Uh, the United States is going to get involved in a lot of small conflicts with countries like Iraq, um, uh, but at the end of the day, when the dust settles, it's going to be about the United States and China. And it's going to be about strategic competition with a great power with nuclear weapons. And we're going to have to return to the lessons of great power competition. Um, so I think that held up pretty well. And the, the thing that stuck with me about working with Dick on this is that, you know, I, I was, you know, steeped in grad school at Columbia in IR theory. And I was, I spent a tremendous amount of my time making sure I knew exactly where all the hairs were split between the various theoretical schools and all that other stuff. And I had been a history major in college. And I spent a lot of time thinking about history um, before. And we're writing this thing and we're thinking, you know, China's, you know, a rising power. It's going to rub up against its neighbors in different ways. And how could it go wrong? You know, what, what kind of examples we have, and, and this stuck with me, and I've used it in so many talks, and it was Dick's idea, not mine. He said, you know, we don't have to look further than the United States. 
if, if China rises its, in, in its region as badly as the United States rose in its region, we're in for really big trouble in East Asia. You know, the Spanish-American War and all that, you know, and, and uh, I said, of course, you know, it all clicked. And uh, that became a, a takeaway from that article that I've used on multiple occasions, because sometimes when I say that, you know, China's got all these sovereignty disputes, it's rising, it has unsettled historical issues with its neighbors, uh, someone will raise a hand and say, you know, you're being a culturalist, you're being anti-Chinese uh, by saying China is the source of all these problems. And I say, no, no, I, I'll be fair. If China behaves as badly as the United States, we're screwed. And Dick taught me that that, that nice takeaway line for uh, presentations, and I, I'm grateful to him for that. Uh, I, I don't see, I see a comment from- Peter Tom. Clement's got his hand up. I'm sorry? Oh, Peter, go ahead, Peter. Thank you. Um, first, thank What a fabulous set of presentations. Uh, you make me want to be a student again. I tell my students all the time, I am a student, never ending, but this was fabulous. So thank you all for a really stimulating series of talks. I want to introduce cyber into the mix. So I'm going to ask a horribly big question. Uh, to what extent do you think the reality of now having a cyber battlefield space has altered all of these dynamics you've been talking about in terms of international conflict? I can take a crack at it, but other people I'm sure know more about it. Peter, I'm gonna base my remarks on studies that we've conducted which review current Russian uh, discussions of cyber literature and also Chinese uh, discussions. The general takeaway is that uh, from their perspective, Cyber is one more instrument of state power, which has to be integrated into the other instruments of state power and to produce a new form of combined arms warfare uh, in which not the information warfare, manipulation of the information which is available to the adversary is, the cru is crucial in the, in the phases before war and in the initial phases of war and may even be dominant uh, th uh, throughout uh, conflict thereafter. But the one way in which they approach the problem, which I think is very different from the way in which we do it, is they do not look at cyber warfare and political warfare or information warfare as separate. It's, it's all one. Mm -hmm. It's all about changing what's up inside people's heads. And you can do that with ones and zeros, or you can do that with military action, or you can do it with classical propaganda, or you can do it with classical political action. I believe that China and Russia have done much more serious theoretical work about how to bring to bear the use of information for the pr purposes of um, uh, making the adversary behave in the way that you want to than we have. We, we've tended to look at it from a technical point of view. How do we write better code? How do we protect our software? Whereas the, our adversaries, I think, have uh, adopted a, a more holistic approach. That said, uh, on the American side, there is a recent brilliant dissertation by a US uh, Army Major Sally White, who served uh, in Cyber Command, NSA, and she says the tendency of the American government is to militarize cyber conflict, to make cyber the tool of the battlefield commander. Mm -hmm. For example, in the Army, she says it's the brigade level commander, which now dictates what the nature of the cyber requirements and operations that he or she needs. Uh, this has some strengths, obviously, but also has some weaknesses. Um, and so I'm right now, I'm a little bit concerned that we may be improving our cyber cap warfare capabilities, but looking at it excessively technically and looking at it excessively militarily. I'm, I'm sure other people know much more about this than I do. I'd like to make a comment on, on cyber. Um, here, I think um, most people would argue that there is a, um, a mixed view that is um, one of the biggest problems is that is identification of where the attack comes from if it is actually a, an attack that has uh, extremely uh, negative military effects. Um, most people I think would also argue that eventually you can, uh, you may be able to identify it, but it takes time. With kinetic operations, you usually know immediately who did, did something. And the fact that it takes time may mean domestically the political uh, intensity of needing to respond might be less and might actually call for a more 
it might actually produce a more reasonable uh, response. Um, it is often said that revenge is the dish best tasted cold. I'm not sure if that's true about uh, Sicilian mafia people, but I do know that, that for most people, revenge and responding really harshly is something that happens really quickly. And if it takes time to figure out who did the cyber attack, it may actually make for a more uh, prudent response. Last point here is that um, one of the things that was not well noticed in the Trump administration's nuclear posture review is that they reversed earlier positions that the United States would not use nuclear weapons um, if someone attacked us um, uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, that we would respond conventionally if someone attacked us with weapons of other weapons of mass destruction other than uh, nuclear weapons. They reversed that and, and included a, um, an exception for cyber, that is if there's a non-strategic attack that had uh, massive consequences. I think that's um, going to be reviewed again because I think it's probably illegal. Uh, if there's a cyber attack, even one that kills lots of Americans, we are still obligated to respond following the principle of precaution in a manner that does not deliberately kill civilians. We would have to respond conventionally or with a more proportional response. So to me, um, we did what we often do in this area, uh, make a blunt threat uh, when it actually may be something that would be illegal and just as bad would probably be a really stupid thing to do. So, so Scott, while you're while you're on this subject and uh, and it's been raised, I wanted to ask you something that's come up in our lunch meetings uh, at Saltzman uh, fairly frequently, which is uh, forget cyber as a military tool for a moment. You know, cyber attacks on forward deployed forces and C four ISR and things like that, and think about cyber attacks on society yes. um, against infrastructure, et cetera. Right. How close does that get to? you know, what we used to theorize about mutually assured destruction in a nuclear world. And could smaller powers become sufficient cyber powers that they would have the equivalent of a credible second strike able to level unacceptable damage with all the terms correctly defined, uh, the ability to level unacceptable damage against the United States um, uh, after the US has attacked it and therefore create the, uh, the equivalent of a nuclear mutually assured destruction uh, situation. Yeah, I, I, I think that's um, unlikely, Tom. It all depends obviously on you know, what you think is unacceptable, but attacks on infrastructure, even if it's uh, hospitals, uh, could produce damage, but nothing like the damage that you would have uh, in a, a nuclear conflict. Um, so I, I think it's a serious problem, a serious problem with respect to um, the systems of traffic, serious problem with systems of healthcare and with nuclear power plants. But individual attacks against them would produce localized and horrific damage. And there should, in my judgment, be a military response but it's not the same as the kind of assured destruction that we were looking at during the Cold War. How about others? I don't have an answer to this. It's a real question. I know I'm an academic, but that was a real question. I don't have an answer to it. So, um, uh, so what about Dick and Barry and John? What do you think about cyber that way? What's the difference between severe offensive capabilities on two sides that can't be shut off in a preemption and uh, both sides having nuclear capabilities? That can do the, to, to do the damage. Well, I don't know, and I've never <clears throat> been confident that I uh, understand enough about technology to to make very uh, uh, informed judgments on any of this. But uh, it seems to me that even among experts, uh, we really don't know enough about the basic question that is a very recent question to make the important judgments, and that is. Uh, the fact that in really in a single generation, modern society has become utterly dependent on uh, the cyber world, on the integrity of the internet. Uh, and I'm not sure we really understand. I guess uh, people could simulate and IDA could uh, develop models and so on, and maybe they have, uh, but I'm not sure that we uh, really have a sense 
of the scale of collapse or destruction that various degrees or some near total interruption of cybersecurity uh, could create. Uh, people talk vaguely, at least on the outside of that world, uh, what I hear about a cyber Pearl Harbor and disagree about whether it is or isn't possible. Uh, but my impression is there uh, is not a consensus on, uh, on that basic question. Barry, you, you, I saw your hand go up before. Yeah, um, I share Dick's um, feelings of inadequate understanding of what it is we're talking about. And I hate feigning cyber expertise. There, there's one observation that keeps coming back to me, which I think is relevant. Um, and that is that, as Dick pointed out, this cyberspace grew, or in fact was constructed by humans, largely during the age of unipolarity and liberal hegemony. And I mean that not just in a power sense, but in the sense of what was in people's minds. Uh, this world was constructed under the, the operating premise that free everything, free information, free movement of people, free movement of ideas, free, 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 that this was, this, this was part constructed under the guy under under the rubric of the liberal world order and, and those premises affect everything about the way cyberspace was constructed if you do ask yourself the question would cyberspace have been constructed the way it exists had we tried to construct it in 1975 i think the answer is is no you in a cold war situation you would not have constructed this in that way so it seems to me while it's you know, in the short term, because of the way it was constructed and the way it exists today, one has to try and come up with some at least working answers to your questions about the system as it is. Is the system as it is really a system we're going to keep? Right now, there's powerful interest in keeping the system the way it is because it's cheap, right? The way it is, it's cheap, right? And it's extremely efficient. So, for example, you know, banks, companies, whatever, they do much less in the security realm than they should because the more they do, the more expensive it is. The customer interface becomes more and more unwieldy, the more security is cranked into it. We've all experienced in our own life with dual factor authentication and everything else, right? So while it's certainly worth doing to ask these questions about, you know, tit for tat under the present system and where are your areas of vulnerability, I do think we have to step back from this and ask ourselves the question that, you know, if you believe that you know, you're back in a world of great power competition, whatever you're going to call it, Cold War, multipolarity, jockeying for power, whatever, is the, is the system that we built a system that we really want to continue to live with? And if it's not, let's try and figure out what a different system would look like and what it would cost and who we're going to charge to build it. John, do you have anything to add? No, not on cyber. Uh, I think all the points I would have made have been made, but I want to return to our earlier discussion and just put two observations on the table. When I gave my presentation, I said that the United States had specialized in unfair fights during the unipolar moment. And even during the Cold War, we went to great lengths whenever we got into a fight to make sure or maximize the prospects that it would be an unfair fight. It's Bambi versus Godzilla, where we are Godzilla. It's very important to understand that with regard to the rise of China and the possibility of a conflict in the South China Sea over Taiwan, the East China Sea, we're talking about a fair fight. And this has huge implications, right? It's just, when you talk about going to war against China, it's fundamentally different than going to war uh, in a place like Iraq or Afghanistan. And I think people want to be well aware of that. The second point I would make, as I said, with regard to me and Dick, that we came of age. We both graduated from high school in 1965, right before we graduated on March 8th, 1965, the Marines landed at Da Nang, right? And our worldviews were shaped in profound ways by Vietnam. It could be no other way. We have a bevy of young security scholars today and middle-aged security scholars today who came of age in the unipolar moment. And what really 
surprises me, and it shouldn't, when I talk to young people today is a little understanding they have of nuclear weapons and nuclear escalation and what nuclear war would involve. For the old dogs on this panel, and this includes virtually everybody, we did all sorts of studies during the Cold War about what a nuclear war would look like and so forth and so on. We knew the whole uh, gamut of arguments and we understand, understood just how dangerous it is. But when you listen to people talk today about how we would fight a war over Taiwan, you have no sense that they understand the dynamics of inadvertent escalation, which of course Barry has written about. Uh, you have no sense that they just uh, understand how horrible it would be and how careful we have to be because we're talking about two countries that are gonna be armed to the teeth with conventional weapons and those conventional weapons are gonna be interspersed with nuclear weapons. And uh, I worry because I think the possibility of war is greater in a US-China competition because those wars would be in the water or over Taiwan rather than on the central front. And yet many of the people who I think will be in charge don't give me a lot of confidence that they understand uh, the dynamics of, of warfare, uh, especially in the nuclear age. And it's because they're prisoners of the world that they grew up in, which was the unipolar moment, which was a completely different world than the world that we're now moving into. Yeah, I, I agree with you, John. And that's, you know, the article that Dick and I wrote in 2000 uh, uh, makes this point that that uh, even back then when China was a lot weaker than it is now in comparison to the United States, we were talking about fighting right up against China. So you were putting China in a position to be a, a, a real competitor even then. And now you add 20 years to it. I still think the United States militarily much more powerful than China, but not if you, not if you want to fight right in China's face, you know, over something as close to China as Taiwan. If, if someone asked me once uh, recently, do you, are you worried about Chinese amphibious landing capabilities? And I said, I am if they're going to land on Taiwan. I'm not, I'm not worried about them if they're going to try to land in Puerto Rico. Um, but, you know, we're talking about conflicts that are really close to China. And uh, that was always the case that that was a, a challenging, dangerous operation. And now it's, it's much more so. So I, I take your point. But Tom, in, in yeah. your case, what I don't understand is if you foresaw all this potential trouble with China, why weren't you standing on the rooftops screaming loudly and clearly that we should abandon engagement with China and we should work hard to slow down Chinese economic and military growth earlier rather than later. I don't think that I don't think that our overall strategy towards China and concern about uh, our deterrent posture vis-a-vis uh, -vis Taiwan are necessarily at odds with each other. I know you think my that. Point is, my point is, yeah. Tom, we helped turn China into a potential com peer competitor. Yes, we did. Through po the policy of engagement, which you advocated. How could a good strategist like you possibly favor policies that turn China into a potential peer competitor. The policy of engagement, which is a, a shorthand uh, that's been gotten into American domestic discussions is supposed to be a, a policy of accommodation and giving China what it wants. Uh, the policy that the United States actually had for decades was competing with China in certain areas like the military area while engaging them economically and diplomatically. I personally think that that strategy if you look at the history, going back to what you know, Dick Betts would remind me of in 2000, look at the history of rising powers. I think US strategy towards China with the competitive pieces in place, which are becoming more pronounced and more difficult to manage has been tremendously successful. So I reject the general take in Washington that we need to totally rewrite our China policy because it has been a failure. Um, there's always been a military competitive piece. There's been a technology competitive piece that's getting uh, to the to the four and what's really new is the 5G AI uh, pieces. But you know, look at my foreign affairs article. I don't want to I don't want to lay out the whole thing. Um, I believe in strategic competition with China. I think if we try to harm the Chinese economy and we try to keep the Chinese economy down, we're going to weaken ourselves in the area where the United States has the biggest strategic advantage over China, and that's allies and partners. 
Uh, they've got a small rogues gallery of, of, of partners. We've got 60 plus allies and partners and none of those allies and partners wanna go down the route that we went with the Soviet Union in the 50s, isolating our economies from them and trying to harm the Chinese economy. Uh, we will lose them all and we will end up weaker and not stronger in the process. I understand the logic of your argument, which is anything that makes China stronger is dangerous to us, but I don't see it in that zero sum way. And um, I don't think our allies do. So even if you took a full zero sum view of US-China relations, I think it would be a, a, a negative net outcome if we adopted a decoupling full scale assault on the Chinese economy because we would lose our greatest advantage in our struggle with China, which is uh, our ability to use allies and partners to our advantage, both in terms of our basing and our, and, and our ability to operate around China and just in general around the world. And I still think we have a huge upper hand over China in terms of net national ca capacity and we should preserve that. And one of, those, one of those things that gives us a huge advantage you know, are those allies and partners who simply don't want a Cold War. So. Uh, it's a different world than 1950. Um, but Jack Snyder has his hand up. I don't, I don't want to get into a sustained debate about my work because it's uh, Dick's show. But Dick and, I, Dick and I did write about this then. Uh, we also talked about why we didn't want to uh, do what you're suggesting, John, um, about why we didn't want to go down that road. Um, that article, I think, uh, Dick, I, I hadn't looked at it in ages. So I think it's held up pretty well. So uh, Jack, go ahead. So believe it or not, I learned international political economy sitting at the feet of John Mearsheimer when we were postdocs together at uh, the Olin Institute and uh, in the very early 80s. And John explained to me how uh, if you wanna understand power, you need to understand IPE. And that's why we had to go to lunch with Joe Grieco at the Harvard Business School once a week to eat the, the rubbery roast beef and talk about the great books of IPE, especially Bob Gilpin's War and Change, uh, which uh, marvelously integrates the power aspects of economics and military conquest and rivalry. And uh, I think that um, we were meeting at about the time of culminating victory of the United States over the Soviet Union in the Cold War. And it was a victory that in my view was almost entirely won by economics with a little bit of technological and uh, strategic uh, spin-off from what was basically the economic story. And I guess my question is, um, given, so Clausewitz doesn't tell us very much about uh, the economic setting of military competition. Gilpin tells us a lot but it's not entirely clear how the Gilpin conceptual framework directly maps onto the US Chinese strategic competition of the moment. But uh, reading Tom's article this morning, uh, I kept thinking, you know, we need to have the Gilpin of 2021 to show us how to integrate the economic aspect of our competition with the larger strategic and technological setting. And uh, I, I'm, I'm not seeing that uh, synthesis myself. Uh, so a lot of what Tom says in the article, it goes uh, as, as I read it, um, talks about the economic and technical competition as if it can be fought separately from the military struggle. But I took that as a kind of, uh, you know, short article uh, discussion of convenience separating out a piece. 
And uh, so my question is, do, do we have a Clausewitz or a Gilpin that integrates these two pieces of grand strategy for today? Well, one thing I'd say, Jack, is that the world is different than the world that Gilpin was writing about, uh, both in all the phases of history in one key, in one key way. And there are people that you know, I, I work with on a regular basis who do try to integrate these things. But the big difference is that the form of interdependence that we have in the world now is very different from anything in the past. And it's transnational production chains. And that's why a strategy, if I adopted John's strategy now uh, and said, okay, uh, let's just try to cut off all ties to the Chinese economy, harm the Chinese economy in any way we could, you'd end up with devastating Japan, devastating South Korea, devastating Singapore, devastating the places where we have military assets in East Asia in a way that would be politically unsustainable because no products are just made in China. That, that's the end point. There's all these parts and, and, and Tom, pieces can I, can coming, I get... in, coming in from various countries. And I don't think Gilpin really deals with that. It's more of the kind of World War I arm's length trade type of situation. Um, uh, and I, I think that Tom. there are people thinking about those things. Tom. Yeah. You're going, ahead, on, you're going on and on here. <laughs> Look, Thanks, John. <laughs> I'm not arguing anything about what we should do today. My point was that 10, 15, 20 years ago, you claimed to see that China was going to be a serious military threat if it continued to grow economically and militarily. My question was, why weren't you standing on the rooftops back then saying that the United States should do whatever it can to slow down Chinese economic growth. In other words, not let it into the world. I, I understand your ready. question, John. It's, it's very clearly it. stated like you always do. It's a very clear question. You're switching, I thought, gears, I, on me. You're switching I, gears on me and talking about today and your article today. No. I don't care about your article. Okay. Today. Uh, but, but Mary Posen's got uh, a comment. So, so, so the, the article that I wrote in 2000, the article I wrote in 2001, John, said that China was already a formidable military challenger to the United States in the area we cared about, East Asia. So I, I, it was already, but I still, then and now, I don't think the answer to that is to try to cr cripple Chinese economic growth. But uh, Barry, go to you. Barry, you're muted. I'm yeah. not sure. I'm not sure I can really help this conversation because I'm not 100% sure I understand what the question John is actually asking. But I would make a different, a slightly different observation. Um, you know, I don't think it mattered very much, except in terms of timelines, about whether we were threw our arms around China and tried to integrate them in the global economy or not. Right. That mattered to timelines. It didn't matter to the ultimate outcome. Alfred McKinder told us what was going to happen. Right. Sooner or later, the greatest, greater political realities will coincide with the greater geographical realities. But if you read Alfred McKinder, McKinder is a polymath. He's talking about um, uh, he's talking about internal economies. He's talking about population. He's talking about lots of things. Right. And in a weird way, you know, tucked away in one of his many ruminations, I found I, I, I can't recall the exact words. When Richard Nixon was contemplating the opening for China and he was trying to say why he was bas he basically said it in a kind of simple way, which is like, uh, you're not going to keep that many people down forever. It's just not going to work. Right. This is Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger. These are not naive people. Right. So I put the two of these things together and I think the debate about whether or not we helped China along or not is not really the main debate. It's that debate is about when we encounter the powerful China, not when we, whether we were going to encounter the, 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 the powerful China. Right. So I, I don't know what the timeline was. You know, it would have been 20 years later, 50 years later, 40 years later. But the basic point is this was going to happen. Right. And I think you know, I don't, I don't remember the article that Tom and Dick wrote, but I think they probably could, you know, could see it. And I think, John, I know you're an admirer of McKinder, right? Uh, I, I think maybe you might agree that what we're really talking about here is how soon, not whether. And whether the United States could keep China down if it chose to do it. Well, this is the strangle of the baby of the cradle, partners. but so, so, yeah, yeah, the whole, so it's course of diplomacy. You can't really practice course of diplomacy if you're always in a full, a full court press against 
against the, 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 the But the basic point going backwards, Tom, is, is really a kind of, uh, I don't remember, what did we call, someone here, will, better historian than I will remember, what did we call the regime that governed trading with the Russians, Comic-Con or something like that? What the hell was it? Yeah, yeah, we, we Comic-Con. Yeah, Comic-Con Comic Comic so Comic Comic was on the other side. Yeah, yeah, so the basic story is, suppose you to just, as soon as the Cold War ended, say, you know, China is coming, let's defer it as long as we can. We'll just put this wall around them and that'll be fine, right? Yeah. Maybe it would have worked, maybe it wouldn't have, but at, at most it was gonna be a temporal delay. It wasn't gonna be a delay of the fact, right? You had to assume that the place was gonna keep, keep trying to operate and organize itself on Maoist principles forever, basically strangling themselves in the cradle, right? And it was clear that they were wise to that already. They had the Soviet example. Yeah, I used to say, if you want to meet a real communist, don't go to Beijing, go to Ithaca when I was at Cornell, um, because they learned that communism doesn't work in China. Um, but the... the um, um, we have to end. So oh, okay. Just... <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. I, I just wanted to, to, to clarify a citation, because uh, it came out of some of the meetings that I was with, with Steve, um, one of the insights for this article that I wrote in 2001 called Posing Problems Without Catching Up. And that was uh, at one of these conferences, all the experts were saying, China is uh, two feet tall. China can't, you know, it's a million man swim across the Taiwan Strait. And this was in the late 1990s. Um, and then an army officer stood up and said, you know, we spent two days talking about how weak China is. Do you ever notice that no one really wants to fight him over the issues we might fight him over in the US military today? And that was long before this buildup. So the point, the point I'm trying to make is that China was strong enough to spoil our whole day a long time ago. It's still strong enough to spoil our whole day. I don't think it's as strong as the United States. And I don't think the course of diplomatic approach that was best and wisest 20 years ago or today is to try to cripple China's economy for the reasons I cite. Well, you could, uh, as Clausewitz would say, uh, the discussion has now, um has now gone over the, what is it? <laughs> culminating point. Culminating point That's of it. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm a and bad so, moderator. Thanks to the panel. It was really fun and it was yes, a real honor to yes. have And we all need a short break before we reconvene at four. Thank you for a great conversation. I hate, I hate to end it. Thank I you know, very much. Thank you. So welcome everyone. Uh, I cannot believe it's already four o'clock and we're in the last panel of today. Uh, I am um, um, going to hand it off to uh, my two lovely colleagues, uh, Professor uh, Paige Fortna and Jack Snyder. Uh, you know, as I said about uh, Bob Jervis, that means those individuals don't really need an introduction, but I will give a short one nonetheless. Um, Paige Fordna is the Harold Brown Professor of US uh, Foreign and Security Policy in the Political Science Department. Um, she's the author of, um, of two amazing, two great books, uh, Does Peacekeeping Work? Shaping Belligerents, Choices After Civil War, came out in 2008 with Princeton University Press, and uh, uh, Peacetime, Ceasefire Agreements, and The Durability of Peace also came out with Princeton University Press in 2004. And we have with us uh, Jack Snyder, uh, is the Robert and Renee Balfour Professor of International Relations and Political Science Department and the Sulzman Institute. He wrote many books and the most recent one that is forthcoming that I'll highlight is Human Rights for Pragmatist Social Power in Modern Times that is coming out with Princeton University Press. Um, and the other most recent book was um, uh, Human Rights uh, Futures co-edited with, um, with Leslie Vinjamori and Stephen uh, Hopgood with Cambridge University Press in 2017. And so this is, uh, a, this is a panel where uh, we invite um, Dick's former students, friends, uh, colleagues to say a few words uh, and I will hand it off to um, Paige and Jack. Thank you very much. Thanks, Karen. Uh, thanks, everybody, for sticking with us to the final panel of the day, Tributes and Tributaries. Um, it's been a long day on Zoom, but it's been incredibly interesting. So this panel will have remarks from um, five panelists, former students and colleagues of 
skeptics who will talk for about 10 minutes each. Um, I'll moderate that part and then I'll, I'll turn it over to my colleague Jack Snyder to moderate shorter comments from a list of special guests and then we're hoping to have time. I know a lot of people have been uh, letting Ingrid know or otherwise letting us know that they have something that they'd like to say. So we wanna leave as much time for that as possible. Um, and to save time for that with the, with the permission of our panelists, I'm going to forego um, the longer introductions of all of the accolades of our storied panelists. That information is in the bios that was attached to the agenda. So you can, if you don't know any of these people, you can you can look them up um, there. And instead I'll just give a very, you know, brief sort of um, very brief on our five panelists. So we'll start with Stuart Gottlieb, who teaches here at SIPA and is a member of the Saltzman Institute and a former PhD student of Dick's. Uh, Lisa Anderson, who served as the Dean of SIPA and as President of the American University in Cairo and is our colleague Emerita at the Department of Political Science at Columbia. Steve Walt, who is another Renee and Robert and Renee Belfer professor there. I don't know if they're more than the two of you, but uh, you and Jack um, at the Harvard um, Kennedy School and longtime colleague of Dix, Erica Borghard, a former student of uh, Dix, uh, who's now senior fellow at the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security and the, at the Atlantic Council, um, and Captain Michael O'Hara, who's a career naval officer and now a professor at the U.S. Naval War College and also a former PhD student of Dix. So those will be our five panelists, um, and then uh, we'll have to share remarks, uh, and then uh, hopefully time for people to, to jump in with other anecdotes and stories and, and toasting and roasting of of Dick Betts. So with that, I will um, turn it to Stuart. Thanks. Thanks, Paige. Good to see everybody. This was a fascinating event. It was the most international relations I did in one day since I was studying for the comps, I think. And uh, a lot of the same names were, were here. Um, I just suddenly got a little nervous. Bear with me because I, I realized uh, my entire dissertation committee is on this panel. Uh, Jack Snyder, uh, Lisa Anderson, and Dick Betts. Um, <clears throat> even if Dick is only in an observational role on this one, it's still a little scary. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna take just a few minutes to set up our tributes and tributaries. Um, I know it's been a long day, as Paige said, a lot of talking, a lot of listening, but really amazing stuff. Uh, a quick thanks, <clears throat> shout out to Ingrid, Steve, Karen, uh, the Saltzman staff for really just putting together a, a stunningly amazing day. It's just, I, I know how hard it is to put these kinds of things together. So amazing work for real. Um, <clears throat> I feel like I'm a pretty good person to kick off this final panel because I've known Dick literally since the day he started teaching at Columbia in 1990. Uh, I was a first year PhD student uh, and a bunch of my classmates and I, and many of them are here today, I should add. Um, we were kicking around on the 13th floor when Dick was moving boxes into his new office and we all got introduced to him and chatted, you know, for a few minutes. <clears throat> I obviously had no idea at that point that I would have such a long and lasting professional and personal relationship with Dick. But now looking back, it seems almost a little uncanny uh, when you think about it. Uh, the first, I took, I took the first course Dick Betts ever taught at Columbia, the course that went on to become the legendary war piece and strategy. It wasn't even called it. It wasn't even called that back then. Um, Dick then served as chair of my dissertation committee. And then Dick, uh, along with Lisa Anderson, uh, one of my other heroes uh, and the Dean of SEPA at the time, um, hired me back in 2003 to teach at Columbia after I spent five years in the US Senate. Um, I should know Dick also got his start in the policy world working in the US Senate and then for most of the next 17 years that I've been teaching here at Columbia, my office up on 13th floor was either directly across from Dick's or directly next to his. In other words, I'm probably the closest thing you'll find out there to a Dick Betts groupie. Actually, in the spirit of, of international relations theory, I think a liberal would probably refer to me as a Dick Betts groupie. A realist would probably call me a Dick Betts stalker. I should note that my relationship with Dick got off to a little bit of a rocky start back in 1990. I'm, I'm not, not sure he remembers this, but a few days after we met for the first time on the 13th floor, I think it was a Monday, and I was waiting for an elevator on the fourth floor to go up to War and Peace, where I was a research fellow that year. Anyhow, I'm on floor, and one of the elevator doors opens, 
and Dick Betts is in there, coming up from the garage, I guess, uh, and also heading up to his office on 13th. So it was just the two of us on the elevator, slightly uncomfortable silence. At a certain point, we both tried to break the silence, and we, but we both spoke at the exact same time. You know, like, like that scene from, uh, from Meet the Parents when Ben Stiller was alone in the car with Robert De Niro for the first time, and we know how that went. Anyhow, I tried to say something like, you know, did you have a nice weekend? Um, he was, I think, trying to say something like, you know, how long have you been in the program? But the words collided uh, like a scud missile, uh, and we both just went silent again. The problem was, these were the old Soviet style elevators that were in the International Affairs Building before Lisa Anderson had them replaced with the current slightly less Soviet style elevators uh, we enjoy today. So <clears throat> we still had several more floors of awkwardness to contend with. Um, after a few more brief attempts by both of us to say something only to have it crash into the other person's words, uh, we both kind of gave up, you know. Uh, the door then opened up on 13. Um, I gave one of these, you know, silent, you know, uh, arm gestures, you know, like after you. Uh, he gave me one of these silent head nods, like, thanks, and, you know, and then he lumbered out of the elevator and, and down the hall. And I'm thinking to myself, that went well. <laughs> now, what I did not know at that time was that Dick has, how shall I put it judiciously, uh, a certain unique social style that takes a little getting used to. Uh, as you know, Karen alluded to some of this earlier, uh, he's a no-nonsense guy, you know, not into big flowery formality. I can see how some people might be a little bit intimidated by that sort of style. And in all honesty, you know, today is all about truth. As Peter Clement said, you know, it's all about truth today. And the truth is Columbia campus over the past few decades has been littered with undergraduate and graduate students alike and probably not a few junior faculty whose greatest fear in life was a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Dick Betts. <laughs> now I know this because as I said, my office was typically right near his. So I would see these poor souls sitting there waiting for their meetings, looking over their notes, you know, fidgeting. Uh, some of them, uh, if they knew me, you know, they were one of my students, they would come over and ask me quietly, you know, what's it really like? What's it really like to sit down and talk, talk to Dick Betts? <clears throat> and, and by the way, it probably didn't help that pasted on the outside of his office door were multiple notices on, on how to do certain things. You know, uh, one, one was how to sign up for the wait list for one of his classes. Um, one was uh, how to apply for the security policy concentration. Um, another one was, you know, how to request a letter of recommendation. And by the way, that's my, my favorite. Um, because they weren't really how-to guides in the traditional sense. Uh, they were more what not to do, you know, um, with, with the most egregious violations, double underlined in all caps bold, you know, don't even think about doing X, you know. Uh, and by the way, it also probably didn't help that for many years, he also had on his door uh, one of those, you know, no BS signs. You know, it's like BS with the circle and the slash, like a no BS sign. But this wasn't your typical no BS sign with the letters B and S, you know, with the circle and the slash. This was an actual cow. Uh, and I'll, 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 <laughs> I'll keep it clean. Uh, you know, this was a cow, let's say, doing its business pretty graphically um, with a big circle and a slash, you know, uh, around it. So that, that was the door that welcomed people into Dick Betts's office. <laughs> So, so if you were a junior undergrad or a first year grad student meeting with him for the first time, you know, there might as well have been a big, you know, black wrought iron sign over the door, abandon hope all ye who enter here. Now in preparation for this panel, <clears throat> I wanted to see if Dick still has this sort of rep, you know, especially since it's been many years since I've seen that bull sign, you know, outside, outside his door and, and maybe he's possibly softening up a little bit over the years. Uh, so I asked uh, a recent student who came to Columbia a few years back, um, who was eager to take Dick Betts's classes. Uh, this student, by the way, loved his classes, uh, loved Betts so much that, that they applied to work at the Saltzman Institute as a researcher. So after telling me all that, and also how well they apparently did 
in, in, in his classes, the person then, then went on to say, and I'm quoting directly, quote, but I'm still terrified of him. <laughs> That's a true story. I have witnesses uh, for that story. Now, <clears throat> as everyone at this event knows, and the countless others who have had the privilege of getting to know Dick or the great good fortune of having worked with him, um, and I know he doesn't want me to say this because he, he likes his badass rep. I know that. But today is about truth. Uh, and the truth is, we all know that Dick is literally one of the nicest, kindest, most generous people you will ever meet. By the way, I used to try to tell the people trembling outside his office that, you know, I'd say to them, don't worry, you know, calm down. He's actually a cupcake, you know, and they'd say, Richard Betts is a cupcake. What kind of cupcakes are you eating? You know, they would say to me. Um, but actually, I'll give him this. I don't want to destroy his rep too much. Uh, he's more like a day old cupcake, uh, a, a little hard and crusty on the outside. But sorry, Dick, nothing but sweet on the inside which as I said, everyone here today knows, not least of all, Adela, Mickey, you know, all the members of his, of his amazing family. Um, just a real quick final point, couple of points, because I know this day is not just about Richard Betts, the human, um, but also Richard Betts, the scholar, and so many others have already well covered Dick's tremendous impact across the fields of political science, international relations, military strategy, so much more. Just two quick ones for me, then I'll turn it back to Paige. Um, so like I said, Dick was chair of my dissertation committee in the mid 90s. So I was once one of those trembling souls, you know, uh, waiting outside his office to go in to see his comments on my latest uh, chapter, uh, you, you know, abandon all hope, you know. Um, but just like everything else he does, and Karen uh, phrased this really well at the beginning of the, of the session today, um, Dick approached it with the perfect combination of support and inspiration uh, and much needed candor, uh, along with extremely careful and obviously enormously time consuming line edits on each and every chapter draft. Uh, and I should say, when things went wrong, you knew about it. You know, when things went wrong, you would get this thing in the margin, Dick, right? You, this GAC, does that look familiar? <laughs> it looks familiar to me. I couldn't find one of my originals because it got wiped out in Hurricane Sandy out by my parents' house, but it looked something like that. <laughs> but when things went right, you knew it also. Uh, and you knew you were doing something special because his standards were so high. You know, I can say without any hesitation that Dick has been one of the two or three biggest influencers in my life, uh, including out in the professional world, in helping make me a better thinker, a, a better and more careful writer, uh, and definitely a better teacher. Um, though I should say we still have an unresolved dispute over splitting infinitives uh, that dates back 25 years, uh, but I'll save that for his actual retirement uh, many, many years from now, uh, inshallah. Uh, final point, um, out of curiosity, I did a quick look at all my teaching syllabi uh, from the past 20 years or so, um, mostly at Columbia, but also at Brown uh, and Yale for a lot of years. Um, my primary courses being American foreign policy and counterterrorism, but I've also taught a few times each international security and international relations theory. Um, I looked to see the number of bets required readings on my course syllabi after all these decades, really. Um, and now I'm not talking about something from a long suggested reading list, but required testable material, you know, uh, for the students. And over the lifespan of these four courses, including my two current ones, and I don't even really teach straight academic stuff. Um, there are assigned one entire Betts book, that's nuclear blackmail that Scott Sagan mentioned before, um, four separate chapters from Betts books, and a total of at least eight separate academic articles. Um, and many of these appear on multiple syllabi. Um, this is a tremendous amount of assigned reading. We know how careful we are putting our assigned reading down there. This is a tremendous amount of assigned reading from a single scholar. Um, and on so many different diverse topics. And by, and by the way, it tells us how many smart young students from all around the world have been exposed to the brilliant work of the friend and scholar we are justifiably celebrating today, Richard K. Betts. I'll turn it over to Paige on that, that point. So thank you, Dick. Thanks, Stuart. I think I've had that same conversation in the elevator with Dick, <laughs> verbatim. <laughs> Um, I'll turn it to Lisa now. Hi, hi Lisa. Hi, 
Hello, and thank you very much. Thank you for including me. Um, you've spent the day celebrating Dick Betts as a social scientist, an analyst, an intellectual, and a thinker, um, clearly also, as Stuart has suggested, a teacher, all of which I will concede. Dick is one of the smartest students of politics any of us know. And probably everyone on this screen and many others as well have footnoted him, including me, which might be a surprise given what I work on, mostly what we at SEPA call economic and political development or human rights and humanitarian affairs, not in other words, guns and bombs, which is the concentration also known as international security policy that Dick has run for decades. Um, I would like to associate myself with Dick intellectually, however, um, because I like to be associated with some of the smartest people we know. And there's a little bit of an overlap. He's interested in failed states and I'm interested in failed states. Jihad is both interest, interest both of us, um, though typically and perhaps obviously from different perspectives. But there are other aspects of Dick that I would like to emphasize in my opportunity to speak about him. I've been struck over the years by how often I meet people for whom Dick actually represents Columbia. In some circle, circles, including parts of the Council on Foreign Relations, for example, people need to be gently reminded that there are other scholars at SEPA, indeed other Council on Foreign Relations fellows. <laughs> but Dick's agility, his ability to walk back and forth seamlessly between the academy and the world of policy and security studies, intelligence, foreign policy, has been the embodiment of what SEPA means and an inspiration and reassurance to generations of students who want to do what he does, or at least a little bit of what he does. But what I really want to accent, worried that you should have been so taken with Dick's intellectual firepower that you might absent mind it, have forgotten that he did other things and has other skills, is that he is the soul of generosity and care in all of his interactions with other people, even on the elevator. I'm sure generations of students will attest to what Stuart has described, as would all of his colleagues with whom he's worked on national commissions and those closer to home, whom he relieved of having to serve as institute director for so long. He takes seriously things most of his colleagues do not, not least of which is that prosaic endeavor administration. And here he has been a creative and thoughtful and clever as he has been creative and thoughtful and clever as a social scientist and policy analyst. For example, Dick became director of the Institute shortly after I became Dean of SEPA. And we worked together with Arnold Salzman and his family as they provided support for what would become the Salzman Institute. It not only worked, it was fun. But this is what I really remember. There is no one I would have rather confronted the terrors of 9-11 than with Dick Betts. It was a terrifying day and a disorienting fall semester for all of us. SEPA students from all over the world were frightened and then they were, as you would hope, determined. Determined to help at ground zero, to support families of loved ones lost, to reassure each other, and most importantly, to understand. Calmly and unceremoniously, as you might expect, the Institute under Dick started sponsoring events, faculty panels, informal talks, visitors lectures on what had happened. Who were these people? How did they do what they did? What did that mean about US defense and intelligence, about asymmetric warfare, about strategy? That is about all of what you've been talking about all day. Without hysteria, without panic or drama, Dick made sure that the Institute fulfilled its mission at SEPA to help people understand. It was an effort that enlightened and reassured and inspired its beneficiaries, including me, for many years. But finally, I have one shout out. Um, over the time Dick was Institute Director, work-life balance became a thing. So who's helped him do all of what we have talked about all day for all these years? Well, of course, all of you, his colleagues, his students, his inst the Institute staff. But no one so much as the person mentioned on the first line of his CV, his wife, Adela. Yes, you heard me right. Dick lists his wife and kids before he lists his job, his education, anything else. And that sense of what is important is what a lot of us really love about him. Thank you very much, Dick. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, and now Steve. 
Okay, uh, great. So uh, even when I was back in high school, I was a huge fan of Dick Betts. Uh, but the Dick Betts I'm talking about was one of the guitarists in the Allman Brothers band, Dickie Betts. Uh, I was completely wrong about this. The Dick Betts who really mattered was somebody else entirely. And it's a real pleasure for me to offer a brief tribute to somebody I've admired once I figured out who the right one was. Uh, the previous panels, I think, have done a terrific job of summarizing Dick's extraordinary uh, contributions to our field. I want to talk primarily about some of his personal qualities. Um, first, if my memory is correct, I first met Dick at a conference at Los Alamos National Lab in 1980. And this was at the end of my third year in grad school. And I have a very vivid memory of sitting around in the hotel bar one evening, arguing with Bob Art and Dick about some arcane aspect of nuclear deterrence. Uh, Bob was smoking a cigar about the size of the Hindenburg, and Dick was explaining that my understanding of deterrence was fine in theory, but ignored all sorts of political realities. Now, I'm pretty sure I talked a lot more and listened a lot less than I should have. There was some beer involved. And both Bob and Dick were remarkably tolerant uh, towards an obnoxious grad student who knew far less about the subject than they did. And I look back on that and what that incident tells you is that Dick is fundamentally a very kind person, even when dealing with a cocky young numbskull like me. Now, a few years later, I got to spend a year as a guest scholar at Brookings and that's when I really got to know Dick better. And then his second quality uh, became obvious. Uh, as Barry Posen said, he is an iron horse whose dedication and work ethic are really something of an embarrassment to the rest of us. And just look at what's happening today. We're supposed to be celebrating him and he's having to work on every single panel and he'll have to give the closing remarks. Uh, he's written or edited 11 books, a pile of monographs, several dozen scholarly articles. And if you read them, you realize every single one of them is the product of extensive research, careful thought. Dick does not phone it in. And he did all this, of course, as we now know, while teaching, consulting, serving in government, running this institute. This is just an extraordinary record of accomplishment. Third, I think Dick's somewhat unusual because he is what I would call a passionate moderate. There are some scholars, and <clears throat> the late Ken Waltz, whom we all know, comes to mind, who are in a sense radical simplifiers who boil the world down to a few simple ideas and often take controversial positions. I think Dick's quite different. He rejects monocausal explanations. He sees many shades of gray. He doesn't like simplistic policy prescriptions. That worldview has led him toward the middle ground on a lot of issues. But he's not one of these wishy-washy on the one hand, on the other hand, thinkers who won't take a position. On the contrary, many of his books ultimately take very clear positions. And as anyone who's ever tried to argue with him knows, he occupies and defends that complex ground vigorously, even passionately. And as several of the other panelists have said earlier today, it's because he understands that excessive parsimony and inattention to nuance is positively dangerous. Fourth, uh, as I tried to suggest at the outset, I think Dick is a, uh, just an exceptionally decent person and a man of great integrity. Uh, he is somewhat shy. He can be blunt at times. He is very old school in his approach to teaching and learning, but he's not someone who says one thing and then does the opposite or who's afraid to take an unpopular stance. And I'm now old enough to realize that these are rare qualities in life and in academia. And the bottom line here is a young scholar could do a whole lot worse than to model his or her life after the example that Dick Betts has set. So I wanna close with one last story. Uh, as some of you, maybe not all, but some of you may know, Dick used to be a smoker. And my understanding is that he quit when he married Adela. Now, as it happens, my father-in-law quit smoking the same year that I spent at the Brookings Institution with Dick and uh, my father-in-law used to talk about how much better he felt after he stopped. So one day at the coffee table, I asked Dick, you know, Dick, aren't you glad you quit? Don't you feel a whole lot better now that you're not smoking? And Dick glared at me, really shot bullets at me and said, 
I haven't felt as good a single day since I've quit as I used to feel every day when I smoked. <laughs> and then he said, when I get to 75, I'm going to start smoking again. Now, Dick, I think everyone watching is glad you quit when you did, because it made it more likely you'd be around for us to celebrate you today. As far as I am personally concerned, if you want to start again now, that's okay by me. But my opinion on this subject is worthless. My advice is you should check with Adela first. <laughs> Congratulations. Thanks for all you've done. It has been a pleasure to know you and to learn from you. Thanks, Steve. Um, now we turn to Erica. Thank you, Paige. Um, so it's great to see so many colleagues and friends here today. Um, and it's been really incredible, certainly as one of the more junior people here to listen to so many giants in the field reflect on Professor Betts's legacy. And I, I, I don't know how I could follow everyone. So um, I'm just honored that I was asked to share some remarks. Um, and so I thought I'd just share from more of a personal perspective, the role that Professor Betts played in sort of my own career development. Um, what most of you probably don't know about me is that I've actually known Professor Betts for many years, uh, well before I even started at Columbia as an undergraduate student. And um, that's because I grew up only a few houses away from him. Um, his, um, his house was just around the corner uh, from my house in Teaneck, New Jersey. And um, the one thing that um, I always sort of remembered um, about, about his home uh, from my childhood is that it was just brimming with books. Um, and so as you might imagine, um, for those of you who don't know me, I was a bit of a dorky kid. And to me, a house that was filled with books was something truly special. And of course, at that time, I had no idea what Columbia University was or what political science was or what it meant to be an academic, but I'm convinced that by some process of osmosis, just you know, growing up in the proximity of a giant in the field helped shape my own uh, choices to pursue, uh, to pursue my own career. Um, so fast forward a number of years, um, I ended up going to Columbia for undergrad um, and then for my PhD. And it was during this time that I really truly came to appreciate Professor Betts's impact on the field um, and really sort of uh, try to model in the best way that I could my own choices and path um, after him. Um, of course, I took every class that Professor Betts offered, including the legendary War, Peace, and Strategy. Um, and I was also lucky enough to TA that class. Um, and I think that I've listened to Professor Betts's lectures on War, Peace, and Strategy so many times that at this point I have a verbatim word for word copy of his lecture notes saved on my computer. Um, and those notes are priceless because so much of what I've learned about how to define strategy, um, about deterrence and coercion, about the uses and abuses of Clausewitz, about how to conceptualize the true costs and consequences of warfare, I learned from that class. And um, I'll never forget one of the most memorable exercises that Professor Bad did in class each year to sort of convey to students the excruciating decisions that come with what may otherwise seem to be abstract foreign policy concepts. Um, so during one lesson, we were discussing the merits of NATO expansion in the context of the end of the Cold War and US grand strategy. Um, and Professor Betts would ask students to vote on the casualty threshold that they would find acceptable if they were in charge for the defense of new NATO members. So in other words, how many American casualties would they find acceptable to defend Estonia or Latvia or Romania and so on? And you had to vote, you couldn't abstain. Of course, these are jarring questions um, and they're uncomfortable questions, but the point was that we can't and shouldn't ignore them. Um, and that was a lesson that I really sort of incorporated into my, into my own thinking and, um, and sort of my own teaching style. Um, another thing I'll never forget from Professor Betz's classes um, is his discussion of pacifism and what it really meant. Um, he has the utmost respect for true pacifists, um, but few individuals actually meet those criteria. Um, as I remember it, and I'm probably butchering this, um, his point was that we shouldn't use the concept of pacifism as a crutch to avoid grappling with those difficult questions about the conditions under which the costs of war are really truly worth it. Um, and what we're willing to pay in blood and treasure for political objectives. Um, 
Professor Betts was also the chair of my dissertation committee, which I found to be quite um, intimidating, as others have, have also said, uh, because his attention to detail is exacting. Um, and so, of course, I was worried about what my committee would think about the strengths of my theoretical argument or the validity of my case studies, but I naively sort of thought I could get away with um, people not paying too much attention to my footnotes. I was clearly mistaken because when it came time for my dissertation defense, I found that Professor Betts had made sure to read all of my footnotes in detail and provide extensive feedback. Uh, but of course that made my work better um, and I'm grateful that he did so. Um, I, I would also add that Professor Betts was uniquely supportive of my professional journey. Um, after I received a job offer from West Point, I met with Professor Betts in his office. I was one of those scared, uh, still scared students that, that Stuart Gottlieb referred to um, a few moments ago um, to, seek, to seek his advice. Um, and, it, and that's because it can be tricky to sort of figure out a career path that balances more traditional academic research and teaching while also aiming to have a policy impact, which is something I've always wanted to do um, in my career. Um, and the encouragement and the counsel that he gave me on how to think about making those choices was really invaluable in helping me um, make what I, I think have turned out to be the right decision so far. Um, you know, the, the other story I thought I'd share was that when I first um, started my first job at West Point, I was trying to figure out how to design an advanced seminar and grand strategy. I used the War, Peace and Strategy syllabus sort of as my inspiration. Um, and actually my favorite piece to teach in that course was, um, was is strategy and illusion. And I always assigned that article for lesson one. Um, and it was the last article that we would discuss that day. So I'd start off and we would spend most of the class talking about different definitions of grand strategy, why grand strategy is important, how American grand strategy has evolved over time. And then I'd end the class by sort of throwing all of that out the window to ask whether strategy is even possible. Um, and if it's not possible, um, whether war can be a legitimate manifestation of policy. Um, and and I, I really sort of learned that, uh, learned that lesson from the many years of being inculcated as a, as a student of, of, of Professor Best, but I doubt I, I did the same justice um, to it that, that he would have done had he been teaching the class. Um, so there, there are lots more stories I could share that I'm sure many here are familiar with. Um, especially his former students, like how Professor Betts always, to always managed to wear a different SWAMOS t-shirt with a different Clausewitz quotation on it for every single day of SWAMOS. <laughs> um, and there are also so many more examples of the positive impacts that Professor Betts had on my career, as I know that he had on so many of my colleagues. But I'm just grateful that I had a few minutes this afternoon um, to share a bit about my own journey and how indebted I am um, to his mentorship all of, over all of these years. So thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Professor Betts, for everything. And hi, Adela. Hi. <laughs> thank so you, Eric. Sorry, go ahead, Adela. I was just saying so proud of our old neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Erica. Um, Mike. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, we can. This is the, thank you. Um, first, let me just say, Paige, thank you. It's good to see you. Um, I'm honored to be included in this today um, with fellow classmates, uh, my former TAs, my former professors, dissertation committees here. Um, this is a real treat, and it's a deep honor for me to be able to pay tribute to a person that I have looked up to so much and who's who's mentorship I've benefited from. Um, now, I, I would like to note at the outset that uh, to, to have close to, to be at the end of the, the agenda today and to have nearly the last word as a naval officer, um, it's just wonderful. I, I note the service of uh, Professor Betts in the Army, uh, which he, he often understates, but I, but I value and I recognize. Um, and and um, and I want to honor that as well. I'm here in my uniform today at the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island, uh, where I'm trying to impart to my students um, some of the lessons that, that he shared with me. My first encounter with, uh, with Dick Betts was in the Lindsay Rogers room, and, and I was entirely enthusiastic about starting the program. And I was explaining to him how I was probably going to learn Chinese while I was here, too. 
And, um, <laughs> and he said, you know, you just don't have time for that. Uh, you just don't have time. And I, I thought, what in the world could he possibly know? He has no idea how ambitious I am. Uh, and then I started on the reading list for War, Peace and Strategy. And, and I fully understood, <laughs> I fully understood what he meant. And that was um, for someone who had just come from a deploy, you know, deployments and gone to the, co the war college and thought he knew something about national security studies. Um, boy, was I, was I you know, in for an awakening. Um, and it was perhaps the most um, foundational class that I have ever had. And, and uh, as Erica mentioned before, it's the kind of experience that I've tried to model uh, others on. Um, Swamos further extended that, uh, that experience and built it into a community for me. Um, I'm grateful for, uh, for Swamos for that experience at, up at Cornell, but um, really because it, not only did, was it enriching of course, but it, it, it started to establish a community of people who were, who were serious about this. And now I work with many of them here and we're all indebted to you um, and, and to all of those colleagues of yours that you have brought in each year. Um, you were very kind to me as a war, peace and strategy student to listen to a student critique I had. I said, there's not enough saltwater content in the syllabus. We need to talk about navies. And, uh, and you said, okay, um, have at it. What, what do we need to read then? You know, put your money where your mouth is. And, um, and then you were also kind enough to ask me to offer something to contribute to SWAMOS as well about naval warfare. And I, I, I hope that that uh, has been a value add. Um, let me say that also that reading Clausewitz with you was, uh, has been incredibly important. And so this is sort of an object lesson for me today. Uh, I was gonna talk about the bridge of strategy because behind me is the Newport Pell Bridge but Clausewitz is laughing because of course the fog of war here in Newport is preventing me from showing you that, uh, that bridge. And I'm dealing with all kinds of friction here on a microphone while I, uh, while I try to pay tribute to you. It was all well planned, um, but as we know, plans are nothing, planning is everything. It was really about trying to, uh, to link all that together. Um, let me let me just end. I was going to talk about some some other items that, but others have covered them more than sufficiently. Um, I wanted to just pause and offer this thought about what what a naval officer might offer to a former army officer, um, but really to a professor whom he loves, uh, and and that is um, the remarks from. John Paul Jones about uh, about the qualifications of a naval officer because in my mind you you meet every single one of them. Uh, he says it's not enough for um, it is by no means enough that that an officer of the navy should be a capable mariner. He must be that of course, but also a great deal more. Uh, he should be as well a gentleman of liberal education, of punctilious courtesy, of refined manners and the nicest sense of personal honor. He should be the soul of tact, patience, justice, firmness, kindness, and charity. No meritorious act of a subordinate should escape his attention or be left to pass without its reward, even if the reward, the, the reward is an, a, a kind word of approval. And I think this applies to dissertation students, by the way, too. Uh, conversely, he should not be blind to a single fault in any subordinate, though at the same time, he should be quick and unfailing to distinguish error from malice, thoughtlessness from incompetency, and well-meant shortcomings from heedless or stupid blunder. And those words certainly applied in my dissertating. In one word, every commander should keep constantly before him or her the great truth that to be well obeyed, he must be perfectly esteemed. And I think today, as you gather around with your colleagues and family and students, um, we hold you in the most perfect esteem and, and we salute you. Thank you. That was beautiful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks to all of the panelists for such um, heartfelt words of appreciation for Dick. Um, 
Before I turn uh, the moderating duties over to Jack for the special guests and, and audience anecdotes part of this panel, I am going to take the prerogative of the chair to insert my own remarks um, about Dick. And uh, it's a Fortna family tradition um, for events like these, retirements, birthdays, honoring of people in various ways, um, to do so by writing doggerel. And so I have done so. Um, so here it goes. As we live through these COVID times, thanks for indulging some cringeworthy rhymes. I hope that soon we can meet in one room. For now, we have to make do with Zoom. Today, we honor a professor named Betts, as distinguished a scholar as anyone gets. A valued colleague and scholar prolific on many topics, Marshall and Pacific. Googling his name might lead you astray, hasn't played with the Allman Brothers a day. No, not the Dickie Betts who wrote of a man rambling. Our Dick Betts holds the professorship Schifrin. An expert on foreign policy decision makers from research on Beltway's movers and shakers. Few know more on intelligence and the use of force, the crises of the Cold War, and since then, of course. Savvy students of security all say, vamanos, let's get to a program a la Swamos. And to miss his class on war, peace, and strategy, everyone knows, would be a tragedy. But priority goes to Mickey Diego, Elena, and Adela. Dick has always been a strong family fella. Into campus from Jersey, a stalwart schlepper. He likes his food spicy with heaps of red pepper. He served a long time as our fearless leader. Now he'll have more time as a writer and reader. I'm grateful for the community of security buddies he's built at the Saltzman Inst of War and Peace Studies. Not much for small talk with an exterior gruff. Those who know him know that that's all a bluff. Bob Jervis will tease him for being an old fart, but all who know Dick know he's got a big heart. Thank you. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Over to you, Jack. <laughs> Was the line about the almond band uh, improvised at the last minute? Ripping? No, no, Steve stole my thunder by inserting that in his remarks. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'm uh, gonna MC uh, the next part, uh, which is uh, people making shorter testimonials. Uh, but before we get to those folks, um, uh, I just wanted to say a few words myself. Uh, it's that time of day when Dick has been praised for just about everything that you could think of, uh, you know, and you may be wondering what new area of praise worthiness has been overlooked so far. I mean, we've heard about how Dick is the best writer in the entire field, which we know. But the thing that we haven't heard about is Dick's exceedingly wonderful qualities as an actor and an orator. So I remember, I'm just gonna give two examples. I remember when I was a summer intern at the Rand Corporation sometime in the mid to late 70s. And uh, at that point in my career, I had really never given a talk on anything uh, to an audience before. So uh, my eye was open for people who were doing that and doing a good job. And Dick Betts blew into Santa Monica and gave a talk. I'm pretty sure it was on soldier statesmen and cold, uh, and cold war strategies. And uh, it was just immaculate. And I said, okay, this is the guy to learn from. Um, now, Dick is um, an effective speaker, um, but you may question whether he's uh, the best actor. In fact, in his own family, he's only the second best actor, since Adela actually is a professional actor. But um, the qualities that Dick uh, presented in his Rand talk were, I want you to think about streetcar named desire. But no, I don't want you to think about the method acting, scenery chewing approach of Marlon Brando. That would be more um, 
more like, um, well, some of our other colleagues, uh, Warner Schilling in particular, used that approach to great effect. Uh, I want you to think about Dick, Dick Betts's uh, style in that talk as more the Carl Malden character, the steady Eddie who was the would-be love interest of Blanche Dubois. So the second example was a completely different style of oratory and in some ways even more amazing. This was the equivalent of the, the elevator ride with Dick, only it was horizontal transportation. Uh, Dick and I would occasionally carpool in from Teaneck, New Jersey to Columbia when one or the other of us had our car in the shop. And there was one day in the early 90s when just as we were getting onto the George Washington Bridge, Dick said, Jack, do you want to hear about this article that I'm kind of working on? I think I'm going to call it uh, the, de the delusion of, uh, of impartial uh, intervention. And uh, so I say, yeah, I want to hear that. And so two minutes later, by the time we got to the other end of the horizontal elevator ride on the George Washington Bridge, my jaw had dropped and I was sure that this was gonna be an article that was gonna be on my syllabus for the next 30 years. And uh, it has been. So um, Dick Betts, not only the great writer, but the great orator and actor, uh, uh, from whom I have learned, but never been able to imitate at that level. Okay, so we are going to our list of folks uh, for their relatively short uh, testimonials to Dick, starting with Michael Doyle. Thank you, I'm just delighted to join you all. Um, I've just got a few brief words to say. First of all, it's been an honor and a pleasure to have Dick as a colleague for the past 15 years. Some of you know we've appeared back to back in the introductory IR class in SEPA, he riffing on Hobbes followed by me on Kant in the beginning of the course. But I should mention that our friendship goes much further back. I think we had our, Dick can correct me, our first long conversation in 73 or 74 when we were graduate students, both single graduate students, I should mention here, when we had been invited to a Kentucky Derby picnic by a group of recent Wellesley graduates. Now I should mention here is that all I recall of the party is a long conversation with Dick that says something about our social skills and a resolution never again to drink mint juleps. And to this day, that was my last mint julep somewhere back then. Our, our next encounter was, was more significant. Uh, Klaus Knorr, uh, a dear friend of both of us, invited us to a meeting at the Cosmos Club in DC, I think it was about 1981, to discuss our chapters in a volume on, it's called Strategic Military Surprise. It was edited by Patrick Morgan and Klaus. Michael Handel was another author. Uh, the resulting book was published in 1982. Uh, and by way of nostalgia, Last night, I glanced at the APSR review of the book, and the review kindly hailed the volume as, and all of you security people, this is the point to listen up, they hailed our volume as a significant contribution in the relatively new field of security studies. So, <laughs> so take that. Uh, today, uh, the book is only available for purchase on eBay, and its value has gone way up. It's $99.95 on eBay. And I looked on eBay, and I was, again, very pleased to see 
looking at the blurb for it. The book is excellent condition. So those <laughs> of you who like to read it can find it. Importantly, and here seriously, what, what I saw then and have seen in all the rest of your teaching and the wonderful collection of your powerful scholarship are two traits which show up again and again. The first is a relentless commitment to policy relevance. And the second is a deep appreciation for the complexity of history. And those are big, big virtues in our field. And we are all in your debt for that. And so with everyone else, I thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, so I just wanted to say that, um, you know, I, I have a list of people who are, are all queued up, but in addition to that, people will be able to um, just raise your hand or let me know in the queue if you want to join the list and uh, we'll try to accommodate uh, as many people as we can. Um, I think there may also be a plan afoot if we run out of time to do any uh, other uh, tributes uh, separately on some Google uh, video that uh, maybe um, Ingrid can describe if we get to that point. So back to the list, uh, Alan Song, one of our former grad students uh, now at the Smith Richardson Foundation. Hi, Dick. Uh, hi, Jack. Hi, Paige. Uh, uh, Ingrid, thank you for inviting me to join this uh, illustrious uh, rank of colleagues and students and uh, uh, friends. Uh, I'm uh, representing uh, Smith Richardson Foundation today to offer our deepest heartfelt thanks uh, to Dick. Uh, for those of you who do not know the backstory, uh, uh, we go back about uh, 26, 27 years ago uh, when Dick and the foundation conspired uh, to uh, launch a, a workshop, a boot camp of a sort, to teach freshly minted PhDs and young uh, academics uh, about uh, an analysis of military operations. Well, that uh, turned out to be SWAMOS, uh, which many of you have alluded to. Uh, uh, given the, 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 the role of uh, SWAMOS and the authority that it plays uh, in the field today, uh, you may say, well, why was it a conspiracy? Uh, but when we first talked about this, uh, you know, 27, 26 years ago, you may recall this was um, uh, uh, sort of the end of history. Many departments were uh, shuttering up security studies. Uh, a lot of the big boy foundations were closing up shop in that uh, uh, domain of funding. So at that time, uh, doing something like the SWAMOS uh, was really a, 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 a proposition uh, that required a lot of faith. Uh, it was not at all uh, self-evident that if Dick built it, uh, they will come. But with characteristic gusto, conviction and dedication, Dick plunged into it and he built it and boy, did they come. Uh, and uh, SWAMOS is what it is today. Uh, thanks to Dick, your hard work, your dedication. Uh, many of um, uh, the people who uh, are on Zoom right now we're on Zoom uh, uh, earlier today, uh, have uh, uh, lectured uh, at the program. Uh, I see Barry Posen, uh, 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 but there are many, many other uh, very, very senior people uh, who would trek up to Ithaca uh, uh, to give you know, three, including uh, uh, travel time, up to four days uh, for Dick. And they didn't do this because uh, the, uh, the program offered them a whopping honorarium or you know, Ritz-Carlton-like treatment. Quite the contrary, the lodging is very Spartan. Uh, they're asked to eat at uh, uh, Cornell's cafeteria. No, they all came uh, because they were persuaded by Dick's uh, uh, belief in the mission and in the mission of the program. So Dick, thank you so much. Thanks for 25 years, and we look forward to another 25 years of happy co collaboration. Thank you, and congratulations. Thanks, Alan. Uh, James McAllister is a Columbia PhD uh, 
He was a professor at Williams College. Thank you, uh, Jack. Uh, really, uh, just a, a pleasure and seeing uh, so many people that uh, really influenced my life uh, 30 years ago. Uh, a truly great moment. Um, Unfortunately, Stuart Gottlieb, a uh, good friend of mine, uh, stole many of my points, but I just wanted to reiterate a couple of them. Uh, one of the signs on, on Dick's door that I always remembered was he used to have a sign that said, please treat me like I'm, a I'm on leave this year and please treat me like I'm a visiting professor spending the year in Paris. In other words, don't come anywhere near my office, even though my door is, is absolutely wide open. and. Uh, I don't know whether it, it shows the importance of uh, credibility, but uh, I don't think any graduate student ever challenged that uh, policy over uh, the year. The second part of this story that um, I wanna talk about, and I'm glad uh, Adele is here because she, she may remember this uh, moment as well. Um, I got invited to a party at Dick's house uh, on a Saturday night. It was from a seminar we're taking. I can already see Adela laughing uh, already. Um, I trudge out to, uh, and I thank Erica for reminding me of uh, that it was Teaneck, New Jersey. I, I got there on a train. I walk from the train station to Dick's house. I knock on the door. I'm, I'm already very nervous, and uh, I'm immediately informed that I've shown up a week early for the party. Um, and, uh, you know, if I could have died right then and there, I, I, I would have. Um, but, uh, I think all of you know where this story is going to end. Uh, Dick and his wife both treated me with uh, incredible grace and niceness. And yeah, he is the kindest, nicest person uh, you could ever imagine. And uh, the gruff exterior, um, no one should uh, uh, be fooled by that. Um, I want to say another thing too, and I, I had totally forgotten about this story, but uh, Steve Walt mentioned it about how Dick uh, used to be a smoker. And I, I used to be a smoker at the time too. And uh, people often ask me, I've quit for about eight years now, and people often say, hey, isn't it great? Don't you feel wonderful that you quit? And, and you know, my answer is almost always the same as Dick's, which is, no, it's terrible. I felt much better then, but uh, I'm really happy to know that I can now start again at, at 75, which uh, isn't far away. So you've given me hope to, to get through my, my non-smoking life. But um, on so many levels, um, I, I just want to thank uh, Dick for everything. One thing, and I, I know people always focus on scholarship and everything else, I teach at a liberal arts college and uh, there's no one who's been more influential to me uh, in how I, I deal with my students, how I think about them. Um, Dick has a line on his syllabus, uh, you know, you're not at, um, you're not a community college. This is Columbia University. This is the big leagues. Um, and I always want my students to say, hey, you know, if you're if you're going to top places or you want to go to top places, uh, we have to be professional about it. Um, and uh, uh, I thank Dick for so many uh, lessons in uh, professionalism and uh, just uh, wonderful uh, that I had the chance to know him all these years. Thank you. Thanks, James. Uh, so now we have Arturo Sotomayor, who's a Columbia PhD of Dick's, uh, who teaches at the Elliott School at George Washington University. Arturo? Thank you, and uh, what a wonderful event to see so many colleagues and professors and friends from the past. Um, Dick Betts was my dissertation advisor. I was his student, I was his TA, and I, also, I was also his assistant. I was known as a Suamos assistant who did that job for four consecutive years. I always like to joke that not only did I have to read the comprehensive reading uh, Suamos list, but I actually had to photocopy it all four times every year. So, um, but one thing that um, has not been mentioned is the fact that Professor Betts has always been a champion of diversity and inclusion in a field that hasn't been very diverse. Uh, Dick, you have mentored so many women, Latinos, Hispanic students, scholars of color, members of the LGBTQ community, and you always accepted us with no judgment, you treated us like humans. And so I just wanna recognize your enormous mentorship in making this field more diverse and inclusive. I also like to say that um, Professor Betts has a really sarcastic sense of humor. 
Um, and that sense of humor flourishes precisely when he is next to his wife, Adela, and in company of Mickey, Diego, and Elena. I like to think that he has a Latin heart dip, dip there, uh, but uh, he is a very funny guy. And I remember in the late 1990s and early 2000s, he used to be at the gym every morning at 5.30 a.m. There were only two professors at the time who would open the gym at Columbia University at 5.30 a.m. Edward Said and Professor Dick Betts. And he would be there working out while reading the New, the New York Times. He's an avid reader of the New York Times. He reads the New York Times, every single article in their national section, hard copy every morning while working out. But this is the funny secret about him. He would read the newspaper sometimes upside down. And some of his students noticed that he was reading the paper upside down. Some of us thought that he was perhaps hiding for some, from some of these students. Others thought that maybe he's such a genius that he can read the paper upside down. I finally had the audacity to ask him, how did you do that? And he said, I'll tell you the secret when you're done with your dissertation. And that was it. And so maybe Dick Betts can share us how he reads the newspaper while he works out every morning at 5.30 a.m. Thank you for being such a great mentor, Professor Betts. Okay, I'm gonna invoke the prerogative of the chair and urge Dick to jump the queue and tell us the answer to the newspaper miracle. Dick? <laughs> yes? I'll tell you when you finish your next book. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's one of those great stories. I'm, I'm glad to hear from Arturo, but I have no recollection of <laughs> reading the newspaper upside down. <laughs> in urban oh, you catch me in the gym when I was drunk. <laughs> okay, uh, our next testimonial is from Sarah Muller who's at the, uh, a Columbia PhD, who's at the School of Diplomacy and IR at Seton Hall. Sarah. Thank you, Jack. It's hard to think of something new to say after a day long tribute to Dick Betts, uh, but I wanted to say a few things about Professor Betts as a teacher and a mentor, uh, hitting on some of the themes that have already been mentioned. Uh, like others who have spoken, I also had the pleasure of TAing for the infamous War, Peace and Strategy course uh, on no less than three occasions, I believe. And I'll never forget the year he started the semester on the very first day, uh, by announcing to an auditorium of more than 100 poor souls that he had heard rumors he was a curmudgeon or a tough cookie in the classroom. Can't remember the exact phrasing, but I do remember verbatim what came next because he paused very effectively and in that perfect Betsy in delivery said he couldn't understand that because personally he always thought of himself as a big teddy bear. And uh, of course, as has been a common theme today, um, that is true. Um, and as anyone who has ever spent time with uh, Professor Betts or been a former student of his at Columbia knows he does have a certain reputation among the student body. Uh, the CEPA students have assembled over the years a 200 page and counting document titled the Betts Bible for his course as a study guide. And I'm not aware of any other faculty that can lay claim to that particular honor of having their own Bible. Uh, on at least two occasions that I TA'd for Dick, I was part of an all-female teaching assistant team. And the striking thing was at that time, it didn't seem odd or unusual in any way. Uh, it made sense that Erica, myself, Diane Funstein, and uh, Mira Rapp Hooper would be TAing that course. And it's only later after leaving Columbia and entering the field myself, I now realize how rare that was to have a all-female team of TAs for a hard security course like War, Peace, and Strategy. So I wanna thank Dick uh, for making it second nature at Columbia. I also want to thank him uh, for giving me the prototype for my own master's security course, uh, which I've modeled on War, Peace, and Strategy. And the nice thing about that is not just that I can use the Betts reader, Conflict After the Cold War, but whenever students inevitably complain about the uh, large reading load, which they do, I can simply say, blame Professor Betts. So thank you for that. 
as has been mentioned, Dick's legacy as an instructor really does span not only several generations, but quite literally the world. Uh, the current defense editor of The Economist magazine is a SWAMOS grad, uh, and there are many other SWAMOS graduates who have gone on to distinguish careers in academia and elsewhere. And I know that his teaching will continue to influence a new generation of students in the years ahead. So thank you. Thanks, Sarah. So unless this is an intelligence failure, uh, I have information that uh, Eric Saltzman is, has now joined us. Um, Eric is the son of uh, our Institute's benefactor, Arnold A. Saltzman. Uh, so uh, Eric, if you are in fact in the house, uh, please say a few words about Dick. Okay, I just unmuted, thank you. <clears throat> so, um... Uh, my late father, Arnold, would have loved this day, honoring Professor Betts. <clears throat> College, Columbia College in the 30s, was truly a transformative experience in a way that it could only be for a, a kid of cloistered, or more accurately, I could say, shettled, uh, shettled immigrant parents before today's ubiqu ubiquitously connected world. You can imagine now an immigrant kid or a kid of immigrant parents already has the whole American experience, or a lot of it delivered through his uh, iPad. But in those days, of course not. <clears throat> um, a feature of his education at Columbia, by the way, and uh, I who was who was in the 1940s and other references to World War II, were fights between Jewish kids and the German Bunts round shirts parading around the campus. Um, and he hoped for a career in the State Department. He sought a recommendation from his patrician international affairs professor who advised him that the State Department was no place for a Jew to have a career. And so he made a career in business successfully <clears throat> and he made friends with American politicians, especially, and also with some Soviets and Eastern Bloc officials. And so the relationship with Richard Betts that he formed later in his life in this center was really meaningful to him. Uh, rosebud meaningful, I would say, for an international affarian manque at that point in his life. <laughs> Um, I could speculate about an element of impatience and uh, companion traits that he had when he showed up and met Richard. I can also imagine how it was for Professor Betts uh, dealing with this in individual and benefactor. <clears throat> and I'm thinking about Richard. It's one thing to possess world-class expertise and to write about diplomacy and another to practice it. Um, but I know from Arnold uh, that Richard did in their relationship. Um, and look how it worked out. All, all of you people, of course, the, the day is to honor Richard, um, but it also is a tribute to the opportunity that Arnold created. And then I wanna say, uh, I'm speaking for my family really, um, but uh, also, after Arnold, what was the involvement of our family in the Institute? <clears throat> and I can say that probably ideal for the Institute, almost none. I was director of an academic center at Harvard Law School on internet and society, so I have a sense that that's exactly the right amount, <laughs> almost none. Um, it was almost none, but not none, because after the 2017 presidential inauguration, and then the fire and fury uh, craziness and other impetuous personal insults and threats, particularly toward North Korea. Like many, I was alarmed uh, about small fingers on a big button. I didn't know anything about this field at all. Uh, I wrote to Professor Betts pretty much out of the blue. I'm sure I had met him once or twice coming with Arnold to an event, but that's all. Uh, and I proposed or asked 
gee, could you think about a way for the Institute to look into the question of a president's sole authority over nuclear launch? And he was very gracious. He swung into action and assembled a spectacular group of scholar practitioners. Some are here today. Uh, Peter Fever, Bob Jarvis, Scott Sagan, who spoke earlier and who's become a friend separately, Barry Posen. I hope I didn't miss anybody. And apart from the extraordinary study environment in which my ignorance and participation a pretty bad combination, were gracefully tolerated. Uh, I really did feel welcomed in that group um, and had no credential to be there at all. And it was quite an education for me also. I've read more on the subject and enjoyed it and been horrified at times as someone said he was also. Uh, I had a glimpse of the resources Richard could draw upon, the great respect in which he stood with his colleagues, his gentle but very solid touch. And I think the group did uh, very good work under Richard's direction. Scott, say, uh, Scott spoke about it earlier. And um, I didn't know anything, so I thought it was good work. And to hear it mentioned again today feels great. Um, so I wanted to say a really warm, sincere thank you to Richard for his decades of wise, effective leadership of the center that bears my dad's name. And just to say nothing more than how, how grateful we are if he'd been here and saw how things have worked out after all these years, uh, he'd be very proud of it and he'd be very grateful to you, Richard. Uh, Eric, thanks so much for providing that context. So uh, next up, uh, we have Rebecca Murphy, a uh, Columbia PhD, who worked with Dick. Uh, in addition to her day job as a political risk analyst, uh, she also helps us out by being a professor, uh, regularly teaching an international politics seminar for us. Rebecca. Thanks. Uh, and like Stuart, I was uh, sort of gripped with fear seeing my entire dissertation committee, uh, Dick, Bob Jervis, Jack Snyder, all assembled on one screen. I'm uh, still a little nervous, I have to say. Um, but thank you for the chance to, uh, to recognize Dick. And it was really a privilege to be your student, um, to have you as my dissertation advisor, and, and to work for you on SWAMOS. I think nowhere was your commitment to uh, the next generation of security scholars more apparent um, then, then in that program that has now become an institution as so many have recognized and, and it was because of your vision. In, um, and so as both as a student and professionally, you, you challenged me continuously, um, but you constantly also uh, supported me and encouraged me. And most of all, I think you, you just inspired me with your commitment to your students, your, your colleagues, and most of all, your incredible family. Uh, so just congratulations on all that you've accomplished and all that we still have to look forward to from you. So enjoy it. And thanks for uh, letting me be part of this day. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, we have another testimonial from Diane Funstein, who's another one of Dick's Columbia PhDs. Hi, thank you for including me in this really amazing event. It is so hard to come up with something new to say about Professor Betts, other than to note that after, even nine years after finishing at Columbia, I still can't bring myself to call him anything other than Betts. Um, but I was certainly one of those people sitting outside your office, um, terrified, as Stuart mentioned earlier in his remarks. But um, because so much of today's uh, panels have talked about your scholarship and its legacy on the field. I thought I would just share a couple of very short um, stories about how you've influenced me as, as a person and an academic. Um, my first job out of Columbia, I had a, a, t a class on American foreign policy that I was teaching with about 215 students, I think, and something like four or six TAs. And I was sort of struggling quite a bit to figure out how to manage the class. And 
I found myself regularly asking what would Betts do when I was trying to figure out how to treat my students and uh, my TAs fairly. And I think, you know, I TA'd War, Peace, and Strategy so many times that I think you gently asked me to move on to another course after three or four years doing that. And, and um, I find that I still come back to, to your example so many times um, when I'm trying to think about how to how to be a good teacher um, and a good advisor. Um, and the second thing is uh, uh, about almost exactly five years ago this month, um, my first book uh, came out in the same time that my uh, first child also arrived in the world. And I sent Bets a copy of the book and I got back this lovely note from him um, congratulating me on the arrival of, I think, as he put it, my two babies and reminding me, which of course was the most important. And I tried to find the note, but we're in the process of moving right now. And my whole library has been packed up, unfortunately. But um, I, I think that just, um, Betts has just been such a positive influence on me as a, as a person and as the sort of the model of the kind of academic that I would aspire to be. So um, thank you so much. And I've really missed you and the Institute. Uh, I'm really looking forward to getting back in person and seeing you and everyone else soon. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, next, we have Darren Culp, who was one of Dick's SEPA MIA students. Darren? Maybe pass on and yeah, we can go back. No, no Darren at the moment. Uh, Mira Rapp Hooper, um, Columbia PhD, uh, who's uh, now uh, in policy planning in the State Department, I believe. Mira? She's. She's Not... going to try to pop in if she can. Yeah. Oh, okay. I don't think she's here yet. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Daniel Sorek, please. Thank you. Uh, I'll just be, uh, I'll try to say some lighthearted uh, words and uh, some other words about Professor Betts, uh, having taken his War, Peace, and Strategy class and interacting with him elsewhere. Uh, and we, I think a lot of us first met Professor Betts at the ISP retreat. We definitely got to take in uh, him as an individual, and I learned that actually he has a talent for languages. Uh, you know, as would happen, I guess, with these kinds of master students, you start to get together, meeting each other and comparing the different kinds of languages you've learned that you like. And Professor Betts is actually, turns out, has a trick to foreign languages. He said, actually, that he knows English and he knows Greek. Uh, but knowing Greek helps him to learn all other languages, understand them, because, as he said, it's all Greek to him. <laughs> And I have to say, uh, if only I had known that, uh, I think I would have saved myself a lot of time. And I think a lot of us were impressed. Uh, <laughs> we've gotten to see so many great personal sides to Professor Betts, uh, whether it's his uh, pizza eating technique, one slide, one slice on the other, uh, his uh, encouragement of Spartan meals. But I would also just say on a more serious note, being in War, Peace and Strategy, how much uh, we enjoy the class. And I think for a lot of people, uh, what it really comes down to and boils down to are the polls, the infamous polls, the professor's talks, uh, which uh, he will often say people need to be answering more of um, because it seems as if we're not raising our hands. But I will say we are certainly taking note of the goal of these polls that he is intending to pass on and his unique ability to have us truly put ourselves in the shoes, for example, of the potential NATO bomber who might have to put himself at risk um, and perhaps the decision maker who might have to decide whether or not uh, to expose uh, this NATO uh, fighter pilot um, or weigh the cost of increased civilian casualties. And Professor Betts continuing to needle on asking us how would our answer to these kinds of decisions and dilemmas change if, for example, it was a personal member of our family in these situations or considering other consequences. So with that, I want to say thank you so much for the lighthearted uh, moments and the great moments of our uh, reflection in your class. Thank you, Daniel. Um, is Herb Newman here? 
saw him before, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Herbert Newman, uh, Stephanie Newman's husband. Uh, maybe not here, but we'll catch him later, I hope. He was uh, here earlier. Uh, yeah. Too bad. Uh, Theo Milanopoulos, please. One of Hi there. Um, sounds like Professor Betts probably knows uh, more Greek than I do. Uh, so I guess that's a, a testament to his language skills. Um, you know, I could talk about how uh, Professor Betts has always made a point of inviting his TAs to Thanksgiving dinner in case we didn't have the ability to travel to see our own families, or about how uh, he's indoctrinated me into the cult of Karl von Clausewitz. Um, but as any good scholar knows, the, the most important part of a book to read is the acknowledgement section. Uh, and it's become routine for authors to end this section by retaining all errors of the manuscript as their own. Uh, Professor Betts took his own unique approach to this performer acknowledgement, uh, writing in Soldier, Statesman, and Cold War Crises the following, um, that the intellectual godfather is Samuel Huntington. Although my conclusions diverge in some respects from his theory of civil military relations, and he is not responsible for any specific inaccuracies, I cannot absolve him of responsibility for the product as authors normally do. His work has inspired my research and guidance and, and his guidance has improved it. And although uh, Professor Betts is certainly not responsible for the many errors in my dissertation that he has tried to save me from with his red pen, um, I similarly cannot absolve him of responsibility for the product since he's very much the intellectual godfather of my own work. And I promise to have that chapter to you in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, thanks, Theo. Uh, Ingrid, I got your note about somebody's hand raised, but were you talking ab about Herb or some? No, some no. Um, I think um, Steve Biddle and others. Um, we also have a video if we want to show that. We could do that later. No, I. Um, we have Sarah Jacobs, but. I'm yeah. going to save the videos until the end if that's. Okay, yes. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so Brent Flanagan, please. See, someone else. Hi, Professor Betts. Um, I was a student in your uh, war, peace, and strategy class. I have two very brief things. The first, you speak about Professor Betts being an actor. I don't think I've ever seen someone do an Oscar-worthy performance of the discussion between McNamara and Admiral Anderson that you recounted in the war, peace, and strategy class. That was one of my favorite moments in that course. But another one is that was the only class I took at SEPA that was entirely in person during the pandemic. And we learned so much from you. But what was unique about that course is with 60 plus students in Oshel, when you're packing your stuff up and walking out of the room, you learn so much by continuing to reflect on those very thought provoking polling questions you had and being able to have those conversations while you're headed to public was something extremely unique now looking back on you know the hybrid model so i'm so grateful to have had that learning experience entirely in person and i feel very fortunate to have, have learned from you during my time here at columbia thank you so much thanks brent oh now i see herb newman uh herb are you hi uh yeah i think that I, i'm delighted to have been here the entire day and it's still not over uh, but I think I'm the only person other than Mr. Salzman who is not an academic. Uh, and uh, I am indeed pleased to have the opportunity to speak on behalf of Stephanie, who unfortunately is no longer here. But if she were, she would be the first, I think, to admire and to be appreciative of all of the time and effort uh, that she was able to spend time with Dick uh, her office, I think, for almost 30 years was adjacent to his, uh, and I know that she was always welcome uh, whenever she needed some guidance, uh, whether it was an issue of academia, scholarship, or uh, administration, and uh, I know that she would have been able to speak much more eloquently and much more closely as to the relationship that they had. So it's been an honor for me to uh, actually be able to convey a few words. Uh, I know that in the course of 60, 67 years of marriage and 30 some odd years of scholarship, 
I heard the names of Jarvis and Betts all the time. And I had the opportunity at different occasions to meet with Dick, uh, both at the university and at my home. And so I wish to, uh, to uh, <clears throat> wish him the best in his retirement from his present position. And I know that he will continue to do scholarly work and important work in the future. It's been an honor to be able to participate uh, for the entire day with you people. Thank you. Thanks so much for, for coming and uh, saying that. We miss Stephanie. Uh, she was uh, a wonderful presence in our institute. Um, JD Work. Hello folks, really grateful for the chance to listen to this wonderful conversation and talk through um, a gentleman who welcomed me to Saltzman and SIPA. Um, I came in 2017 after the hard year of uh, a number of intelligence failures um, in the cyber domain. We had Shadow Brokers, we had Nietzsche, we had WannaCry, we had Bad Rabbit. Uh, we had the activity that would become Olympic Destroyer in January of 2018. Um, I had one of my best technical operators dead of a heart attack due to the stress of this. And the matter of intelligence failure weighed upon me heavily coming into this environment. Um, I have enjoyed the conversations I've had over the years. I've enjoyed the tremendous amount of learning I had the opportunity to uh, partake in because of the immense scholarship of the folks uh, in the faculty and, and particularly um, Dick Betts. Um, he was also kind enough to allow me to fanboy and autograph one of my books. So, you know, uh, always a good moment. Um, but I, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, I wanted to say, um, if nothing else, uh, you have reminded me that still waters run deep, and perhaps I can carry that on forward. Sir. Thanks, JD. Uh, Anja Agachi. Thank you so much, and, and thanks to everyone for organizing this today. It's been such a treat to, to hear all the good stories and, and to geek out. It's been wonderful. Um, I was a, a TA for Professor Betts a couple of years ago from uh, the SIPA master's degree. Um, and of course, like everyone said, this was a, a foundational experience for me and hopefully not the worst decision Professor Betts made in picking me to be his TA. Um, but I think if, if there's one thing I wanna say is that um, thinking back to my experience and to um, the opportunity I had to, to work and, and get a deeper um, understanding of Professor Betts' scholarship, um, what I learned is that it, it's almost like every other piece of good art or book or, or cinema that withstands the test of time. And that is that every time you go back to it, you see a new angle, a new layer, something that you missed the first time or second time or 11th time that you went through it teaching the class. Um, and so to me, that's that's the power of Professor Bed scholarship. And, and I still have those notes somewhere dipped down in, in one of my uh, drawers in, in DC. Um, and then the other thing that I would say um, is that I think we should think outside the borders of the United States. Um, I am an international, I was an international student. And while there are not many of them in the war, peace and strategy class or in, indeed in the security policy concentration, um, they exist and they take what they learn um, outside the borders of the United States. And I think um, take the scholarship further and, and expand on it and build on it in, in new and exciting ways. Um, so I think in many ways, uh, Professor, I. The, the best is still yet to come um, based on everything that you've done. And I'm really excited to see um, what will come up throughout the world based on what you've taught us. Um, and my last thing I think I wanna say is just thank you for allowing us all the dorky Clausewitz references. That's how I use to detect people that are absolutely awesome. When we know we jive over Clausewitz references, that's, that, that means it works. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Uh, Steve Biddle. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm grateful to Dick for introducing Wimpy and Icky to the international relations theoretic language. Uh, I'm impressed that Dick brings his own hot sauce with him to lunch meetings. Uh, I'm impressed with his opposition to Gucci beer. Um, but most of all, I'm, I'm just grateful for him for being a really good role model. I mean, he's obviously a great scholar, right? But, but he's a remarkably good person. Uh, it, it's interesting to me that he's gone so far out of his way for so long to cultivate this Darth Vader image, because I have never run into anybody in this profession who cares more deeply, 
who's more committed to his students and who's more committed to the quality of the students' experience than Dick is, right? I've been teaching with Dick for almost 25 years now at SWAMOS, right? And in sessions that at one time were three weeks long, right? He was at SWAMOS for three solid weeks and it was wall to wall, 10 hour days teaching and interacting with students. I was only there for the last two. He was there for three. I was exhausted. At the end, he wanted to sit down and he wanted to take hours to go through the evaluations, to go through each and every single written evaluation by every participant so that we could understand what had worked for them, what hadn't worked for them, how we could make the experience better for them in a profession that's commonly understood as you teach is the price of admission so you can do your research. What, what this told me from the beginning of this experience was the, the most impressive academic, the most impressive scholar I knew didn't buy it, right? If that's the way Dick thinks, that's the way I want to be. Now, you know, whether I've gotten there or not, I'll leave to others. Um, but, but with Dick's example, I've, I've tried ever since to do right by my students, to do right by other people, because Dick showed me at the very beginning that that's what real, serious, decent people and great scholars do. So thanks, Dick. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Justin Canfill. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to, to say something. So I was also privileged to be a TA for War, Peace, and Strategy. Um, and also Professor Betts was on my dissertation prospectus committee several years back. So um, I've had a chance to benefit from his advice. First, I want to second Theo's comment about Thanksgiving dinner at the Betts house. Um, so what Theo didn't mention is that this involved actually ferrying students back and forth to New Jersey. And after a big Thanksgiving dinner, I don't think I can overstate how generous that is. So, um, you know, I can only imagine how meaningful a gesture like that is for students whose families are far away, uh, and international students in particular, to kind of get a, scent, a taste of, you know, what, what an American holiday is really like. Um, so I can't top what's been said about Professor Betts uh, already, and I won't try, but I'll just say how he's impacted me as a scholar. Uh, I think most of us got into this line of work because we saw hard questions out in the world and we wanted to be able to find the answers to those. But then as part of our academic training, we're socialized to spend all our time trying to you know, kind of reduce the dimensionality of that complexity so that we can squeeze it into these straightforward explanations. But um, as we all know, you know, politics is really messy. And I think of his, of his many accomplishments, one of the most important things Professor Betts has done to remind us uh, uh, you know, to think about these things in more careful ways is that we have to first get the questions right. Um, so even many of my, my favorite Betts articles come with questions in the title. <laughs> uh, and he, he reminds us that uh, you know, no matter how hard we might try, many hard questions don't have easy or straightforward answers. Uh, that in fact, the hard questions are the most important ones and that it's critical that we kind of grapple with them anyway. So I think this appreciation for nuance and this acknowledgement for difficult choices is one of the more uncomfortable things when we're students, um, but also one of the most important things that I and so many others have been graced with his advice have, have learned from him. So thank you, Professor Betts. Thanks, Justin. Tom Christensen. Myself. Okay. Thanks, Jack. Um, I have just a couple of things to say. Uh, one of them, uh, another sort of intellectual thing that I, I never had a chance to study with, with Dick. Um, I was a Columbia grad student when he arrived, um, but I uh, was just leaving. I, I went to China uh, in his first semester. I, I, it was my uh, field research. Um, and by the time I got back, I was packing up to go off to be with Steve Rosen and Sam Huntington at, at Olin. So I never got a chance to study him. I always really regretted that. Um, but then I got to work with him on that project at the council. And I also read all of his stuff because uh, you know I, I studied with Bob Jervis and then I TA'd for Bob Jervis in the, in the nuclear uh, class. And you know, two of the lessons that really stuck with me, it really it, it changed the way I look at uh, at international security politics are that uh, war is always awful, even for the victor. Uh, sort of, you know, if you're, you're gonna engage in, in a conflict, you're gonna pay a very high price. Um, and that provides the potential loser in a peacetime situation with leverage over the stronger power. Um, uh, the stronger power doesn't necessarily wanna fight. And the thing that always stuck in my mind was his, art, his work on balance of interests in the, 
in the Cold War era that you know balance of interest might be more important than balance of power. Um, and uh, that always uh, made me think hard about how a weaker China when we were working on this project could uh, still ruin uh, America's whole day if it just had some capabilities and it was really passionately dedicated to a, to a topic uh, like Taiwan. Um, but before we actually worked on that project, I thought Dick had, uh, you know, that reputation of Dick being gruff and, and tough, uh, that, was, that was pretty intimidating before I went into that project with him. And I, he's, I see him smiling. You know, it, it, it was a reputation that he was like, he was a, it was a tough guy. And, and there was another guy that I have tremendous respect for. I have tremendous respect for, for, for Dick for all the reasons that uh, people who studied with him have laid out so well. Um, um, another guy that in, 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 I've had in the same camp was Barry Posen, who also had this notion, uh, this reputation for being kind of gruff. Uh, um, and uh, I had this theory about both of them, um, and that they, I, I just had this image that they were both Marines. So, I, 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 so with Barry, I was convinced he was a Marine, and I got to know Barry when I when I moved to MIT to study. And maybe it's like not a fair image of Marines. It wasn't a bad, that's not a bad image. It's, it's, it's actually a pretty positive one, but it's a certain personality type. Um, and I remember talking to Barry once and finally raising it with him, like, you know, when we were in the Marine Corps. And he said, no, no, I wasn't in the Marine Corps, but my dad was, I was raised that way. <laughs> so he said, you're not entirely off. Like I was raised to think that's the way you're supposed to be. Um, but with Dick, I said, oh, I was wrong about Barry, but I was, I'm certainly right about Dick. Um, um, and the, thing, the question I had in the back of my mind with Dick was, was he an officer or an NCO? Because I, he seemed more gruff than Barry. Um, so I thought maybe he was, he was like a drill sergeant or something. Um, <laughs> and and uh, so I eventually, I eventually raised this with Dick and he said he had served in the army, but he was never in the Marines and he didn't understand why I thought he was in the Marines. And I said, never mind. So I, I was over for two, but uh, um, yeah just totally dedicated. And I was really thrilled when he came to Columbia. And I remember talking to Bob Jervis about the decision to hire him. Uh, and I was just so thrilled about it. And we had this kind of image of him uh, doing pretty much exactly what he did uh, at, at SALT, at the War and Peace Institute uh, since then. And it's really worked out exactly as we had hoped. Um, and we had very, very high expectations. So, um, uh, it's great to be your colleague and to be back here and actually get to interact with you uh, rather than uh, seeing you get hired and then running out the door. So. Thanks, Tom. Greg Waro, the chair of the political science department. Thanks, Jack. Um, and uh, so I wanted to offer some perspectives now that I am chair of the political science department and um, my, uh, my earliest memories of Dick were uh, as a maybe second year junior faculty member going toe to toe with him in admissions committee meetings. So this was back when we did, when PhD admissions were much more zero sum. Um, and so we had precious few slots and we would have meetings where we, we, were, where we would argue over who should, who should fill those slots. Um, this was at a time when the, um, you know, the, the IR applications were all incredibly stellar and the uh, American politics applications, not so much. Um, but we knew that, you know, this is the time we were trying to build an American politics. And, uh, and we knew that if we were gonna do that successfully, we needed to recruit more graduate students. Um, but so, you know, I remember very distinctly, I will never forget some of the uh, arguments that were back and forth we had about why we should accept this American politics PhD applicant who, you know, by all the metrics was not as good as some of the IR applicants that we would, we would not admit. Um, and so what I, what I took away from that, I, I, you know, it gets to a larger point that I'd like to make is that you know, Dick was always tough but fair. You know, he sort of acknowledged that, you know, in a collegial way that, we, that this was something that would be good for the department if we did, but, uh, but he was not gonna let me or anybody else off the hook in terms of, you know, we had to, we had to make an argument, right? We had to make a, a, a rigorous case for why we should, why we should do what we, what we are going to do. Um, and I think that extends generally to, um, you know, the way that the, the, you know, the, the, the culture in the department has, has developed. Um, I, as chair, I really respect and appreciate the, 
the, the, the culture of the department and, and how Dick has been a key figure in, in creating that, that, that culture. Um, it's a culture where faculty can, can challenge each other um, on a number of dimensions. But at the end of the day, um, you know, we, I, we have the same goal, which is to make the department um, and Columbia the, the best that it, that it can possibly, uh, can possibly be. Um, so I, I, I don't know that that has been talked much about uh, in terms of Dick's contributions, uh, his many, many contributions, um, but that to me is, is a very important one. And, uh, and I, I wanted to highlight that. And uh, especially with my perspective as chair, uh, you know, I, I appreciate that every day. Um, what, a, what a terrific colleague Dick has been and how, you know, his, his, how much he has contributed to making the department an incredibly collegial and enjoyable place to be. Thanks, Dick. Thanks, Greg, for chiming in. Uh, next up, Timothy Crawford, uh, another Columbia distinguished PhD professor at Boston College, uh, whose articles have been on my syllabi for years. <laughs> Tim. Wow, okay. Um, uh, so it's been great pleasure just listening to all these conversations and I regret that I missed some of the morning sessions, but uh, you know, I uh, just have a few thoughts uh, uh, that sort of get at this, uh, you know, uh, well, as Stuart Gottlieb put it, the sort of crusty cupcake exterior, sweet guy on the inside, or uh, maybe uh, differently, but sort of in the same theme, kind of a, a balanced person with moderation and, you know, you know, firmness, but generosity, I don't know. Um, so I, uh, but I would just say sort of intellectually, you know, my, my first project um, that I got into started at about, you know, the ideas for that came out of this, this uh, period when uh, Dick's article on uh, the delusion of impartial intervention had come out and there was a kind of back and forth at least intellectually between that and Ruggie's piece on wandering in the void and peacekeeping doctrine. And I was sort of in the middle trying to figure out how one could do deterrence without choosing a side. And I don't know if I ever really solved that problem, but that sort of like led me down a path that lasted several, well, more than several years. But, um, and then the other, you know, just in terms of intellectual, uh, you know, I don't know, sources. Uh, I was in the first class of um, Swamos. Uh, which was a really good one. I don't know how the rest of them went, but uh, that had a really big effect on me. And I remember coming out of that, uh, that meeting, it, it may have been a, a presentation that uh, Steve Rosen gave, I, I'm not sure, on Sun Tzu, but um, I came out of that beginning to churn on this question of wedge strategies, which is something that I've obviously been uh, struggling with for decades now. But um, um, on the sort of like, you know, crusty exterior, nice guy on the inside, I just want to have two anecdotes to share with you. Um, the first was in my comprehensive oral exam, uh, Dick was the inquisitor. And I had written a, uh, an answer on deterrence and it was kind of convoluted. And it was one where I was sort of playing with these ideas of, um, you know, deterring, but, um, and, and, and from multiple directions. and and Dick, you know, uh, sort of surprised me in the oral because he sort of threw a couple of, you know, tough questions at me about what I had written and I was sweating bullets. Uh, here I am, you know, uh, talking about deterrence with, with Dick Betts. And, um, but what he did was after I sort of like struggled for a little while with my answer, he turned it around and he said, okay, um, so who do you think was the most important deterrence theorist? And uh, that kind of changed the whole dynamic. And I had a good, uh, I don't know, five or 10 minute, you know, discussion of, um, you know, Brody and Shelling and Glenn Snyder and why they were good and, you know, where, you know, pluses and minuses. And it, uh, it I, I left that, um, that comprehensive exam oral feeling uh, you know, uh, uplifted and energized to, to dive back into the work. So uh, that was one. And then the last one, the last example of this sort of, you know, two-sided aspect to, uh, of it is um, 
I remember as I was finishing up my dissertation and I, and I did have these chapters that um, uh, Dick had covered with red ink. Now, all of the margins, you know, he's a prolific commenter. And, um, you know, I had maybe two or three chapters that he had gone over at once. And I was sitting there um, trying to, you know, sort of figure out what I was gonna do next. And I, and I said something like, well, I guess I'll go spend a few months trying to sort this out. And he said, um, and I'll, this, this is, I, I think this is an exact quote, get it writ, don't get it right. Uh, which I took to mean, get the writing done and then you can sort of sort out the problems afterwards. And that's always uh, stuck with me because I was expecting him to make to tell me that I had to get it all right first. Uh, but um, instead he wanted me to get it writ. And uh, that helped too. That was a little liberating in, in, in some sense in being able to just wrap the work up and, and, and take it to the next stage. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. Uh, we're assigning your, uh, your article on two-sided deterrence uh, for next week. And uh, we'll remember to juxtapose it to impartial intervention and see which uh, the students vote for. Okay, uh, next up, uh, Diana Carolina. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity to talk to you. Um, really quickly, I would just like to thank Professor Betts uh, for how the foundations provided by him have impacted my work here as an international student uh, from Colombia. I think, uh, the, and I go back to what Anka mentioned uh, a couple of minutes ago, how one keeps coming back to Professor Betts for any type of analysis, for any type of problem, um, and how it stands the test of time and the distance. So uh, my work here at the Ministry of Defense has definitely been marked uh, by what I learned from Professor Betts. So thank you very much, uh, Professor. Thanks, Diana. Uh, Chris Steven, please. Hi there. Yes, um, I just wanted to very quickly chip in if I could. Um, I actually had uh, Professor Betts back in uh, 1998, probably actually doesn't remember a January intake. Um, somebody uh, mentioned earlier about the fact that he was he got it right on a multipolar world. He got it right on a, uh, on a unipolar world. The one piece of advice I do recall he gave us um, as a small group, I think three or four of us joining international security policy at the time was you should get out of international security policy immediately because there's no jobs in this. Um, and then three or four years later, obviously, it blossomed into this uh, quite substantial uh, activity in terms of the security policy stream. So that's one I don't think he did get right. Um, I did also just want to say uh, I was never a TA. Um, I'm not an academic. I spent two years, oh, sorry, two decades rather in the, in the UN as an operator. Um, but taking the classes with uh, Professor Betts, and I think I took all of them that were on, uh, on the course at, at the time, um, it was very, very fundamental. Um, you know, I don't think political science, that's not what I do. Um, but what he did was he taught people how to think and not what to think. Um, and just his ability to unpack incredibly complicated things is something that I have, have always thought about when I've been going through my, uh, my career since then. Um, I can also say at the UN, there is a mafia of, uh, of SEPA students around them. And every once in a while we get together and I can guarantee you that uh, the topic of conversation will often come up about those courses, um, about Professor Betts, uh, War, Peace and Strategy, and how challenging it was, but how rewarding it was. So I think the, you know, from those of us who aren't in the academic community, you know, his voice and his vision still resonates incredibly with all of us who are out doing a myriad of different things. The, the general students who just went through those courses, not those that necessarily came back into academia. Uh, and, and the last point I would make um, is somebody also mentioned it earlier, but the, the retreat, the ISP retreat, where we got to meet uh, your family, Professor Betts, um, truly impactful. Um, and it sort of just opened up you um, and you as a thought leader in a totally different way and, and was so 
wonderful as a foreign student coming in as well. Um, so thank you to you and, and your family for, for being so welcoming. And again, for, for impacting so many of us in so many different worlds. Um, it's been an absolute privilege to, to have counted you as, as one of the people that I've listened to and, and have really hopefully learned from. Thank you so much. Thanks. So uh, we now have two testimonials on video from actual congressmen. Uh, who were just one so far, Jack. Oh, just yeah. one so far. One, okay. Yeah, one's still recording. She may not make it in time, but we'll put it on the video. Okay, so uh, the, the one we have in the can is Sarah Jacobs, uh, former SEPA student, uh, who is now the congressperson from the 53rd District of, I believe, California. So roll them. Professor Betts, congratulations on your retirement. Although I cannot even imagine SEPA or the Saltzman Institute without your leadership and your humor and your wisdom. I think about the lessons that you taught us in war, peace and strategy all the time in my new role, especially as we're thinking about these huge global challenges. And I'm so grateful for everything that you taught me and generations of SEPA and Columbia students. So thank you. I hope you enjoy your much deserved rest and congratulations again. Well, she didn't get the memo that this was not, not too much time. risk. I hope Jake. stick around, man. Uh, <laughs> to misquote Mark Twain, the reports of my death are greatly exaggerated. <laughs> oh, that's so weird. Sorry. So I'm handling, handing the gavel uh, back to Karen. Uh, and now is Dick's opportunity to rebut all of the praise. <laughs> Could be here for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Ray Karen. Well, I, I guess the first thing is I need to work on my elevator etiquette. <laughs> uh, but it's been a long day, and uh, I think people have uh, plenty to do on a Friday night. So I uh, only say a few things for a few minutes. Mainly, uh, just thanks for this event. Uh, uh, I. Uh, enjoyed all the exaggerated compliments. I would like to believe them. Uh, in any case, tell everybody else they're all true. Uh, but anyway, I don't take an event like this in stride. It's a nice big boost to my ego, but uh, is, especially it triggers a huge gratitude for the good feelings of colleagues who, who put it together. Uh, the simple fact that some people think what I've uh, uh, done with the conference uh, makes all the sweat over all that work uh, over time worthwhile. Um, I've been very fortunate uh, to be at Saltzman Institute for as long as I have. Uh, my career has been lucky. It's something of an atypical career, at least in terms of research on political science. My style of scholarship is old fashioned. Uh, but in straddling political science and policy commentary, I've, I've been able to do what I wanted to do and uh, uh, what at least some people value. And I've been lucky uh, in lots of ways. Uh, from long ago, uh, a sort of fortuitous encounter with and then uh, many decades long association with uh, Sam Huntington, uh, uh, fortuitously getting hired uh, on the Senate Intelligence Committee, which instead of having research uh, uh, improve uh, uh, policy performance, I found that the uh, involvement in policy helped improve my research. Uh, and as uh, I think at least one other person noted, timing uh, is very important. Uh, I. I guess was Barry mentioned, I sort of came out at a time when I had much less competition, uh, or as Joe Nye put it at the time, I was counter cyclical in uh, going into strategic studies when everyone else had soured on it. Uh, but uh, my motivation, like most political scientists, I think, was that I care about politics and policy in the real world. 
and especially want to improve them uh, in my own country. Uh, as a scholar, I aspire to be objective, uh, free of uh, national biases like a person from Mars, uh, but I'm not a citizen of the world. I'm an American, and so I hope whatever small effects my work may have had in the real world have been good for US policy, and I value limited occasions, uh, opportunities I've had for service to the US government. Uh, and for the Saltzman Institute, again, for anyone who uh, came in late, I am retiring as director, but not retiring from teaching. I, I will be around uh, doing the normal things for some time. Uh, it was past time for fresh leadership to the Institute, and we're lucky to have Karen taking over. She's a great choice and has uh, good ideas for moving the Institute forward. Uh, and uh, I, I think everything's in good hands. Uh, I was fortunate that we had such an amicable group of colleagues in the Institute all the time I've been there. Um, unless maybe I'm just obtuse, uh, I've never noticed any of the petty animosities or uh, interpersonal problems uh, that uh, can be common in academia. Um, and I can't run through the whole list of uh, compliments I'd like to give my colleagues, uh, many of whom have said nice things about me today. Uh, there are too many of you to, to do justice to, uh, but there are just two that do merit special mention. Uh, one is Bob Jervis, who of course ranks in terms of seniority as a special presence in the Institute and over decades uh, of his uh, notorious lunch uh, fostered a lot of the sense of community in the Institute. And my link with him goes back now 50 years to his graduate seminar on theories of international politics, Gov 282, which I took in, I guess, my first year in graduate school. And the second is Ingrid Gerstmann, uh, the real power in the Institute. Uh, and uh, Karen, uh, you will enjoy, I think, taking credit for many good things that uh, Ingrid does for you. Uh, and you'll be fortunate to, to be able to continue that tradition. Anyway, again, <clears throat> uh, my appreciation for this whole event is sincere. Uh, and uh, I want to thank everyone involved. Maybe we all should unmute for a second. And Dick, clap. Does it work? And clap. Yeah. Yeah. Dick, it is us who are lucky. We are the lucky one to have you. And I think this was, it's very evident after spending the day hearing from everyone. Uh, and we've all agreed you are a great man. And behind every great man, there is a strong, <laughs> smart, uh -huh. and great woman. And in your case, Adela. <laughs> I, we thank you for, for everything and for being with us today. And as Dick said as well, uh, Ingrid, the other uh, strong, oh. smart woman in behind the scenes in the Institute. Um, so I would like to um, thank everyone uh, for uh, being with us today, for celebrating and commemorate Dick's retirement as director this was an audition. Uh, so for many, many years, in many, many years, when we decide uh, on Bet, uh, Bet's retirement, uh, he will let us know who made it, who got the part to come back for that, uh, for the retirement uh, party. But uh, we all hope that this will be only in many, many, many years. <laughs> uh, and uh, without, um, I think, um, it's been a terrific event, and I would like to thank uh, two people in particular. Um, I would like to, to thank uh, Eric Saltzman, uh, who's been us, with us today for most of the day, and for the you know immense contribution of his family to what this institute is and has been able to do under Le Dick's uh, leadership. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Eric, and for Dean Jeno for uh, opening this event. And for all the people in Saltzman who worked so hard 
uh, on making this happen. I'm really grateful. Um, have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you again, and we'll see you in our next event. Bye. Bye, Dick. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye, Karen. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Betts, it's Alyssa Slotkin. Congratulations on all your years of hard work at the Institute for War and Peace. You influenced so many students, particularly through the rigors of the War, Peace and Strategy introductory class. Looking back, it was exactly what I needed to A, prepare me for the intensity of policy work in the government, which I went on to do, but also um, just in the important tenets of security policy, which I still reference all the time um, and feel like I would not be able to do my job without. Uh, but very specifically, you influenced me in my career choices in national security and the decision to go into the CIA right out of Columbia. Um, they were coming to campus. I never even thought of going to their recruitment events. And then I got an email kind of late um, or I read it late that said, Dr. Betts has signed you up for this small, you know, six or eight person lunch with the recruiters. And I didn't want to offend you. So I ran home, I put on the only suit that I had and I went to that recruiting event and it was there that I learned about life in the agency and decided that that was the best way that I could serve. Um, and then years later, you brought classes of um, uh, students from Columbia down to Washington. You came to the Pentagon. I think we brought you to the White House when I was working there. Um, and then you've been really wonderful since um, I made the decision to run for Congress. So for all of your work, um, for that strong Dr. Betts intimidation factor that I think um, I personally have taken on just a little bit in how I um, expect things from my staff. Um, thank you for showing us how to do that. And um, I wish you all the best.